Audible presents this brilliance audio production of The Few, the American Knights of the Air who risked everything to fight in the Battle of Britain by Alex Kershaw For Felix High Flight Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds, and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless holes of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. John Gillespie McGee, Jr., 19-year-old American pilot, killed December 11, 1941. Part One, The Fall of France. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. William Shakespeare, Richard II. Chapter One, Soldiers of Fortune. This is the story of some of our countrymen who did not wait to be stabbed in the back. Long before the rest of us realized it, these boys, with that deep wisdom given to the very young, knew that this, too, was our war. They were no adventurers, killing for gain. They couldn't resist the call of their blood. Liberty and tolerance and love for freedom had been bred in them. Quentin Reynolds, Radio Broadcast Winston Churchill sat in the back of a black Daimler, dressed in a dark pinstripe suit, late on the afternoon of May 10th, 1940. He was on his way to Buckingham Palace, where he would be officially invited by the king to lead a new government. After a decade in the political wilderness, the 65-year-old statesman's hour had finally arrived. Neville Chamberlain, the conservative prime minister, had stood down that morning, and Churchill had been selected by party bosses as the best man to lead the country in what were bound to be its most trying hours. That morning, just after dawn, it had been reported that Nazi Germany had launched massive surprise attacks on Luxembourg, Holland, and Belgium, and had pierced the French border. More than 1,700 German Luftwaffe bombers had filled the skies above northern Europe, taking so many citizens by surprise that some even waved up at the planes, not seeing the black crosses on the bombers' fuselage. As thousands of panzer tanks continued to storm across northern Europe, Churchill accepted the king's invitation to become prime minister. It was drizzling as he was then driven back to his residence at the British Admiralty. His bodyguard, Inspector William Thompson, was also seated in the Daimler as it passed through the heart of Whitehall. He congratulated his new boss on becoming Prime Minister, the culmination of more than forty years in Parliament. I hope it is not too late, Churchill replied. I am very much afraid that it is. We can only do our best. To his amazement, Thompson saw that Churchill was on the verge of tears. Union Station's waiting room was busy, full of passengers bidding farewell to families before boarding trains. Among those holding tickets were two nervous young men, 23-year-old Eugene Red Tobin, the son of a real estate broker who had spent most of his wayward youth in Los Angeles, and 27-year-old Andrew Mamadoff, a white Russian, inveterate gambler and womanizer. From a distance, Tobin was the more striking with his flaming red hair and lanky frame. Worried that they were being tailed by the FBI, Mamadoff and Tobin tried to look calm as they waited that evening of May 10th, the very same day that Winston Churchill became Prime Minister. It was doubly hard given that they were about to embark on what they knew would be the most exciting and dangerous chapter of their lives. The 8.15 p.m. train would eventually take them to Canada, then on, they hoped, to Europe to fight against the Luftwaffe. In so doing... They would break several strict neutrality laws and become outlaws in their own country. 
At the outbreak of war in 1939, a presidential proclamation had made it illegal for any American citizen to join a warring powers military, and also to hire someone to go beyond the territorial limits of the United States, to Canada, for example, to enlist in a foreign country's military. The penalties were severe. Tobin and Mamadov had been warned that if caught, they could be fined $10,000, jailed for several years, and stripped of their citizenship and passports. Tobin was leaving behind his girlfriend, a tall Irish beauty named Anne Herring. In California, he could have continued to fly every day in skies clear of Messerschmitts diving out of the sun to kill him. So why was he now risking everything? There were several reasons. Like Andy Mamadov, he was certain that the war in Europe would come to America sooner or later, and he didn't want to be drafted into the army as a grunt when it did. Above all, he was looking to fly the sweetest little ship in the world, the Supermarine Spitfire, designed by Englishman Reginald Mitchell, first flown in 1936 and now capable of over 350 miles per hour, three times faster than any plane Tobin had flown. I just felt I wanted to fly some of these powerful machines. But only by risking his neck in someone else's war would he ever stand a chance of flying the hottest machine he had ever set eyes on. The gamble seemed well worth it. Like so many young Americans in the age of Lindbergh and Earhart, Tobin was obsessed with flying. Nothing else made him feel quite so alive. It was all he had ever wanted to do with his life and it had enabled him to escape the shadow of his childhood. His earliest memories, other than of marveling at silver biplanes circling lazily above Hollywood, were of watching his mother, a beautiful and still young woman, as she lost a long battle with tuberculosis. Three years later, as a heartbroken eight-year-old, he had attended an air show and stared in awe as barnstormers performed acrobatics at Rogers Field on the outskirts of Los Angeles, My pappy gave me a dollar and I wandered off towards an airplane, an old Fairchild cabin job, he recalled. I told the pilot I wanted to go for a ride and he said, Is it all right with your parents? My father's back was turned, but a man near him swung around and looked at me at that moment and the pilot thought he was my pappy. We popped around the airport and I just knew I was born to fly. I failed practically every year at school from ditching classes and going out to airports. Finally, when I was older, I realized my ambition. I learned to fly. I did my first solo over Hollywood, and I flew a great deal over the Sierras. Eventually, he had saved enough money from working as a mechanic to buy his own plane. That had led to glamorous employment with MGM as a pilot ferrying the studio's stars and other VIPs around California. A heck of a job. But it had not satisfied his restless spirit. It was time to leave. Passengers began to file across Union Station's terracotta and inlaid marble floor and through the exit to the platform where the 8.15 p.m. train was waiting. Tobin and Mamadoff picked up their suitcases and were soon making their way through a garden patio and then onto the platform. As they boarded the train, both knew they might never see the mission revival splendor of Union Station or indeed Los Angeles again. They were now bona fide soldiers of fortune, making their way illegally to fight in a war that their government had done its best to prevent any American from joining. Tobin and Mamadoff had been hired by America's most colorful and notorious mercenary, 59-year-old Colonel Charles Sweeney, friend of Ernest Hemingway and several Latin American revolutionaries, described by the New Yorker that year as a tall, ruddy, hawk-faced, clipped-voiced man who does not mind his color button showing. It was Sweeney who had seen to it that discreet notices advertising opportunities with certain European air forces had been posted at airfields and had appeared in newspapers around the U.S., and to which Andy Mamadoff and Eugene Tobin had eagerly responded. As soon as the Nazis had invaded Poland, Sweeney had set about organizing a group of flyers modeled after the legendary Escadrille Squadron of World War I, a unit of dashing young American pilots who had volunteered to fly with the French Armée de l'Air and tangled above the trenches with the Baron von Richthofen's flying circus. 
but Sweeney's plans faced fierce opposition from the State Department and from several politicians, most of them from the Midwest, where there were large communities of German immigrants. Many obstacles soon cropped up, he recalled. The more apparent ones were the neutrality law and the attitude of hostility assumed by a large and influential part of the American press. For months I was hounded like a criminal. I began to have a friendly feeling for Babyface Nelson, Lester J. Gillis, a notorious gangster who was then being hunted by the FBI. The more real obstacle was the complete apathy of the American people. Wanting to escape the attentions of the FBI, Sweeney had gone to Canada in late 1939. But even though Canada was at war with Germany, this move had provided only a temporary respite from the feds. After just a few weeks, the authorities had started asking tough questions, and then Sweeney had been grilled at length by no less than Canadian attorney General Frank Murphy, who had made it clear that time was running out if Sweeney was to avoid being deported to the U.S. to face charges of breaking neutrality laws. Sweeney had quickly arranged passage to Europe, but not before managing to set up a secret network, stretching from Los Angeles and other American cities to Montreal, and then via Nova Scotia to France. As soon as Sweeney had arrived in Europe, the network had been activated. A few days later, Tobin and Mamadoff had been contacted at Mines Airfield in Los Angeles by a man from the mysteriously named Clayton Knight Committee, a front for Sweeney's illegal venture. Would they be interested in going to Finland? The Finnish Air Force needed every pilot it could get as it waged a fierce battle against the invading Soviets, who had forged a notorious pact with the Nazis the summer before. They would be paid all expenses to Helsinki and $100 a month as long as they lasted. I was certainly the guy to go flying up around the Arctic Circle, Tobin later recalled. I'd seen snow about twice in my life, but flying is flying, I told myself. Finland can't be so different. The next day, Tobin had quit his job with MGM and had bought gear for flying in sub-zero temperatures. Mamadoff had sold his plane. But less than 48 hours later, the friends had rued their hasty decisions. I was back, trying to talk the boss into putting me on the payroll again, explained Tobin. Andy was trying to figure out how he could get another crate. It seemed that something had happened up there in Finland. There wasn't a war anymore. In early April 1940, the Finns had been defeated after a bitter and valiant winter campaign. Tobin and Mamadoff would not be going on their great adventure after all. For three days, now unemployed and without planes, they had hung around Mines Airfield, trying to work out what to do next. They had been too late to fight for a free Finland but the forces of repression were on the march elsewhere. There was another war going on, Tobin recalled. Perhaps we could get into that one. They say if you go looking for a fight, you can always find one. A week later, having been contacted by Sweeney himself, Tobin and Mamadoff had signed up to join the French Armée de l'Air. Another nameless contact, this time a Frenchman, had then arrived at Mines Airfield and given them each a train ticket to Montreal, and a warm, though limp, handshake. The sun was setting above the Pacific as a steam whistle sounded, and the 8.15 p.m. Chicago train began to pull out of Union Station. Later that evening of May 10, 1940, Eugene Tobin opened his diary and jotted, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's sure as hell going to be an adventure. The journey from Los Angeles to Chicago would take three days, plenty of time for him and Mamadoff to share their anxieties. If they were caught, would they go straight to jail or would Sweeney be able to get them off the hook? And if they did get to Canada without being arrested, how would they get to Europe? Would they fly or take a boat across the Atlantic, where Hitler's U-boats were busy sinking dozens of ships each month? The train left California and then headed into the darkness of Nevada. Andy Mamadoff had no regrets. Unlike Tobin, he was not leaving loved ones behind. He had no blood ties to the state, nor, for that matter, to America. He belonged instead to a pitiful diaspora, 
the million-odd whites who had been forced to flee Mother Russia when the Bolsheviks had ruthlessly crushed their forces during the Civil War of the early 1920s. Had he and his parents tried to hide in some far-flung corner of Siberia, as Cossacks and others had, they would have been hunted down and killed. Lev Mamedov, Andy's father, had been a marked man. It was said that in 1908 he had arrested a Georgian Bolshevik called Yosef Jugashvili, later known as Joseph Stalin, in the Caucasus, when the future Soviet Union dictator had been nothing but a long-haired petty criminal and rabble-rouser. California's clear skies had lured Mamadoff from his previous exile in Thompson, Connecticut, where he had earned a reputation as a foolhardy show-off who had sped around in a flashy Ford convertible, impressing many local girls. Like Tobin, he had not cared much for school and had been expelled several times from Tortolot Memorial High School, where, according to a classmate, he had been the charismatic leader of a rowdy crew, not necessarily crude, but always looking for action. Winston Churchill stood at the dispatch box in the House of Commons. It was early afternoon on May 13, 1940, as the chamber fell silent and he began his first speech as Prime Minister by briefing the assembled members on developments in Europe. The news was far from encouraging. The Germans were waging a stunningly successful campaign of Blitzkrieg, lightning war, brilliantly coordinating massed tank attacks with strikes from the air, in particular from a new dive bomber, the Junkers 87, which had V-shaped wings and a siren that wailed as it swooped down with incredible accuracy on the Allies' frontline positions. In just three days, thanks in large part to the Luftwaffe, the Germans had swept through territory which had been contested for four years during the Great War of 1914-18. Hitler's panzers had rolled across France's northern plains, meeting little resistance. Britain faced the greatest threat to her survival in a millennium. Churchill concluded his first speech with words which would set the tone of his oratory in the crucial weeks to come. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. You ask what is our policy? I will say, it is to wage war by sea, land, and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God has given us, to wage war against a monstrous tyranny, never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalogue of human crime. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be. The train finally pulled into a station near the Canadian border. Officials boarded and began to check the papers of occupants in each carriage. Tobin and Mamadov waited anxiously. An official finally stepped into their compartment. Where are you boys going and why? We're on our way to Montreal to see a cousin who runs a fish hatchery, explained Tobin. Are either of you flyers? Don't be silly. Do we look like flyers? Another official entered and began to check their luggage. Mamadov and Tobin tried to appear calm. The official examined a top layer of clothing, but delved no deeper. If he had, he would have discovered goggles and logbooks. That's okay, he said. Have a good time and tickle a trout for us. Tobin and Mamadoff had been given instructions to go to the Queen's Hotel in Montreal, an impressive seven-floor stone building in the city's center. There they were to ask for letters addressed to them, containing cash and train tickets for the next leg of their trip. They arrived at the hotel late the following afternoon, but there were no letters. Exhausted, they decided in any case to check into the hotel. Sooner or later they would be contacted. Sweeney had assured them of that. In his hotel room that evening, Tobin pulled out a piece of stationery from his bedside table and began to write a letter to his father in Los Angeles. By the time you get this, I will be well on my way to France. Now hang on, Pa, it's not as bad as that. I am going to get six months of the best training possible, and by then I'll get out. Yes, I will. 
The reason I did not tell you before was because I knew you would be against it, and I didn't want a big argument, Pa. Honest. When I get back, I will be a damn good pilot, and will have no trouble getting a job, because I will have something to offer, whereas now I'm nothing but a nothing. I guarantee you, Pa, I will not take any unnecessary chances. All I want is the training. Nothing more. I can't get in the lousy U.S. Army, Air Force, so I'll go to France where I can. This is no foolhardy stunt. You may think it is, but it isn't. Your little boy, Jean. Later that evening, Tobin and Mamadoff asked a lobby clerk if any other Americans had also asked for envelopes and checked into the hotel. The clerk pointed to a man seated a few yards away, looking glum and engrossed in an aviation magazine. It was immediately obvious that he was very small. The man's feet did not even touch the ground. Tobin's younger sister, Helen Mayer, would later vividly recall her brother's first encounter with the shortest man ever to fly in the RAF, 26-year-old Vernon Charles Keogh. Jean thought, I wonder whether this is the guy we are supposed to meet. The more Jean looked at Keogh, the more he thought, I bet that's him. But he surely can't fly. He's too little. He kept looking at Keogh, and Keogh kept looking back. And finally, Jean said to him, you're the meanest looking dude I've seen in a long time. That broke the ice. Keogh smiled, and the pilots introduced themselves. I came up from New York expecting to join the French Air Force, and instead I become a lobby squatter, said Keogh. My luck sure isn't getting any better. They went to the bar, and Keogh, just four foot ten, bought drinks and then told Tobin and Mamadoff they should call him Shorty. He'd been a professional parachute jumper before becoming a pilot. A fortnight back, explained Keogh, he had borrowed $500 for a down payment on a new plane. He had then allowed a friend to take it up the very day it had been delivered. Keogh paused. He looked grief-stricken. What happened? asked Tobin. The dope goes and cracks it up, landing. About the only thing left is the stick, which he's still got in his hand when he crawls out. So I joined the French Air Force to get away from it all. And now this. Tobin ordered another round of rum and cokes. He liked the look of Shorty, with his wry smile and eyes that didn't miss a thing, darting about like mice. Keogh had grown up in Brooklyn and had wanted to be a pilot since he could remember. As a 13-year-old, he had listened, along with tens of millions of other Americans, to the radio news bulletins reporting on Charles Lindbergh's historic transatlantic flight. Determined to emulate the Lone Eagle, he had started taking lessons at Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn during his last year in high school. By his early twenties, Keogh had been scraping by as a barnstormer. Then he had become one of America's first skydivers, eventually risking his life in more than 500 jumps. I was talked into making my first jump, Keogh would later recall. I was 24 then. It didn't seem so good at first. I didn't like the idea of leaving a perfectly good airplane up there and jumping for no reason at all. Well, I did it at four shows because the guy I was working for wanted me to. I was so light, you see. Then I found I liked it. Keogh had landed more than once in the wrong place and a couple of times so far off course that it had taken several days before his mother learned that he was still alive. As a fellow pilot recalled, People who came to comfort his mother in Brooklyn were in turn consoled by her calm words. He'll come back. He always does. And he always did. There had been good times. Bright and windless summer days and large crowds below. And then there would be a wet Sunday after we'd built up a show. Then things wouldn't be so hot and I would have to eat on the cuff and put my airplane in hock. Over yet more rum and cokes, Tobin learned that Shorty had also volunteered to fight with the Finns. He didn't mind now what Air Force he joined so long as it wasn't the Luftwaffe. The Americans were interrupted by a bellhop who handed them the letters they had been promised by their contacts in the States. They ripped them open, discovered train tickets to Halifax in Nova Scotia, knocked back their drinks, and read the instructions accompanying the tickets. You will take the night train to Halifax— 
Upon arrival, remain at the station after the other passengers have departed. Discuss flying in a loud voice so our agent can identify you. In London, the long day was also drawing to a close. Before turning in for the night, Winston Churchill met in his rooms at the Admiralty with the American ambassador, Joseph Kennedy. According to Kennedy, Churchill was worried that Italy, under the dictator Mussolini, would soon seize the chance to enter the war, thereby introducing the nightmare scenario for Britain of having to fight on two fronts, in France and in the Mediterranean. It seemed likely that France would fall quickly to the Germans, and then the Luftwaffe would throw everything it had at Britain in a bloody prelude to invasion. He said that regardless of what Germany does to England and France, Kennedy cabled President Roosevelt after the meeting, England will never give up as long as he remains a power in public life, even if England is burned to the ground. Why, he said, the government would move to Canada and take the fleet and fight on. In the meantime, counseled Kennedy, it was imperative that America not be dragged into the war. It seems to me that if we had to protect our lives, we would do better fighting in our own backyard. This was not what Roosevelt wanted to hear, but it was entirely to be expected from Joseph Kennedy, a defeatist for whom the pursuit of profit and power was all-consuming. To remove him from the domestic political scene, where he was touted by some as a possible presidential candidate, President Roosevelt had sent Kennedy and his photogenic family to London in the late thirties. As a blinkered isolationist, Kennedy had provided one-sided reports on the worsening European situation, missives in which Roosevelt now had begun to place little faith, knowing Kennedy was far more interested in saving his own skin and furthering his political ambitions back in America than in being an effective liaison between the British government and the White House. I thought my daffodils were yellow until I met Joe Kennedy was one British reaction to the future American president's father. The train to Halifax was crowded with Canadian troops. In his diary, Tobin wrote, Everybody talks about the war. They ask us why Americans haven't come in the war. We say, pay us the dough and we sure will. They look astonished. Adieu. Finally, the train slowed. Tobin looked at his watch as it pulled into Halifax. It was 1 a.m. A few minutes later, he and his fellow Americans stood shivering on a platform, discussing flying as they had been instructed. After a while, a short, swarthy man introduced himself, claiming he was acting on behalf of the French government. They were soon following him along dark and rainy back streets, ducking into alleys to shake off possible tales until they got to the waterfront. Under his breath, Tobin cursed the weather. He was already starting to miss the balmy California climate. Finally, they arrived in an office on the top floor of an abandoned warehouse. Their contact opened an old safe, the kind Tobin had seen in black and white westerns, and pulled out three pink cards. Now shaking from the cold, the Americans watched as their contact scribbled on the cards. As you cannot travel on an American passport, owing to the terms of your government's neutrality laws, I am giving you these documents, he explained. The pink cards stated that they were of indeterminate nationality and that they were to be given free passage because they had been recruited to the French Armée de l'Air. The man then pulled out some bundles of cash. This will get you to Paris. You are expected on board the ship at seven o'clock this morning. Bon voyage, mes enfants. Vive la France. Vive la France, replied Tobin. By 7 a.m., they were walking along a wharf towards a freighter. A foul smell filled the air. It wasn't the aroma of French perfume, Tobin recalled. Just plain old mule. Five hundred of them. They boarded and found that no one spoke English, except for the captain, who said he could take only two of them, Mamadoff and Keo. Tobin would have to cross the Atlantic on the Pierre L.D., another freighter belonging to the same convoy of forty ships bound for France. Across the Atlantic that morning, in his quarters at the British Admiralty, Winston Churchill received a telephone call. It was from his French counterpart, Prime Minister Paul Reynaud, known in France as the fighting cock because of his strutting manner and aggression. 
We are beaten, Reno said. We have lost the battle. The front is broken near Sedan. They are pouring through in great numbers with tanks and armored cars. Churchill was shocked. He urged Reno to fight on, trying to reassure him that all was not lost. But Reno was inconsolable. All right, Churchill concluded. I will come over to Paris to talk to you. As preparations were made to fly to Paris, escorted by an RAF fighter squadron, another message came from Reynaud. The way to Paris lies open. Send all the troops and planes you can. Determined to bolster the French premier, Churchill decided it was time to appeal directly to President Roosevelt for help. I trust you realize, Mr. President, that the voice and force of the United States may count for nothing if they are withheld too long. You may have a completely subjugated, Nazified Europe established with astonishing swiftness, and the weight may be more than we can bear. All I ask now is that you should proclaim non-belligerency, which would mean that you could help us with everything short of actually engaging armed forces. Churchill went on to list specific things that America could provide immediately. Forty or fifty destroyers to help in convoy duties, several hundred new aircraft, and anti-aircraft guns and ammunition. Roosevelt's reply the following day was far from encouraging. The provision of destroyers would, if it became public knowledge, be seized upon by America's many energized isolationists as a contravention of neutrality laws. Only Congress, Roosevelt pointed out, could authorize such provision, and he was not certain that it would be wise for the suggestion to be made to the Congress at this moment. There was even more distressing news when Churchill arrived in Paris that afternoon and met with Reynaud and his generals. The Germans had broken through in northern France near Sedan and were now driving a fifty-mile-wide wedge between two French armies. Where is the strategic reserve? asked Churchill. There was no reply from the French commanders. Outside, French bureaucrats were burning documents, preparing to flee the capital. Where is the strategic reserve? Churchill asked again, this time in French. A senior French general, General Maurice Gamelin, shook his head wearily. There is none. Churchill was dumbfounded. How could the French have left themselves so vulnerable? Pieces of singed government documents swirled into the sky. Gamelin spoke directly to Churchill. The French were suffering setback after setback, above all because the Luftwaffe dominated in the air. If the RAF could provide more fighter squadrons, this critical disadvantage might be overcome. Then the waves of panzers could at least be delayed, if not halted, as they stormed towards Paris. Churchill promised to provide six more squadrons. But when he arrived back in London that evening, he discovered that Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Stuffy Dowding, head of fighter command, had persuaded the war cabinet not to send any more squadrons to the French. If the home defense force is drained away in desperate attempts to remedy the situation in France, Dowding had argued, defeat in France will involve the final, complete, and irremediable defeat of this country. The French would get no more squadrons. The end was near. There had never been a train quite like it. Asia, the mobile command post of the second most powerful man in the Third Reich, Reich Marshal Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe. On May 20, 1940, as a security detail led the Italian ambassador, Dino Alfieri, towards the train, he wondered what he would find inside. It was well camouflaged, heavily fortified with anti-aircraft guns, and parked near a tunnel, close to the German town of Polk, in the event of a sudden attack by the RAF. The extravagance of Goering's rolling headquarters seduced Alfieri as soon as he stepped aboard. Asia was specially weighted for the smoothest ride, requiring two of Germany's heaviest engines. It had bathing facilities, a cinema, an expansive dining car where Germany's finest chefs served only the best wines and haute cuisine, and spare carriages to carry art treasures seized from Europe's finest collections. It was obvious that the man who had formed the Gestapo and organized the first concentration camp, 
who had then become president of the Reichstag and prime minister of Prussia, lacked for little. In fact, he now had everything he had ever desired. Several castles, tens of millions of Reichsmarks stashed in Swiss banks, and an army of servants in silver-buckled shoes at his beck and call back at Karenhall, his baronial pile. Payback for almost twenty years of fierce loyalty to Hitler. He even boasted the world's largest model railway layout. Goering smiled as Alfieri greeted him and then beamed as the Italian ambassador presented him with the collar of Annunziata, the highly coveted personal decoration of the Italian king. Goering had not been so flattered since 1918, when he had been awarded the Ordon pour le Mérite, the Blue Max, upon replacing the legendary Baron von Richthofen as commander of J.G. I. His voice quavering with emotion, his clear blue eyes sparkling with pleasure, Goering thanked Alfieri in fluent Italian and then squeezed sideways out of the carriage only to return a few minutes later with a phalanx of photographers and the medal at his neck. Later that day, after Alfieri had been treated to a spectacular luncheon, Goering sat in the shade beneath a clump of trees. Seated opposite him at an oak table were two friends, General Hans Yashonik, the 43-year-old Luftwaffe chief of staff, and Major Josef Beppo Schmid, his head of intelligence. Yashonik was a highly capable, ruthless Nazi. Schmid, by contrast, was a hopelessly inept sycophant. He could not fly, and he could not understand English, a serious deficiency given his role in assessing the RAF's capabilities. One of his senior colleagues remembered him bitterly as an alcoholic, with a boxer's face, without wit or culture, who started his career with entirely false, optimistically exaggerated opinions. Suddenly, an aide rushed over and delivered the news that the French and British were almost surrounded in northern France. All that was required to win the war was a swift coup de grace, but who should deliver it? The Wehrmacht generals with their columns of panzers, or the ME-109s and Stukas of Hermann Goering's Luftwaffe. Goering was quick to his feet. This is just the job for the Luftwaffe, he blustered. Get me through to the Führer at once. Hitler was soon on the line. Goering was at his most confident and persuasive, warning the Führer that he might lose face if he allowed his generals to take credit for finishing off the French and British. The Luftwaffe had been designed precisely for the task at hand. Its medium-range bombers, such as the Dornier DO-17Z, the Henkel HE-111, and the Junkers JU-87B, known as the Stuka, were ideally suited to paralyzing ground forces with terrifying speed. Allow the symbol of the New Reich, of the reborn German military, to finish the job, pleaded Goering. Pull back Hans von Guderian and Erwin Rommel's panzers for a few days. Let the Stukas and Emils, ME-109s, get to work immediately. Leave it to me and the Luftwaffe. I guarantee unconditionally that not a British soldier will escape. Already wary of many of his brilliant commanders in the field, whose loyalty could never be guaranteed, Hitler liked what he heard. Go right ahead, he told Goering. The commander of what was thought to be the greatest air force in history thanked Adolf Hitler and bid him good day. Grinning, he then handed over the telephone to his chief of staff, Hans Joschonik, who would arrange a timetable and organize the details of the attack with Hitler's staff. Meanwhile, Eugene Tobin and his fellow American volunteers were crossing the Atlantic, unaware of the developments in France. That night of May 20th, his fourth at sea, a green gilled Tobin somehow mustered the energy to fill a page in his diary. I went to the officers' mess and played some records, both American and French. After listening to the French records, I can understand why they are at war. Have ten more days of this, by then supposed to be in Brest, if we're not torpedoed. Miss the folks at home, especially my little honey, Anne Herring. But what the hell can I do about it out here in the middle of the drink? The French had better have some good plans after all of this, or I'll start a war of my own. A week into the voyage, an escorting British destroyer dropped depth charges. 
A U-boat had been detected in the area, and Tobin's boat was farthest from the center of the convoy, wide open to attack. For several hours, the crew manned action stations until finally the captain announced that the immediate danger had passed. The U-boat was one of 57 then operating in the Atlantic and sinking more than 50,000 tons of shipping a week, threatening to starve Britain into submission. For Rear Admiral Carl Dernitz's underwater predators, it was the happy time when sinking stragglers such as Tobin's boat was an almost daily occurrence. Tobin was soon thoroughly miserable. In his diary, his list of complaints grew longer by the day. Bad food, constant drizzle, a head cold, boredom, anxiety over the U-boat threat, and an ever more sullen French crew. It had been a damn stupid idea to leave his cushy job with MGM, his green-eyed girl Anne, and sunny California to go fight for the French. News that the Germans were storming across northern France only darkened his mood. Two weeks into the crossing, however, the weather improved. The convoy splintered, and Tobin finally learned that he was going to disembark the following day, May 31st, at Saint-Nazaire in Brittany. The seas became dead calm. Other ships in the convoy took on the appearance of ghosts as a heavy mist shrouded the Bay of Biscay. Somewhere in the murk, only a few miles away, loomed the craggy coast of France. Chapter 2 the Ace of Spades. Enough words have been exchanged. Now, at last, let me see some deeds. Goethe, Faust, Act One. It was around 11 a.m. on June 5, 1940, when 27 year old Luftwaffe Captain Werner Molders flicked the magneto switch on his Messerschmitt ME 109 and heard the Daimler Benz engine roaring to life. A handsome man of medium height with deep-set eyes, dark, slicked-back hair, and thin lips, he then taxied across the grass runway, and a few minutes later was taking off with his fellow pilots of Jagdeschwader 53, JG-53, or as their unit was known to pilots in the Luftwaffe, the Ace of Spades. A devout Catholic whose sister was a nun, Mulders was despised by many Nazis for openly talking about his faith and condemning their repression of the Catholic Church. Because of his genius for shooting down enemy planes, however, they could not silence him. The Luftwaffe's chief, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, himself a First World War ace, had made sure of that. He knew Mulders was deeply respected by his fellow pilots and valued him as a brilliant strategist who had reinvented the rules of fighter combat, significantly increasing the kill rate of his fellow aces while making it harder for enemy air forces to shoot them down. Legend had it that Vati, Daddy, Mulders, as he was known to his young pilots, had the best eyesight in the Luftwaffe and could spot an enemy plane several seconds before even his wingmen, all of whom had 20-20 vision. Incredibly, it was also said that every time he slipped into a cockpit, he had to beat down his one weakness, a gut-wrenching fear of heights. Enigmatic indeed. Unlike most of his fellow aces, Mulders harbored no deep-seated enmity for his opponents and took little pleasure in watching his victims tumble to the ground, even though his father had been killed by their forebears in the trenches during the First World War. The patchwork farms of northern France were now visible below. Mulders opened the throttle on his ME-109 and checked that his flight of four planes, made up of two pairs, was flying as he had instructed around 200 yards apart, with each pair's wingman protecting the flight's tail. The first recipient of the Knight's Cross for shooting down 20 enemy planes in the war, he was, as usual, wearing a fur-collared flying jacket, a leftover from his days as the highest-scoring Condor Legion pilot in Spain, where he had killed at least 14 anti-fascists in as many weeks in 1938. A few minutes later, Mulders was flying ahead of his wingman in clear skies over Compiègne. Below, the enemy was in panic and retreat. The invasion of France had so far gone amazingly well, far better than even Hitler had expected. 
Britain's decimated Royal Air Force was now evacuating France, lest it be completely destroyed, leaving Molders and his fellow pilots to mop up the pitiful remnants of the French Air Force. Two days before, the Ace of Spades had shot down a grand total of eleven French and British planes, and Molders had made his twenty-second and twenty-third kills, a Hawk H-75A and what he claimed was a Spitfire. Mulders suddenly spied a plane, a Block 152 fighter. Swooping down, he opened fire and then watched as the French fighter spun down, belching smoke and flame. He did not have to wait long to make his next kill, diving again and this time riddling a Pote 63 with cannon shell and bullets. As he always stressed to his newest pilots, the trick was to strike from altitude, out of the sun, bouncing the unsuspecting enemy, and then pull away as fast as possible. Hit and run. Hit and run. That was what the Messerschmitt had been designed for. In a dive, it could not be caught. But in a dogfight, particularly against the RAF's Spitfire, it could be outturned. And so, unless it was absolutely unavoidable, Mulders never allowed himself to be engaged on equal terms. Running low on fuel, Mulders led his flight back to base. It was late afternoon when he returned to the skies above France with JG-53. The shadows were lengthening on the grass fields, the sun dipping in the west when he spotted a formation of enemy planes below. They were the best that the French Air Force could put up in defense of their homeland, Diwatin D-520s. Then things started to go wrong. Another German squadron attacked the French planes before Mulders could order his men to pounce. It was obvious that the other squadron's pilots were novices from the way they opened fire much too soon, thereby alerting the French to their presence. The enemy formation split in all directions, and then the horizon was suddenly full of vapor trails and planes spitting bright tracers at all angles. The crucial element of surprise had been lost. Now the Ace of Spades would be in for a real fight. Mulders hovered above the fray for a while, choosing his moment. Below, three pilots from the over-eager German squadron were chasing a solitary French plane without success. It was time to show the neophytes a thing or two. Mulders opened the throttle and dived. The French plane loomed larger in his reflector gun sight, but not close enough to guarantee the kill. Then it dived away sharply. To Mulder's surprise, the pilot was no dolt, expertly slowing his plane so that Mulder's overshot and lost sight of his prey beneath his wing. Mulder's scanned the sky, neck swiveling, and then looked into his rear mirror. The Frenchman was now on his tail, firing right at him. Damn it! Mulders banked away and climbed hard into the sun, knowing its glare would make it difficult for the enemy to follow and fire accurately. His engine whined with stress as he pulled back his control stick with the throttle wide open. To his relief, he managed to throw off the Frenchman. He looked down. Two other Messerschmitts were chasing a French plane. Above him, vapor trails stretched across the bright blue like shredded white ribbons. He checked his instruments. The altimeter showed 3,000 feet. Then, disaster struck. Mulders heard a terrible bang. Sparks showered across his cockpit. His throttle was shot to pieces. The controls were useless. His plane began to drop like a stone, nose first. Sub-Lieutenant René pommier Leraguet, a determined French ace, had taken Mulders completely by surprise, hitting him with a long burst of machine gun fire. Mulders was lucky to still be alive. Got to get out. Mulders grabbed the ME-109's jettison lever, felt the freezing rush of air. Then he released the canopy and glimpsed it flying away. In one fluid motion, he was out of his harness, free of the seat, free of the plane, and tumbling through the sky. pommier Laraguet had meanwhile latched onto another Nazi and squeezed off round after round. Again, he had scored, bullets tearing into his second victim of the day. Mulders pulled on his ripcord. Suddenly, I found it in my hand, torn off. A terrible fright went through me, he recalled. 
I reached above me, but the chute had already opened. I hung quite peacefully beneath my parachute and searched for my opponent, but there were only M.E.'s circled around me. Only M.E.'s. Quite slowly I drifted toward the ground, and that ground was still occupied by the enemy. Sixty kilometers behind the front, west of Compiègne. I drew my pistol and released the safety, then stuck it into my pants pocket. Beneath me, two farmers collected their horses and fled. A brief survey of the terrain revealed a small wood, otherwise meadows everywhere. Suddenly, the ground rushed up. I pulled my legs up. Touchdown was relatively gentle. I got clear of my chute at once and ran toward the wood. Frenchmen came running from the sides. I got to the edge of the wood. Bang! A shot whizzed past my ear. I threw away my fur-lined jacket and ran, gasping for breath, to the other side of the wood. A group of French artillerymen spotted him, gave chase, seized him, and then began to beat him with their rifle butts. Fortunately for Molders, a French officer shouted for them to stop. Unlike many other German flyers killed or maimed by the French that spring, he suffered only minor injuries and was soon on his way to a French POW camp. Later that evening, back at base, the young men of JG-53 were stunned when their commander failed to appear. The loss of their charismatic leader, so early in the war, hit many like an electric shock. A few days later, the wreckage of his plane was found and a missing-in-action report filed. A BF-109 leaving a trail of smoke was observed in this area at a height of 1,000 meters. A parachute was seen shortly before the machine went into a spin and crashed. No enemy aircraft was seen to attack, apparently hit by ground fire or engine failure. What about Mulder's nemesis, Monsieur Leraguet? From his captors, Werner Mulder's learned that one of his pilots from the Ace of Spades had singled out the plane that had attacked him and had shot it down. Monsieur Leraguet had died just a few seconds after Mulder's parachute had opened. The news of Mulder's disappearance spread fast throughout the Luftwaffe. Many of Mulder's acolytes deeply mourned his loss. Others who admired him were not quite so saddened. Pilots such as the burly Karl Hans Mayer of JG-53 and the urbane Adolf Galland of JG-26, the top guns of the Luftwaffe, fast closing on Mulder's top score of 23. In the pages of Signal and other Nazi propaganda magazines, the question was soon being asked, who among them? would now become the war's greatest ace. Chapter 3 Prelude Look out! Here's another! Watch that bastard! Smack underneath you, man! Under you! He's burning! I got him! I got him, chaps! Bloody hell, I've been hit! Jesus, where are they all coming from? For God's sake, somebody! Larry Forrester, fly for your life. The nightmare crossing was almost over. On May 30th, 1940, Eugene Tobin stood on deck, the color back in his cheeks, watching as the Brittany coastline came into full view. As the last of the morning mist burnt off, he entered the port of Saint-Nazaire, which was larger than he had expected and crowded with ships painted a drab camouflage gray. Wobbling slightly on sea legs, he was soon wandering the narrow streets leading from the docks to Saint-Nazaire's main square. Man alive, he noted in his diary, what a town this is. Everybody wears 1890 clothes, rides bicycles, even old men and women. There's not a woman under 180 pounds. I bet when they're born they have to lift them out with cranes. Tobin soon contacted a local official who offered to help him get the correct travel papers so he could take a train to Paris. Unfortunately, it was already late on a Friday, so he would have to wait until Monday before the travel bureau reopened. Reluctantly, Tobin returned to his ship to wait out the weekend. The next morning, over breakfast, several members of the crew explained that time was fast running out if he was to help save France. Judging by that morning's headlines in the local newspaper, the country's fate now hung in the balance. Since Tobin had left Halifax, everything had gone Hitler's way. 
On May 20th, the German panzer columns had reached Abbeville on the Channel Coast, completing an encirclement of more than a million British, French, and Belgian troops. French resistance had been pathetic, causing the commander of the British Expeditionary Force, Lord Gort, to snort contemptuously that it is no uncommon occurrence to agree with the French to retire at, say, 9 p.m., and find that the French troops had in fact started to pull back at 4 p.m. By 26 May, around 250,000 British troops, the rump of what remained of the British Expeditionary Force, BEF, were surrounded in the French port of Dunkirk and being mercilessly attacked by Goering's Stuka dive bombers night and day. From the air it seemed that the nearby beaches swarmed with a huge army of ants that rippled with fear as German pilots made strafing runs. The mood was grim, both on the sand dunes where starving, exhausted Tommies waited for rescue, and in London, where even in Churchill's war cabinet there was talk of a compromise peace with Hitler. Churchill ended all such defeatist sentiment, telling his cabinet in an emotionally charged meeting on May 28th, I am convinced that every one of you would rise up and tear me down from my place if I were for one moment to contemplate parley or surrender. If this long island story of ours is to come to an end at last, let it end only when each of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. Churchill's defiance was met with cheers and hurrahs. It was clear that he now had every one of his cabinet firmly on his side. Quite a number, he recalled, seemed to jump from the table and come running to my chair, shouting and patting me on the back. Had I at this juncture faltered at all in leading the nation, I should have been hurled out of office. I am sure that every minister was ready to be killed quite soon, and have all his family and possessions destroyed, rather than give in. Just as the cabinet had rallied to Churchill, so would the nation. But first, something had to be salvaged from the disaster unfolding at Dunkirk. The outlook was grim. Senior commanders hoped that perhaps 30,000 men, a fraction of the British Expeditionary Force, might be pulled off the Dunkirk beaches. In London, Ambassador Kennedy added his own assessment to the general air of doom, cabling President Roosevelt that only a miracle can save the BEF from being wiped out or, as I said yesterday, surrender. The English people, while they suspect a terrible situation, really do not realize how bad it is. When they do, I don't know what group they will follow, the do or die, or the group that wants a settlement. But all was not yet lost. The seafaring nation was just beginning to respond to a call for all available vessels to make the hazardous channel crossing and evacuate men from the blood-stained beaches. All manner of craft, from private dinghies to Thames tugboats, were headed towards Dunkirk, and some were already rescuing the exhausted and eternally grateful soldiers. Above the beaches, fighter commands, Spitfire, and Hurricane squadrons were also now in action, fighting with unprecedented aggression, many of their pilots furious at the sight of thousands upon thousands of their countrymen being mowed down as they waded in long, snaking lines into the gray waters of the Channel. Even veteran Luftwaffe pilots, who had readily strafed columns of refugees in Spain and destroyed Guernica, soon began to sicken of the slaughter. For 24-year-old Captain Paul Temme, flying at 300 feet above his victims, it was just unadulterated killing. The beaches were jammed full of soldiers. I went up and down hose-piping. It was cold-blooded, point-blank murder. The fighting over Dunkirk would be a prelude to the Battle of Britain, and the Luftwaffe and the RAF took careful measure of each other. For the first time, the Germans encountered the full force of fighter command, and it was soon clear that the RAF's Spitfires and Hurricanes were just as lethal as the Messerschmitt ME-109. Another thing was quickly obvious. The British pilots were as well-disciplined and courageous as their foe in the air, confirming the warning of influential First World War veteran Theo Osterkamp. Now we fight the Lords, and that is something else again. They are hard fighters, and they are good fighters.
For many RAF pilots, Dunkirk was a chaotic and brutal baptism of fire. The ME-109s were quicksilver, recalled one squadron leader. It would have been ideal to come up against them as a controlled formation, but the Germans always split up, so somehow you did too. Then it was every man for himself, which was all right if you were good. Thankfully, some were very good indeed. They included 28-year-old Flight Lieutenant Frank Howell of 609 West Riding Squadron, a strikingly handsome, blonde-haired former mechanic who, on June 1, 1940, was appointed a flight leader after two days of fierce combat. In a remarkable letter to his brother, Howell provided a vivid account of what it was like to fly above the hell of Dunkirk. The place was still burning furiously, a great pall of smoke stretching 7,000 feet in the sky over Belgium. Thousands and thousands of AA, anti-aircraft, shells were bursting over the town. I looked down to see salvo after salvo of bombs bursting with terrific splashes in the water near some shipping, and there was a Henkel only 500 feet below going in the opposite direction, so I did a half roll and came up its arse, giving it a pretty two seconds fire. All the way back to England I flew full throttle at about fifteen feet above the water, and the shipping between England and Dunkirk was a sight worth seeing. Paddle boats, destroyers, sloops, tugs, fishing trawlers, river launches, anything with a motor towing anything without one. I am indeed lucky to have got away scot-free. Dizzy was killed and five other chaps are missing. One was my flight commander, so I am now in charge of A-flight and will get another stripe, and it's a rotten way to get it. On June 1st, Winston Churchill was back in Paris, again trying to rally the French and sharing with them the heartening news that more than 165,000 troops had already been successfully pulled off the beaches at Dunkirk. Distressingly, his exhortations to fight on to the very end appeared to fall on deaf ears. Churchill's escort from Paris back to England was to be provided by 601 Squadron, otherwise known as the Millionaire Squadron, because several of its pilots came from wealthy families. Winston was ebullient as ever, recalled an aide. When we started back, he insisted on pacing round the aerodrome, airfield, to review 601's nine hurricanes, tramping through the tall grass in the flurry of propellers with his cigar like a pennant. British Major General Sir Edward Spears would vividly recall nine fighter planes drawn up in a wide semicircle around the Prime Minister's flamingo. Churchill walked towards the machines, grinning, waving his stick, saying a word or two to each pilot as he went from one to the other, and, as I watched their faces light up and smile in answer to his, I thought they looked like the angels of my childhood. These men may have been naturally handsome, but that morning they were far more than that, creatures of an essence that was not of our world. Their expressions of happy confidence as they got ready to ascend into their element, the sky, left me inspired, awed, and earthbound. One of these angels, Flying Officer Gordon Mouse Cleaver, remembered that morning somewhat differently. The night before, the millionaires had become rip-roaring drunk. They're assembled at Via Coublet just about as hung over a crew of dirty, smelly, unshaven, unwashed fighter pilots as I doubt has ever been seen. Willie Rhodes Morehouse, if I remember right, was being sick behind his aeroplane when the great man arrived and expressed a desire to meet the escort. We must have appeared vaguely human, at least, as he seemed to accept our appearance without comment, and we took off for England. By June 4th, the evacuation of Dunkirk was officially over, with an incredible 338,226 Allied troops successfully removed from the beaches to England. Goering's promise that not a British soldier will escape had been ludicrous. The Iron Man had simply been talking big again, as General Alfred Jodl, chief of Hitler's general staff, was quick to point out. In a week of almost constant combat above Dunkirk, the RAF had shot down 132 German planes for a loss of 99 of its own fighters, five from Flight Lieutenant Frank Howell's 609 Squadron. It was a remarkable performance, or as Churchill described it to his war cabinet, 
a signal victory which gives cause for high hopes of our successes in the future. The British Expeditionary Force had been saved by some 693 boats of all sizes, many of them little ships, dinghies, pleasure yachts, skiffs, tugboats, a quarter of which were sunk. But now it had nothing to fight with. Almost all the BEF's armor and weapons had been left behind, leaving England practically defenseless. The evacuation of Dunkirk could certainly not be described as a victory, but it was nevertheless a powerful tonic to both the British people and the rest of the free world. Across the Atlantic, many Americans were as inspired as the British themselves by the miracle of Dunkirk. Polls indicated that fewer and fewer Americans remained bitterly opposed to intervention. Seeing the possibility of swaying public opinion in favor of outright support for Britain, Foreign Office officials initiated what would become the most sophisticated and effective propaganda campaign ever waged by the British. Churchill himself would soon add his own weight to the effort to convince America to come to Britain's aid. No matter how long Britain held out, he knew the war could not be won without American intervention. President Roosevelt, above all, was his great star of hope. One morning that early summer, the Prime Minister's son, Randolph, found his father shaving at 10 Downing Street, wearing just a silk undershirt that left nothing to the imagination. "'Sit down, dear boy, and read the papers while I finish shaving,' said Churchill. Randolph did as he was told. For a few minutes, Churchill scraped away with his valet razor. I think I see my way through, he finally said, continuing to shave. Randolph was amazed. Do you mean that we can avoid defeat or beat the bastards? Churchill tossed his razor into the sink and turned to face his son, towel in hand. Of course I mean we can beat them. Well, I'm all for it but I don't see how you can do it. I shall drag the United States in. Many Americans, particularly among the powerful East Coast elites, were already willing accomplices, including several of Roosevelt's most powerful intimates and several of the more influential newspaper editors. On June 4th, the day the Dunkirk evacuation formally ended, a New York Times editorial concluded... So long as the English language survives, the word Dunkirk will be spoken of with reverence. For in that harbor, in such a hell as never blazed on earth before, at the end of a lost battle, the rages and blemishes that have hidden the soul of democracy fell away. There, beaten but not unconquered, in shining splendor, she faced the enemy. Among America's isolationists, there was no such sentiment. Ambassador Joseph Kennedy and others had predicted annihilation for the British at Dunkirk. He and his fellow pessimists had been wrong, but after Dunkirk they were no less convinced of Britain's imminent defeat. Now America's chief representative turned his energies to getting first his family and then himself out of Britain before the Nazis came knocking at his embassy door. In direct contrast, Churchill seized the moment to inspire the whole nation and steal it for the bitter fight to come, telling Parliament in a speech that was printed on front pages around the globe, We must be very careful to not to assign to this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuations. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen and may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island whatever the cost may be. And then came immortal words, intended for freedom-loving peoples everywhere, and in particular for Americans. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. 
and even if, which I do not for one moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjected and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forward to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Meanwhile, in Saint-Nazaire, three hundred miles or so from the beaches of Dunkirk, Eugene Tobin was trying to find a way to get to Paris as fast as possible so that he could reunite with his friend Andy Mamadoff and Vernon Keogh. Boy, did I learn about red tape, he recalled. After a five-hour wrangle with the immigration and customs, I found I still needed a special permit from the commissariat of police to travel by train to Paris. Lugging a heavy suitcase and an overloaded knapsack, I walked about five miles, looking for the right commissariat. There were plenty of them, but each one specialized in something else. The one I wanted, I found last, naturally. Tobin's status of indeterminate nationality was a problem. Doesn't Monsieur know what his nationality is? asked an official. Of course. I'm an American. Aha! Uh -huh. Then why does Monsieur not possess an American passport? Because they wouldn't give me one, replied Tobin. The neutrality law doesn't allow it. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh, uh -huh. Then Monsieur is not really an American at all. He is nothing. Tobin had not spent two weeks dodging torpedoes only to be treated like an outlaw by the very people he had come to fight for. Tobin banged his fist on the desk. Listen, he shouted. I've come here to fight for France. I'm a pilot, see? I'm going to fly one of your airplanes. Now give me the permit and let me get out of here right now. Toot sweet. The bureaucrat did not comply. It took another four days before Tobin was issued a travel pass for Paris. Finally, he boarded a train, but after just a couple of hours, it shuddered to a halt in Nantes. There would be yet another delay. Then a Red Cross train pulled into the station. Its passengers were wounded French soldiers, many of their faces deathly pale with strain and pain. The ME-109s had recently strafed them, honeycombing some compartments with bullet holes. The last three cars in the train had been destroyed beyond recognition. Suddenly, Tobin realized that there was another reason for being in France— besides just wanting to fly behind 1,000 horsepower. On June 4th, at 6.30 a.m., Eugene Tobin's train finally pulled into the Gare de l'Est in Paris. He had slept badly, having spent the night on a cold platform in Nantes. I went to a hotel to sleep, he noted in his diary. Later I found out it was a whorehouse, and for half a day it cost me 100 francs. Was I mad? Found out where Andy and others are staying, and I went to their hotel. I was sure glad to see them. All told, there are eight American flyers staying in the hotel. The Germans bombed Paris yesterday, and one bomb hit 456 feet from our hotel. That's too damn close for comfort. Forty-five people were killed within a three-block radius of the hotel. All the glass is out of the windows around here. Ten cars were hit, burnt like matchwood, holes all over the place. It was bad, all right. Damn those square heads. In the hotel bar, Tobin talked with Mamadoff and Keo and discovered they were running out of patience with the French. We've been here five days now, said an exasperated shorty, and every morning we go over to the ministry and ask, how about it? Then some nice, polite officer replies, any day now you are going to fly. But so far we haven't even taken a medical. Nuts. All they could do was wait while the French Armée de l'Air got its act together. In the meantime, they decided that they might as well try to enjoy Paris. So that night they went to the home of an American correspondent for cocktails. But it was an awkward soiree. They had to be careful not to reveal why they were in France in case the reporter mentioned them in a story and tipped off the FBI. The next morning, June 5, 1940, there was reason for optimism. 
Tobin was called into the French Air Ministry, where he passed his physical for entry into the French Air Force. Feeling better, he then headed out to the racetrack at Longchamp to bet on the horses. It wasn't long before he found himself discussing the war with some of the crowd. A Lithuanian Air Force captain, a Belgian refugee, and a Russian lawyer. They chattered away in their own languages, but one thing was clearly understood by all. As Tobin put it, if the Allies are to win, America must enter the war. We won the last war for the French and British, and we'll win this one for them. No kidding. That night, the Flyers again went in search of fun, ending a drunken tour of the City of Light at the well-stocked bar of the American Legion Club in Paris. According to Tobin, they had a big drinks fest, then home, the boys all got a woman and went to bed. Then things turned sour. The next afternoon, Andy Mamadoff was arrested while sitting at a cafe with Tobin and Keo on the Champs-Élysées. The police came up and demanded his papers, recalled Tobin. He showed them, but the police weren't satisfied. Perhaps his swarthy looks made him look suspicious. Or were the French authorities interested in talking to him about someone he knew back in Thompson, Connecticut? Ironically, given that he was about to fight the Nazis, Mamadoff was on intimate terms with one of the most bizarre fascists in American history. His uncle, Count Anastasi Vonsiatsky, was the leader of a white Russian supremacist movement that saw in Hitler a chance to return to power and reverse the Russian Revolution. Vonsiatsky had several well-connected followers in Paris, including embittered relatives of the slain Romanovs. Back in the 20s, Vonsiatsky had jumped from flophouse to flophouse in Paris before latching on to a rich American heiress who was slumming in the city for a season, as was then the fashion among the New England elite with artistic pretensions. Twenty years Vonsiatsky's senior, Marion Rehm was soon swept off her feet. To her family's outrage, the émigré and the impressionable heiress were quickly married. In 1924, not long after setting up home in Thompson, Connecticut, on a large estate called 19th Hole, Vonsiatsky had invited his older sister Natasha and her husband, Lev Beck Mamadov, to come join him in Connecticut. It had not been long before the childless Marion and Vonsiatsky began treating the Mamadov's only son, 13-year-old Andy, as their own. With Marion's money, Vonsiatsky had given his sister and brother-in-law a new start in life, buying them a nearby 150-year-old farmhouse that the Mamadovs quickly converted into a popular restaurant named after a famous establishment in St. Petersburg, the Russian Bear. It had prospered throughout the 30s, drawing the likes of actor Alan Ladd and the well-to-do from across New England. Andy had often helped in the kitchen and served his parents' upscale patrons. He had inherited his plump mother's cheerfulness, but looked more like his equally charming father, with his squat frame, swarthy complexion, and, by the time he was eighteen, thick black mustache. After two hours of questioning, Mamadov was released. Oddly enough, recalled Tobin, Andy wasn't amused. It had been damn crazy signing up to fight for the French, Mamadov raged. And where the hell was Colonel Sweeney? Hadn't he promised to be in Paris to greet them? Colonel Sweeney had fought hard to get the French Air Ministry to send his recruits into action. But his efforts had been stymied by infuriating lethargy, disorganization, and crippling bureaucracy. In his long career as a soldier of fortune, he had never been so frustrated. He had once fought against the Germans with the French and been impressed with their ferocious tenacity and enormous sacrifice in defeating their invader. Now it seemed as if they were losing heart. And if there was one thing Sweeney couldn't abide, it was a quitter. Born in Salt Lake City, from an early age Sweeney had wanted to be a soldier but had been blessed with neither the temperament nor the patience to follow the conventional route. Although accepted into West Point, he had succeeded in being expelled twice from America's most prestigious military college, first aged 19 for a hazing offense in 1900 and again the following year. I was expelled for different reasons, but I don't care to say what they were, he told the New Yorker. 
they were glad to get rid of me. Undeterred, he had then embarked on an alternate career as a high-profile mercenary. According to an American pilot called Jim Goodson, who knew Sweeney well, his subsequent adventures soon read like a chapter out of a boy's life magazine. A hero of freedom uprisings in Mexico, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, he had become a colonel in the French Foreign Legion in the First World War, and then an aide to the French General Vagon, supporting the Poles against the Russian Bolsheviks in 1920, an advisor to Kemal Ataturk in the Greco-Turkish War of 1922, a French foreign legionnaire fighting a Berber revolt in 1925, a military advisor to the Republican forces in the Spanish Civil War in the late 30s. Now Sweeney was on the run once more. Shortly before his recruits had arrived in Paris, he had been handed a note in the famous Crayon Bar warning that if he stayed in France, he would be tracked down and killed by agents belonging to the Abwehr, Hitler's secret service. It had been no idle threat. Rushing back to his apartment during an air raid a few days later, he had heard the crack of a pistol shot. Thankfully, the bullet had ricocheted off a stone wall a few feet away. After sprinting down a street and losing his would-be assassin, he had made his way carefully back to his apartment, where he had then spent the night pacing back and forth. Just before dawn, he had peeked out his window for the umpteenth time and spied two men standing in the shadows, watching the apartment block. Fortunately, Sweeney had been in tight spots before and kept a cool head. Later that morning, he borrowed some clothes from his apartment block's caretaker and, pretending to be a crippled old peasant, bent almost double with arthritis, he shuffled out of the apartment block, fooling the agents, watching for him. According to one account, Sweeney then escaped to Spain from France by fishing boat, leaving behind instructions for his pilots to follow him and find their way to London. He was also able to arrange for most of them to receive escape instructions through special radio transmitters set up in key cities in France, Lisbon, and Portugal, and even aboard a fishing boat just off the coast of Bordeaux in southwest France, farthest from the German onslaught. Unfortunately, in the chaos of early June 1940, several of Sweeney's recruits were not contacted. They included Eugene Tobin, Andy Mamadoff, and Vernon Keogh. The situation in Paris had become truly desperate. On June 10th, Tobin and his fellow pilots woke to find a smoke screen blanketing the city. The French had lit fires and set off smoke bombs to shroud beloved quartiers and buildings in the hope of saving them from being destroyed by the Luftwaffe. There was a feeling of depression and defeat we didn't like at all, recalled Tobin. The sooner we got into a plane, the better. Tobin and Shorty Keogh, by now cursing the French at every turn, tried to find a bar where they could get drunk. But almost every business in the city was closed. Over lunch at their hotel, they heard a rumor that they would leave the next day, perhaps for a unit farther to the south, where they might finally be given the chance to fly. That afternoon, a harried official at the French Air Ministry confirmed the rumor, adding that the entire French government was abandoning Paris for Tours, a hundred miles to the southwest. That's fine, said Andy Mamadoff, but how about some money to pay our hotel bills? We have no funds here to give you, replied the official. You pay and we'll reimburse you some other time, perhaps. We cannot say. We are busy now. Au revoir till tour. The next morning, the Americans left their hotel without paying the bill, hailed a cab, and were driven fast to the Garde l'Est. The station was a crush of evacuees. None seemed to care where they would end up as long as it was outside Paris, ahead of the German advance. The flyers struggled with their baggage onto a train so crammed with refugees that they were soon standing between cars so they could breathe fresh air. It is a terrible situation indeed, noted Tobin in his diary. I have never seen so much sadness in all my life. Around 1 p.m., they arrived in Tours, the new seat of what was left of the fractured French government. As the train pulled into the station, they heard the sounds of bombing. By now, Tours was being pounded by the Luftwaffe on average four times a day. Exhausted and on edge, they finally reached their assigned base, five miles northwest of Tours. 
We have very filthy quarters, Tobin jotted in his diary before falling into a deep sleep. The whole French army is disorganized, and everybody is lost. At first light, the Americans explored the base and examined the planes they had been assigned to fly. They were far from impressed. The machines were old crates, obviously no match for the Luftwaffe's front-line fighters, such as the Messerschmitt ME-109 and ME-110. Other pilots from other countries agreed, among them several Czechs and Poles who detested the Germans with an unsettling ferocity and who broke the news that the Germans were now at the gates of Paris. Again, the eternal wait to fly began. Around midday, just as the Americans were sitting down to lunch, they heard the terrifying high-pitched scream of Stukas diving at full speed. A bomb exploded close to the mess. Glass flew everywhere and explosions ripped across runways. As they took cover, the Americans looked up and saw other Stukas lazily circling above, just out of range of the base's woefully inadequate anti-aircraft guns. Shorty watched one of the Stukas dive almost vertically and open up with its machine guns. Then, out of nowhere it seemed, a French Poté 63 fighter attacked, its pilot firing six bursts of machine gun bullets at the Stuka and scoring a direct hit. The Americans cheered as the Stuka fell and smashed into the ground in a ball of flame. A few minutes later, smoke from fires and explosions began to drift away, revealing runways pitted with shell holes and the smoldering ruins of the pilot's quarters and the officer's mess. That night, the Americans were forced to sleep in a ditch. The following morning, as they lay in the sun, wondering what they should do next with just eighty francs between them, they heard the distant drone of German bombers. Then the bombers came over, recalled Tobin. About fifty of them, spread out perhaps twenty miles. One of them had a particular yen for our field. The first time he slouched over sort of nonchalantly at ten thousand feet and gave us the business, we stood up to watch him. But he wasn't very accurate. After a while, we got used to him. Whenever there was a droning overhead, Shorty would open one eye and say, It's only Adolf. Then we'd go back to sleep again. For three more days, the Americans stayed on, hunkering down each night in their ditch, sustained by black coffee, the odd bowl of thin soup, and a few morsels of cheese. Shorty could no longer contain his frustration and began to take it out on any Frenchman in a smart uniform. The Americans had yet to be issued even a pair of fresh socks. Several times he marched up to senior French officers and in very bad French loudly demanded to be given a uniform. It was explained that no one was bothering to hand out uniforms anymore, and in any case, they didn't come in his size. On June 13, 1940, as panzers surrounded Paris, the Americans learned that they had at last been cleared to fly. Their assigned mount, declared a French pilot, would be one of several twin-engine Poté 63s, dispersed at a far corner of the base. On closer examination, it was obvious that the Americans would be lucky to get the single-seat fighter off the ground. All the instruments in the cockpit of a French plane work backward. That is, all the controls are reversed, recalled Tobin. The throttle is pulled back toward you for power instead of being pushed away. The French pilot tried to be reassuring. We will try and find you some helmets so that you can fly. The Americans followed him into a hangar. Thirty seconds later, they heard the now familiar scream of Stukas diving. The Poté 63 they had been assigned took a direct hit. Too bad, said the French pilot. But tomorrow we will get another plane for you. Tomorrow you will fly, certainly. The Americans nodded. Sure they would. Poor guy. It wasn't his fault, remembered Tobin. So, just to show him there were no hard feelings, we put the bite on him for a hundred francs. After agreeing to spend the money in the best restaurant they could find, by mid-afternoon they had set off for nearby tour. It was unfortunate that they did not stay at the airfield for the rest of that afternoon of June 13, 1940. Had they done so, they might have been able to meet the British Prime Minister, who was on a last-ditch mission to try to convince the French 
to carry on the fight. Churchill's plane arrived in a thunderstorm over the pockmarked runway at Tours. With the Prime Minister that day was General Sir Hastings Ismay, Secretary to the War Cabinet. We landed safely and taxied around craters in search of someone to help us, he recalled. There was no sign of life, except for groups of French airmen lounging about by the hangars. They did not know who we were and cared less. The Prime Minister got out and introduced himself. He said in his best French that his name was Churchill, that he was the Prime Minister of Great Britain, and that he would be grateful for a voiture. Eventually, a car was provided, and Churchill was driven to the center of Tours, where he sat down to lunch at the Grand Hotel while he waited for the French premier, Paul Renault, who had not yet arrived in the city. It was not long before Churchill was interrupted by the secretary of the French war cabinet, Paul Baudouin. To Churchill's disgust, Baudouin talked solemnly of throwing in the towel while decent terms might still be negotiated. After lunch, Churchill was driven to the local prefecture, but Renault was still nowhere to be found. The afternoon dragged on, Churchill's aides growing ever more concerned. The airfield at Tours had no lights, and takeoff with so many craters in the runway would be impossible after dark. At last, Renault arrived and led Churchill to an office on the first floor of the prefecture, where he then broke the depressing news that his government would soon ask the Germans for an armistice. Could France be released from an earlier pledge not to negotiate a separate peace with Germany? According to one source, tears streamed down Mr. Churchill's face as Renault spoke. Churchill said he would have to confer with his war cabinet colleagues and left Renault seated, solemn-faced, behind a desk. In the prefecture's garden, Churchill discussed Renault's request with Lord Beaverbrook, the dynamic Canadian press magnate he had appointed to his war cabinet, and Lord Halifax, his foreign secretary. Half an hour later, Churchill was again facing Renault. The answer was no. Renault must hold out. Is another week possible or less? asked Churchill. Renault made no reply. There was one last hope. America. At the very least, pleaded Churchill, could the French not hold out until President Roosevelt made it clear where America stood? If America entered the war, the defeatists in Renault's cabinet would be silenced. There would be hope of eventually gaining victory, just as in the last war. Reluctantly, Renault promised that the French would not approach the Germans until Churchill had received an unequivocal answer from President Roosevelt. It was also agreed that in the meantime the French would hand over to the British 400 Luftwaffe prisoners, most of them downed pilots such as Werner Mulders. Time was growing short if Churchill was to get back to the airfield in daylight. As he prepared to leave, Churchill saw General Charles de Gaulle standing in a doorway. Of all France's military leaders, de Gaulle had impressed him most with his determination to fight on, no matter the cost. Here was a man with the backbone so many of his countrymen lacked. Churchill caught his eye as he passed him and muttered, L'homme du destin. And so it would prove. A few minutes later, Churchill was seated beside Renault as they were driven back to the airfield outside Tours. Don't give in. Don't go over to the enemy, Churchill begged before parting. Fight on. It was late afternoon when the British Prime Minister's plane bounced along a rutted strip of grass under gray storm clouds and then lifted into the air. Almost as soon as he had arrived back in London, Churchill cabled President Roosevelt as he had promised Renault, warning that, If we go down, you may have a United States of Europe under Nazi command far more numerous, far stronger, far better armed than the New World. But it was to no avail. Roosevelt declined to come to Britain and France's aid. No American president in his right mind could suddenly take an isolationist, pitifully armed country to war at the drop of a hat, however much he sympathized and indeed agonized over the old world's fate. That evening of June 13th, a deeply troubled Churchill drank champagne and tucked into jellied chicken and fresh strawberries with his family at Admiralty House. Four years would pass before he would see his beloved France again. 
Back in tour, in a small family-run restaurant, Eugene Tobin and his fellow flyers gorged on their first decent meal in a week and quaffed two-franc brandy. Tobin recognized a couple of Czech pilots from their base at the next table. You will pardon us, one of them said, but we realize you are in the same position as ourselves. We too have been waiting around for weeks to go into action. We think the French have lost heart for the war but we have a scheme. Their plan was to steal two Pote 63 planes and then hightail it across the channel to England, where they would join the RAF. They intended to seize the planes at first light. You're on two risks, the other Czech officer added. One, the anti-aircraft guns may hit us if they get the alarm quickly, but that is doubtful. The other and more likely risk is that we might be chased by fighters. But we can avoid that if we get off the ground quickly and climb to fifteen or twenty thousand feet. Tobin looked at Mamadov and Shorty. Sounds all right to us. Early the following morning, a Czech pilot crouched over Eugene Tobin and shook him awake. The silhouettes of two Pote 63 planes, several hundred yards in the distance, were just visible. My friend and I will run out and get into the planes first, whispered the Czech. Give us about three minutes to get them primed up and ready. Then, when we start the motors, you can run out, pull the chocks from under the wheels, and jump in. Tobin nodded and then watched nervously as the Czech and his friend ran out to the planes. They hadn't gone more than a hundred yards, he recalled, when suddenly there was the sharp bark of a rifle, then another. One of the Czechs stumbled and fell. The other turned and ran back. As he knelt down, waving frantically at us to run, there was another shot and he slumped over the body of his friend. Then three soldiers crawled out from under the planes and advanced toward them with their rifles ready for action. The Americans scrambled on all fours for several yards and then sprinted towards nearby woods, but before reaching them, French guards opened fire. Bullets whistled through the air, gouging holes in the airfield perimeter. The Americans kept on running, through the woods and beyond, until they were out of breath. Thankfully, there was no sound or sign of pursuit. The guards must have given up and returned to examine the men they had killed. We rested a while, then sauntered over to the commandant's office, trying to look nonchalant, recalled Tobin. There was plenty going on, they told us there. Fifty German soldiers dressed in Czech uniforms had tried to ambush the airport guard and set the planes on fire. The guards had driven them off after killing two officers. Also, German armored cars had been reported within a few miles of Tours. The station was being evacuated at once. As for us, we'd just have to get down to the south as best we could. There was even worse news. All of Paris was now in German hands. Earlier that morning, German General Fedor von Bock, the commander of Army Group B, had stood before two divisions of German stormtroopers in the Place de la Concorde. At the Arc de Triomphe, he stood stiffly to attention and made the Heil Hitler salute. In the distance, a swastika flew from the top of the Eiffel Tower. Signs declaring Mann spricht Deutsch, German spoken here, were already posted on the entrances to bars and brothels across Paris. The Americans began to walk south through Tours. That night they slept in a hayloft, stomachs rumbling from hunger. The next day they traipsed seventeen miles on sore and blistered feet. In every town they went to, Andy found a French girl he wanted to marry, recalled Harry Watts, a film director who would soon befriend the pilots. And all the time Tobin, the imperturbable, would act as general provider. What he couldn't scrounge, he'd wheedle, using a weird combination of signs, grins, and bad French, even ones throwing in a song and dance routine as good measure. He always got what he wanted. Finally, on June 17, 1940, the Americans staggered into the small town of Arquet in southwest France, three men among a throng of tens of thousands of refugees and countless deserters from the French army. In the town square, they learned that the French government had given up the fight. An armistice would soon be signed. France had fallen in less than six weeks to the German onslaught. Britain now stood alone. 
We shall do our best to be worthy of this high honor, declared Churchill in a short radio broadcast. We shall defend our island home, and with the British Empire we shall fight on unconquerable until the curse of Hitler is lifted from the brows of mankind. The following day, June 18, 1940, Churchill stood before a packed House of Commons. Big Ben told midday as the Prime Minister rose to address his peers. After urging them not to seek scapegoats for the disaster in France, he stated that it would now be the RAF's pilots who would have the glory of saving their native land, their island home, and all they love from the most deadly of all attacks. What General Vegan called the Battle of France is over, continued Churchill before a deeply subdued house. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. Back in Arcay that afternoon of June 18, 1940, Andy Mamadoff suddenly saw a French armored car speed down the main street. Its driver pointed behind him. Le Bosch, he shouted. Le Bosch! The Germans were coming. There was pandemonium for several minutes, but then it was announced that the Germans were indeed close, but still several miles away. The driver of the armored car was a collaborator, spreading panic to aid the German advance. Knowing now that they were at most an hour or two ahead of the Nazis, the Americans rushed to the town's station and squeezed aboard the first train to leave, a freight carrying soldiers and supplies. Legs aching, they lay down on a boxcar floor only to discover that it was covered in a thick yellow dust which soon coated their dirty clothes, clogged their nostrils, and dyed their hair. We gotta keep moving or we'll be cooked pigeons, Tobin jotted in his diary. And I ain't kidding. The car we are in has a metallic powder in it from its last trip, and it sure is terrible stuff. It puts a terrible taste in your mouth and makes you sneeze like hell. Your chest feels tight as a drum, and it completely ruined all our clothing. I have never lived under such filthy conditions in my life. The next day, the agonies continued. We're still on this damned train, Tobin wrote. We travel about fifteen minutes out of every three hours. The tracks are packed with trains, and that's why it's so slow. We're traveling in Grapes of Wrath style no clean clothes, very little food and practically no water. It's really terrible, but a damn good experience, and I'll never forget it. All of the French soldiers are discouraged, and the morale of the whole train is terrible. Bordeaux, our final destination, was terribly bombed yesterday. Everybody is griping like hell. I sure would like to hear something encouraging for a change. The one thing the Americans were not short of was cigarettes, and they chain-smoked to calm their nerves as the hellish journey continued, stubbing out their butts on sacks filled with the irritating yellow powder. Suddenly, a Frenchman cried for them to stop smoking. The yellow powder was dynamite. On June 22, 1940, the train finally arrived in Bordeaux, where the Americans managed to hitch a lift on a truck to Saint-Jean-de-Luz, a port not far from the Spanish border. Thousands of panicked families choked the town, trying to escape on one of the last boats out of France. Evacuees were dumping their bicycles, carts, and even trucks into the harbor or setting fire to them so the Bosch couldn't make use of them. Children screamed. Mothers sobbed as they handed their children to relatives who had managed to secure passage to North Africa or England. For others, time was fast running out if they were to avoid a concentration camp. Several hundred miles to the northeast, the most powerful Nazis in the Third Reich stood in a railway carriage deep in the forest of Compiègne. In 1918, the vanquished leaders of Germany had gathered in the same carriage, preserved and kept at the same spot to commemorate French victory. Now, Adolf Hitler, wearing a dark brown uniform and an iron cross on his chest, 
Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and Luftwaffe Chief Hermann Goering watched in glee as ashen-faced French representatives signed a new armistice and then bowed to their new Führer, the master of all Europe at last. Part 2. Duel of Eagles When you come right down to it, flying a fighter in combat is just about the greatest game in the world, even if you are playing for keeps. You're up there patrolling. Suddenly you sight those silvery specks coming toward you from across the channel. You hold them for an instant framed in the circle of your gun sight against a background of blue sky. You can't help admiring the picture made by those three hundred planes in tight formations. Then you remember those boys aren't out for a ride, and you start climbing to get above them. From then on, as the old saying goes, you don't have to be crazy, but it helps. Eugene Red Tobin Chapter 4 Per Ardua Ad Astra Always a flamboyant young man, Billy named his sled Satan and outfitted his teammates with yellow turtleneck sweaters. A few days before the competition was to begin, Fisk added another flourish. Each of the members appeared at a practice session with a single letter sewn to the back of his sweater, spelling out the name Satan. This was too much for U.S. Olympic officials. After threats of barring the team, Billy agreed to wear the official American Olympic uniform and to rechristen his sled USA 2. Bud Greenspan. He was absolutely fearless. All morning they shivered on the dockside in Saint-Jean-de-Luz as a gale blew in from the Bay of Biscay. Finally, Eugene Tobin, Andy Mamadoff, and Shorty Keogh lost patience, forced their way past guards, and clambered aboard a large ship called the Baron Nairn. Shorty was almost blown into the water, so fierce was the wind as he jumped down onto the main deck. Tobin looked at his watch as the Baron Nairn sailed. It was exactly 1.15 p.m. on June 23, 1940, as the British registered boat's crew cast off her moorings and the Baron Nairn began to steam out of the harbor, the last ship containing refugees to leave defeated France. An hour or so later, Eugene Tobin again pushed through a crowd of refugees, this time to attend an impromptu mass. By the grace of God, he had escaped the Nazis just in time. Less than two hours after the Baron Nairn left port, the Germans seized Saint-Jean-de-Luz. The Baron Nairn steamed out into the Bay of Biscay and turned southwest, farther and farther into the blustery Atlantic, and then north towards England through ever heavier seas. Conditions aboard were horrendous. Three thousand people filled every gangway and square foot of deck on a boat designed to carry just a few dozen sailors. There were just four lifeboats, which meant that if a U-boat attacked, almost all aboard would drown. It was plenty rough and cold, remembered Tobin. Nearly everyone was seasick. The second day out we had our first meal, consisting of a dog biscuit and a cup of some sort of dishwater. It was hot and it might have been anything. We drank it out of a cold cream container borrowed from a woman passenger. I couldn't swallow the biscuit, and as an experiment I offered it to the only dog aboard. He turned it down. After forty-eight hellish hours, early on June 25, 1940, they arrived in Plymouth, England. It was instantly clear that Britain was not France. A stiff resolve appeared in the faces of the English. What a difference in morale, Tobin noted. The army and navy were disciplined and the civilians calm and businesslike. There were none of the signs of fear and panic we had learned to spot in France. They had arrived in a country suddenly bonded as never before in its determination to avoid becoming yet another slave state in the Greater Third Reich. There was no doubting that the Germans would be resisted, just as Churchill was promising on every beach, in every cornfield, and along every terraced street. Some were actually looking forward to the invasion, so great was their desire to avenge the humiliation of the BEF in France. From Plymouth, the Americans took a train to London and then immediately made their way to the U.S. Embassy. 
They had vague ideas that they might be treated as heroes, recalled their friend, the film director Harry Watts. Instead, they were treated as civil servants treat adventurers the world over. They were classified as distressed American nationals and ordered home. When they talked about fighting, they were blasted by phrases like jeopardizing neutrality. Eugene Tobin's 22-year-old sister, Helen Mayer, would soon receive a letter from her brother explaining in detail what happened at the embassy. He wrote me that the American embassy gave him a bad time in London, she later recalled. The American ambassador, Joseph Kennedy, was not a bit sympathetic. The only thing the embassy wanted was to get them out of England. Instead of helping Gene, the officials told him they were going to put him on a boat back to America. Just a fortnight before, the U.S. Embassy had informed the 4,000 Americans who had not already fled Britain that they should return immediately to America via neutral Ireland, adding that this might be their last chance before the Nazis invaded. Many had chosen to leave. Notably, 70 had done the opposite and formed the first American squadron of the Home Guard and were now wearing a British Home Guard uniform with a Red Eagle shoulder patch. True to form, Ambassador Kennedy was disgusted by this display of militant Anglo-American solidarity and warned one of its officers that the unit might lead to all United States citizens being shot as franc tireurs mercenaries, when the Germans occupied London. Tobin and his fellow Americans were actually issued mandatory travel passes to Ireland, from where they would be shipped home to America. To delay what felt like deportation, Tobin made an excuse about needing to get hold of his birth certificate because he had no passport. Ignoring the embassy's instruction to leave England, the three American flyers headed straight to the British Air Ministry. The way we figured it, the RAF ought to be willing to take us on, recalled Tobin. It looked as though they were going to need every pilot they could get before long. Tobin was right. The Battle of France had cost the RAF 435 pilots. Fighter Command was now 360 short of its full strength, officially stated as 1,450 pilots. Churchill was in fact so worried by this shortage that he had ordered pilots be culled from other services and headquarters to plug the gap. Even so, the British remained outnumbered almost five to one. Britain had 48 squadrons of 754 Hurricanes and Spitfires, roughly 16 planes to a squadron, against the Luftwaffe's 1,464 fighter planes and 1,808 bombers. Again, the Americans were out of luck. We cannot possibly use you now as you have had no combat training, an Air Ministry official told them. We would suggest you go back and apply in Canada. Well, I guess it's the RAF's loss, said Keo bitterly. If they don't want to win the war, okay, we'll go home. But not just yet. They had one last hope, or as Tobin put it, there was only one ace left in the deck. On the boat coming over, we'd met an English lady who told us to look up a certain member of Parliament, MP, if we ran into any difficulties. The name of that MP, which Tobin did not disclose at the time to protect his identity, was Roland Robbie Robinson, a member of the Conservative Party who had apparently helped other foreign-born pilots get into the RAF. They came out of the embassy into the street feeling pretty sick, recalled Harry Watts. But they'd heard about Robinson, so the three American kids, who only wanted to fight and fly against the Germans, and who had found it the most difficult job of their lives, went up to a London bobby, policeman, and asked him if he knew a place called the House of Parliament. And the bobby, in his tin hat and gas mask, looked at their tattered and dirty store clothes and no doubt thought it was a funny time and way to sightsee, but he directed them. At the House of Commons, the Americans managed to track down Robbie Robinson, who promptly arranged for them to be interviewed the next day by a contact of his in the Air Ministry. They quickly impressed the official, and within another 24 hours were being quizzed politely by an RAF recruiting officer. Tobin was asked how many hours he had flown. More than 2,000, he lied. In fact, he had 540 hours solo. Did Tobin have a logbook? I was in the French Air Corps, Tobin answered. I had to leave everything, my logbook, my uniform, even my stopwatch in France.
The following morning, they pledged their allegiance to Britain's sovereign, King George VI. No easy thing for any patriotic American to do, given that Americans had won their independence from King George III. Then they were formally sworn into the Royal Air Force. There was no turning back. They were committed to fighting for the British for the duration of hostilities, and they had effectively forfeited their citizenship to do so. According to the 1907 U.S. Citizenship Act, any American citizen shall be deemed to have expatriated himself when he has taken an oath of allegiance to any foreign state. But to the Americans it seemed a fair trade. Their passports and nationality for membership in the best flying club in the world and the chance to fly a Spitfire. Unlike the French Armée de l'Air, the RAF wasted no time. Within hours they were being fitted with dark blue uniforms, the first they had ever worn. And then they set off to find somewhere to have a celebratory drink. As they sauntered through the heart of London, finally feeling like pilots again, they came across an RAF squadron leader. The Americans saluted for the first time, but the squadron leader looked annoyed. I guess the salute looked more like a hiya, pal, than a good, snappy military salute, recalled Tobin. The squadron leader eyed the three of them suspiciously and then asked to see their identity papers. He was most perplexed by the four-foot-ten Keo. What is he? he asked. A mascot. Mascot, replied Keo. I'm a pilot, you mug. I mean, sir. Thankfully, the squadron leader had a sense of humor. Before being posted to a training course, the Americans dined in London with 28-year-old Charles Sweeney, Colonel Sweeney's London-based nephew. The younger Sweeney belonged to the first American squadron of the Home Guard that had drawn Ambassador Joseph Kennedy's ire. Soon he had introduced the Americans to several other blatantly Anglophile compatriots, such as the burly, Brooklyn-born Quentin Reynolds of Collier's Magazine, Scotty Reston of the New York Times, and the ebullient Harry Watts who would direct the 1942 Hollywood film Eagle Squadron. Watts would vividly recall the three American volunteers. They were handsome young animals with curly hair and magnificent teeth who talked a lot in a vivid, cynical vernacular that belied the sentimentality beneath. Andy was massive and broad, a Russian type with pale blue eyes and a puckish Mongol face, Shorty was a tiny dynamo with a shock of fair hair and an Irish temperament. Red was perhaps the most typical young American of the three. Tall and lanky, he had a grin that split his face in two and a devastating vocabulary of wisecracks that was the delight of his friends and the despair of his seniors. On July 9, 1940, just a fortnight after arriving in England, the Americans were given rigorous physical tests at the Air Ministry and then informed they were to make their way without delay to Advanced Training Unit No. 7 at RAF Hawarden near the port city of Liverpool. Finally, they were going to get back into the air. Well, we'd made it, recalled Tobin with immense pride. We were in at last. Tobin, Mamadoff, and Keogh had arrived in England just in time to fight in the Battle of Britain. But they were not the first from America to cross the Atlantic and enlist with the RAF. That distinction belonged to one of the most remarkable sportsmen in Olympic history, 27-year-old two-time gold medal winner William Meade Fisk III. Born on June 4, 1911, in Brooklyn, New York, the son of a wealthy banker whose ancestors came from English aristocracy, Fisk had attended grade school in Chicago before moving with his family to France in 1924. He was then educated in Paris, spending summers in Biarritz and Christmas vacations in St. Moritz, the exclusive winter resort where he learned to ski and then earned a reputation as a spectacularly precocious and cool-headed driver of the bobsled. At just 16, he won a place on the U.S. Olympic team, and on February 18, 1928, in one of the most thrilling finals of all time, he made international headlines for the first time by driving USA 2 to victory, becoming the youngest male to win a gold medal in the Winter Games. It would be 64 years before Fisk's record would fall, to finish ski jumper Tony Niemannen at the 1992 Albertville Games. Niemannen 
was just a day younger than Fisk. At the Lake Placid Winter Games in 1932, Fisk had carried the stars and stripes for the Americans at the opening ceremonies, presided over by Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt of New York. And he again led America to Olympic gold, doing so with chivalry and style. When the two German bobsleds at Lake Placid were involved in a stunning crash that destroyed both and injured some of the German crew, Fisk arranged for the Germans to be loaned sleds while repairs were made. He even went so far as to recruit a couple of German-Americans to stand in for the injured German team members. By the time he had graduated from Cambridge University with a degree in economics and history, Fisk was very much a European sophisticate, handsome, debonair, and sought after by Europe's classiest debutantes. After traveling extensively, particularly in the South Pacific, he decided to try his luck in Hollywood. In 1934, he co-produced the moderately successful White Heat, starring Virginia Cheryl, the fiancé of actor Cary Grant, and began to get a reputation as a ladies' man. According to one biographer, Grant suspected that Virginia was having an affair with Fisk and paid the operators at the Beverly Hills Hotel to listen in to Fisk's calls to Cheryl. It was also in Hollywood that Fisk learned to fly. One night in 1935, he and a fellow Cambridge graduate, 21-year-old South African Charles Patrick Green, went to a screening of the movie China Clipper and were so inspired by its story of the quest to set up the first Trans-Pacific airline that they decided to take flying lessons. The very next morning, they arrived at Mines Airfield and were soon airborne. Fisk's first solo flight several weeks later was along the Pacific coast in an old fleet biplane. In January 1936, Fisk had returned to Samaritz to win the famous Grand National Championship on the legendary Cresta Run. To many people's surprise, he did not compete for a third gold medal at that winter's Olympic Games in nearby Bavaria, the birthplace of the Nazi movement. According to fellow Olympic medalist Irving Jaffe, he stayed away for political reasons. Way back in 1932, after the Lake Placid Games, Billy was talking to me about his hatred for Adolf Hitler. Almost every day he would tell me how important it was that he won in Lake Placid, because that would be his last Olympics. He didn't want to compete in front of Hitler. When the United States Olympic Committee insisted he enter the trials, Billy had a graceful way of saying nothing doing. The following winter of 1937-38, to 38, Fisk had again broken several of his own speed records on the Cresta run at St. Moritz. As a Cresta stylist, wrote one seasoned observer of the sport, he was a joy to watch, taking the banks at the highest speed in perfect curves without the trace of a skid, and apparently without effort. Described as the right build, strong, safe, with great judgment and a wonderful starter, he was a hero to everyone. When not cementing his reputation that winter as the King of Speed, the title given to him on a celebratory cigarette card because of his extraordinary record as the greatest bobsled champion of his generation, Fisk befriended several wealthy young Englishmen who belonged to the ultra-exclusive Whites Club in London and to the British Olympic skiing team. William Clyde, Gordon Mouse Cleaver, Max Aitken, Willie Rhodes Morehouse, and Roger Bushell. Like Fisk, they enjoyed dangerous sports and fast cars, but their greatest passion was for flying. All had already trained to be pilots and belonged to 601 Squadron, otherwise known as the County of London Auxiliary Air Force Squadron. To a man, the Englishmen believed that the policy of appeasement had failed to contain a resurgent Germany and, notably, to prevent Hitler from amassing a vast new air force whose existence directly contravened the Versailles Peace Treaty. It seemed inevitable that they would see action as fighter pilots within the next few years. If and when it breaks, Fisk told them, I want to be in it with you, from the start. Following the Munich crisis in late 1938, Fisk had hoped that the fast rearming RAF would allow him to fly with his friends in 601 Squadron as a reservist or weekend flyer, and he applied to join them. Unfortunately, his own country's recently passed neutrality laws made it illegal for him to serve in any British armed service. The RAF's official response was that it was not yet in the interests of Britain to enlist American citizens.
Bitterly disappointed, Fisk had returned late in 1938 to New York and taken a job with his father's company, the stockbroker's Dylan Reed. By coincidence, Fisk's skiing friend from 601 Squadron, William Clyde, was working that winter in nearby New Jersey as a corporate pilot, and he and Fisk stayed in touch, often discussing the growing likelihood of war in Europe. It was Clyde who told Fisk in August 1939 that he and 601's other reservists had been called up to active service. Soon after, the State Department announced that French and British visas on American passports would become invalid if war broke out. Determined now to pass himself off as a Canadian to circumvent U.S. neutrality laws, Fisk had cleared his desk at Dillon Reed and booked passage with Clyde to England on the Aquitania. He left New York on September 1, 1940, the very day that the Nazis invaded Poland. By the time the Aquitania docked in Southampton four days later, Britain was at war and its Royal Air Force had launched its first successful strike on the German Navy. Fisk then lost no time in reaching a British contact from the St. Moritz Tobogganing Club, Ben Bathurst, who promised to lobby several senior RAF officials on his behalf. A fortnight later, Bathurst came through. An interview was arranged with Wing Commander William Elliott, a 44-year-old World War I fighter pilot and now an assistant secretary to the War Cabinet. Never had Fisk been so nervous. In his diary, he noted that he would have to make a very passable pretense at being a Canadian and of Canadian parentage. Having no identification papers other than an American passport, which was of no use at all, I had to make up some very watertight answers for any questions they might be expected to ask me. Before the make-or-break meeting with Elliot, Fisk played a round of golf to give himself a healthy look. Needless to say, for once, I had a quiet Saturday night. I didn't want to have eyes looking like blood-stained oysters the next day. Elliot was impressed, and Fisk was formally admitted into the RAF on September 18, 1939. With just 90 hours solo in his logbook, he was posted to No. 10 Elementary Flying Training School in Wiltshire, southwest of London. In his diary, he wrote proudly, I believe I can lay claim to being the first U.S. citizen to join the RAF in England after the outbreak of hostilities. Fisk and his fellow trainees were a remarkably diverse group drawn from the far corners of the British Empire. One of twelve New Zealanders on the course was a shepherd who, in Fisk's words, tried to bolster his confidence before flying by whistling to his aircraft the way he did to his sheep in faraway New Zealand. Others were dangerously inexperienced. Not long after his first solo flight on October 27, 1939, in a Harvard trainer, Fisk was almost killed by a French-Canadian member of his international flight who had agreed to rendezvous with him at 4,000 feet to perform some basic maneuvers. We met up all right. Nearly head on, wrote Fisk. His idea, apparently, is that it doesn't matter how hard your wings hit each other as long as the motors themselves don't come into contact. Another recruit... 20-year-old Hugh Millar recalled that Fisk was popular among his fellow pilots and respected because of his sporting achievements, especially on the Cresta run. And he showed leadership skills within weeks of beginning the course. Fisk, Millar, and their fellow trainees had come to England to join as commissioned officers. But then there was a ruling that none of us would be allowed to enter the RAF as an officer. We all had to be sergeants, explained Millar. Billy and a bunch of Canadians said, hey, You can't do this. We came over here to be officers. We don't want to be sergeants. Billy then organized a meeting with a senior RAF official. The ruling was soon reversed. The bitterly cold weather that winter had grounded many training flights, so it wasn't until April 12, 1940, that Fisk gained his wings and became acting pilot officer Fisk. According to one contemporary, he was now very much the golden boy. Good looks, wealth, charm, intelligence. He had it all. He was very American, but completely international at the same time. The English loved him, and he loved them. With his background, it was natural that he got fighters, and that he managed to get himself posted to 601 Auxiliary Squadron, known as the Millionaire Squadron because of all the well-to-do pilots.
One other American arrived in Britain just in time to fight in the Battle of Britain. Altogether different from Billy Fisk, though no less remarkable, 27-year-old Arthur Gerald Donahue had crossed the Atlantic that July to fight for England, believing it was his God-given mission to defeat the forces of Nazism, or what he preferred to call barbarism. A soft-spoken Irish Catholic teetotaler, he had grown up in southeast Minnesota at the height of the Depression and had been cultivating corn on his family's dairy farm just days before leaving for Britain. Flying and everything related to it had fast consumed Donahue as a boy. One school friend remembered him fitting an old apple box with flimsy wings and sitting in it, his imagination lifting him to the skies. Another noticed his superb eyesight, especially at night, when Donahue would sometimes shoot hoops in an unlit barn during the winter. At age 15, Donahue befriended a charismatic local pilot called Max Conrad, who had broken several long-distance records. Recognizing Donahue's passion for flying and potential, Conrad agreed to give him free flying lessons at an airfield in Winona, Minnesota. He later recalled his pupil's first solo flight at age 16, we, Conrad and his girlfriend, got Art to take us to Rochester in a dual-control plane, and I threw out my control and put him on his own. He made a perfect cross-country flight and probably one of the best landings of his life, and I complimented him on it. He was sweating profusely. Art hadn't wanted to fly yet. He is a perfectionist and didn't think he was perfect yet. After seriously considering the priesthood, Donahue had vowed to friends and family that flying would be his life, his only career. And so it proved to be. At 19, Donahue became Minnesota's youngest qualified commercial pilot. By the mid-thirties, he was helping Conrad run a flight training school and scraping enough together as a mechanic and part-time truck driver to keep his first plane in the air. He also worked in Laredo, Texas as an instructor for a while, and all across Minnesota as a barnstormer, landing anywhere that a small crowd gathered, be it a rutted field near a county fair or beside a work camp on payday. As soon as war broke out in Europe, Donahue considered going to England to join the RAF. I felt that this was America's war as much as England's and France's, because America was part of the world which Hitler and his minions were so plainly out to conquer. But not wanting to worry his parents, he applied instead to join the United States Army Air Corps Reserve. Rejected after months of bureaucratic delay, he headed for Canada, where in June 1940, according to a relative, he was offered and accepted a job in England to supervise the assembly of American planes being shipped over test fly them, and instruct British pilots in their operation. Ten days later, Donahue was aboard a passenger liner, painted a dull gray to protect it from U-boat attack. He had a cabin to himself and top-notch room service and food. After a few days, he had made friends with an attractive English girl who would remain nameless in his memoirs, as would several others. Together, they walked the decks and watched the sun sink each evening into a calm ocean. The prettiest sight of the trip was furnished by a number of icebergs one afternoon, recalled Donahue. The sun was shining brightly, making them appear crystal white and gleaming. There would be many more arresting sights in the months to come. Donahue arrived in Liverpool on July 7, 1940, a dreary, overcast Sunday morning that felt more like winter than summer. He took a train to London and was soon wandering in the blackout around a defiant city that was still the heart of a British empire encompassing the globe. There were a few very dim stop-and-go lights, and here and there dim blue lights marking the entrances to air raid shelters, he vividly recalled. These and the little lights of cars, the glowing cigarette tips, and an occasional dimmed flashlight were the only breaks in the darkness— Far overhead, the silvery barrage balloons hung silent and motionless, like sentinels. The raids hadn't begun then, nor the devastation, but everyone knew they were coming. And London impressed me so much with its greatness and beauty as it stood awaiting its trial, prepared and unafraid. Everywhere Donahue turned, there were signs of that courage. In the quivering upper lips of mothers saying goodbye to their gas mask carrying children before being evacuated, 
in the creased brows of middle-aged veterans of the last war's bloodbaths, sweating in the summer sun as they wielded shovels and filled sandbags that soon scarred Hyde Park. On the tiled walls of underground stations, where patriotic posters had been hastily pasted, your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. All of it profoundly moved Art Donahue, so much so that he was prepared to die to protect and preserve it. To fight side by side with these people would be the greatest of privileges, he recalled. Inquiries revealed that the way was wide open. I could probably get where the fighting was heaviest if I wished. So in a fateful moment on the day after my arrival, I held my pen poised and then signed on the dotted line, I thereby surrendered my independence for the duration of the war. I also presumed that I was surrendering my citizenship, for I understood that the law was so interpreted at that time. As Art Donahue signed on the dotted line, his compatriot Billy Fisk was making final preparations to join 601 Squadron. At last, he could call himself a fighter pilot, if yet untested. He had gained his wings— but others now had something very different in mind for the famous American. Fisk was already being touted by Lord Lothian, the British ambassador in Washington, and by others looking to undermine American neutrality as an extraordinary asset. In their eyes, his celebrity was now a far more potent weapon than any plane he might fly. If they had their way, pilot officer Billy Fisk would not be sitting in a Spitfire's cockpit any time soon. He was far too valuable to waste in combat. On July 11, 1940, the day before he was due to join 601 Squadron, Fisk was summoned to the Air Ministry in London for a top-secret meeting with no less than Air Minister Sir Archibald Sinclair, a close confidant of Winston Churchill and wily veteran of trench warfare. After a few short pleasantries, the 60-year-old Sinclair got down to business. Would Fisk be willing to go on a propaganda tour of the U.S.? It seemed that Fisk was in a double bind. If he refused to do what the air minister wanted, his career in the RAF would surely be doomed and he would be barred from joining his friends in 601 Squadron. But if he accepted and returned to America, he could then be arrested for breaking neutrality laws and be out of the war for good. I've done nothing yet, said Fisk. Why should the American people want to see me? Wait until I've shot down some Henkels. Then, if you still want me to go, I'll go over. To Fisk's great relief, Sinclair agreed that Lothian's propaganda campaign in America would be better served by a pilot who had actually seen combat. And so, on July 13, 1940, Billy Fisk joined 601 Squadron at RAF Tangmere, a bucolic airfield on the south coast at the front line of Britain's air defense system. Tangmere was also home to 43 Squadron, making it one of Fighter Command's busiest bases, with sometimes more than a hundred sorties launched every day. At all times during daylight at Tangmere, hurricanes were positioned nose to wind, their engines revved every hour or so to keep them worn between sorties. The first fighters to break the 300-mile-per-hour barrier back in 1935, these mainstays of RAF Fighter Command had been designed by Englishman Sidney Cam, who had fought tooth and nail to get them into production, but tragically died before he could see how effective they were in combat. Wonderfully sturdy gun platforms, they now outnumbered less resilient but more elegant Spitfires by three to one. Billy Fisk arrived at Tangmere with no pretensions or illusions, and just in time. The Battle of Britain had officially started only three days before, on July 10, 1940, with major attacks on British shipping in the English Channel and its ports. Intensely competitive by nature, Fisk was raring to join 601 in combat. But to go operational, he would first have to pass muster with 601's squadron leader, Max Aitken son of Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister of Aircraft Production. Aitken had misgivings about the untried American adventurer, as did other 601 stalwarts, including 26-year-old flying officer Jack Riddle, an old Herovian whose brother Hugh also flew with 601. When we heard that the whiz kid from America was coming over to the squadron, we wondered, 
Is he going to tell us how to fly airplanes and how to shoot down Germans? Soon after his arrival at RAF Tangmir, Fisk moved into an elegant house with beautifully tended gardens near the base with his glamorous 26-year-old wife, Rose Bingham, the prettiest titled lady in England, according to the press. The Fisks had met and fallen quickly in love at St. Moritz in December 1937. Billy had been at the peak of his bobsledding career. Rose had been at her most beguiling and risque, brows plucked and arched perfectly, dark brown hair tucked impishly beneath a ski cap as she cut back and forth across the trails in the latest figure-hugging ski fashions from Paris. Rose Bingham was certainly no innocent when she met Billy, having scandalized London the previous summer by abandoning her wealthy husband, the Earl of Warwick, and their one-year-old son to pursue an acting career in Hollywood. In September 1938, less than a year after losing custody of her son in a bitter divorce case, she and Billy were married. The nuptials were reported in society pages around the world, and among the hundreds of guests were Fisk's friends from 601. Almost two years later, only two of them now remained with the squadron at Tangmir. Gordon, Mouse, Cleaver, and William Clyde, both confirmed aces. The others, Patty Green and Roger Bushell, had transferred to other squadrons. Late in the afternoon of July 20th, 1940, Fisk flew for the first time in a 601 plane, a Hurricane L 1951, making two patrols. During the next week, he completed several more over the rolling hills and quaint villages of southern Kent, around Folkestone, Dover, and Limp, a region soon to be known to Fisk and his fellow 601 pilots, who were rarely prone to exaggeration, as Hell's Corner. This area was the closest to France, so the Luftwaffe's aces could engage for longer than they could over London, as much as twenty minutes of dogfighting, because they had more fuel at their disposal. Whatever their nationality, none who fought over Hell's Corner would ever forget the front line of the Battle of Britain. More German and British fighter pilots would lose their lives over this small patch of southern England than over all the rest of the country. For Billy Fisk, however, Hell's Corner proved at first to be a barren hunting ground. The millionaires were scrambled, often several times a day, but not in time to intercept maddeningly elusive Dorniers and Stukas as they hightailed it back across the channel. As each outing brought no result, not even the chance to get in a squirt, a short burst with machine guns, Fisk began to lose patience. Too early for fun, he jotted in his logbook after yet another uneventful scramble. We never saw one during the whole day, frustration setting in badly. His old skiing friend, Willie Rhodes Morehouse, Fisk's flight leader, vividly recalled one patrol when Fisk's frustration finally got the better of him. You may talk about the dangers of war, but you can have small idea of what that means until you try coming back across the channel in tight formation with Fisky in a rage because the Germans haven't stayed to fight, close on your tail with his jaw stuck out and his finger glued to the button. Impatience aside, after barely a fortnight in the air, Fisk had impressed his British comrades. The commanding officer of 601 Squadron, flight leader Sir Archibald Hope, believed he had the makings of an ace. Unquestionably, Billy Fisk was the best pilot I've ever known, he would later recall. It was unbelievable how good he was. He picked it up so fast it wasn't true. He'd flown a bit before, but he was a natural as a fighter pilot. Fisk had finally found a challenge to consume all his energies, more rewarding than winning Olympic gold on a Cresta run or making a killing on Wall Street. According to contemporaries, he felt intensely alive and savored every new experience in the air and on the ground, watching dawn rise before it could be seen from the ground, chasing other 601 pilots through the high cumulus and playing hide-and-seek among huge cotton balls of clouds, lounging in a deck chair between scrambles, reading about friends in the society pages of the Times, racing home to Rose each dusk after stand-down and then strolling with her through the grounds of a moss-covered church on his way to the ship, a pub that overlooked the harbor in the village of Bosham. Other pilots often parked their sports cars on the beach a few yards away. If they had one too many pints, the new lads often returned to find their cars swamped by the incoming tide. 
As he knocked back cocktails each evening in the ship, Fisk got to know other 601 pilots, such as 24-year-old pilot officer William Dickey, a Scotsman who had shared in the destruction of a Dornier bomber a couple of days before Fisk joined 601, and 26-year-old flying officer James Gillen, a former instructor with colorful tales of postings to Egypt and Iraq in the late 30s. And then there was 26-year-old Jack Riddle, who had shot down an ME-110 on July 11th and who often joined Fisk and Rose for a stiff gin and tonic or two. Whenever we could get away from Tangmere, recalled Riddle, a dashing old Harovian, we would go over to the ship. My wife said to me one day, how does Billy manage to get to the ship so quickly? Why don't you get here as quickly as he does? I had to explain to her that Billy had a supercharged Bentley, painted in British racing green, that went rather faster than my motor car. Whether racing through country lanes at one hundred miles per hour or coasting to victory after victory on the Cresta run, it had always seemed as though Fisk had a split second more than his opponents in which to make winning decisions. To steer one line or another around a bend, when to break and when to let the sled ride. In combat, this gift would perhaps give him a vital edge. One thing was certain— When Fisk did finally come face to face with the enemy, he would need all the help he could get. Freshly minted pilot officers such as Fisk, with their stiff new caps and unsoiled badges emblazoned with the RAF motto, Per Ardua Ad Astra, through hardship to the stars, could expect to last just a few weeks before they were shot down and killed, drowned, or burned beyond recognition. Surprisingly little had been done to protect pilots from their worst nightmare, being trapped in a plane as it exploded into flames. When Fisk was seated on his parachute, strapped in by his Sutton harness, only a few feet were between him and a fuel tank containing up to 85 gallons of high-octane fuel. One well-aimed incendiary bullet or cannon shell would be enough to toast him instantly in an inferno reaching several thousand degrees. Meanwhile, back in Washington, Lord Lothian had not given up the idea of using Fisk for propaganda purposes. But he now agreed with Sinclair that Fisk would need to seek combat if he were to have any credibility with the American press. If you have one or two real ace fighters who need a rest and who could impress people here by their confidence through actual experience and superiority of our Air Force, he cabled Sinclair, it would be a good thing to send them over for a fortnight. Lothian added that there were few American politicians who believed Britain would survive the summer. Defeatism, now rampant in high American circles, is strengthening the hands of those who are now trying to withdraw supplies promised to Britain for their own armament, on the ground that everything sent to us will be lost within a few weeks. Lothian recommended that the best way to convince America that Britain was worth supporting would be to beat off the German attack and make the argument that helping Britain would also be best for American defense. Lothian had touched on the crucial question very much on the minds of Britons and Americans that July. Would the RAF, with around 900 fighters, be able to beat off the German attack? As one senior British civil servant pointed out, it may well be that the continued existence of this country depends on a few thousand pink-cheeked young airmen. Chapter 5. The Burning Blue It helped to fly crudely, as I did, and not be bound by the rules. The good pilots, often the squadron commanders, were often killed quickly because they flew too well. If you went skidding around the sky, you were a more difficult target. Brian Kingcombe, 92 Squadron Werner Mulders walked onto a runway at the Reckland Test Flight Center at the heart of the Third Reich, and then towards a captured hurricane and spitfire, painted in gray camouflage, their RAF roundels replaced by black crosses. He had been invited by the brilliant Ernst Uday, chief of aircraft procurement and supply, to test the enemy planes. Mulders was only too happy to interrupt three weeks of precious leave to do so. That Mulders was now back in Germany on a beautiful July morning was something of a miracle. After the fall of France, he and a fellow JG-53 pilot, Wolf Dietrich, had been released.
Two of 400 Luftwaffe prisoners handed over following the armistice. Had the French held out for just a few more weeks, as Churchill had urged, he would have been sent to England and then shipped to Canada to spend the rest of the war cutting wood as an embittered POW. Instead, he was back in the fight and still several kills ahead of his nearest rival in the contest to become the war's greatest ace. It was obviously Mulder's destiny to return to the skies for the fatherland. And now he was getting an exclusive tryout of the enemy's best fighters. God was indeed smiling on him. He would now know Tommy's strengths and weaknesses, an invaluable advantage for an ace of Mulder's prowess. The Hurricane is a bit of a tugboat with a retractable undercarriage, he would soon report to his former acolyte in JG-53, in our terms, both are very easy to fly, the Hurricane particularly good-natured, steady as a rock in the turn, but well below the ME-109 when it comes to performance. It's heavy on the rudder, and the ailerons are sluggish. Takeoff and landing of both types is child's play. The Spitfire is one class better, very nice to the touch, light, excellent in the turn, and almost equal to the BF-109, the German designation for the ME-109, in performance, but a rotten dogfighter as any sudden dive and the engine cuts out for seconds at a time, and because the propellers only two pitch, take off and cruise, it means that in any vertical dogfight at constantly changing heights, it's either continually over revving or never develops full power at all. The cockpits of both British planes smelt sweeter than that of the Messerschmitt, which had a sour odor from varnish and lubricants. Crucially, the Messerschmitt ME-109 was more lethal than the Hurricane and Spitfire in its armament. The RAF's fighters had four Colt Browning machine guns mounted on each wing, loaded with 2,660 7.7 mm bullets, many of the DeWild incendiary type. Hence, the Spitfire's well-deserved reputation among Mulder's fellow pilots for actually spitting fire. Mulder's plane, the ME-109, had two 7.9mm machine guns, loaded with 1,000 rounds each and placed above a superlatively engineered Daimler-Benz engine, and two Orlikon cannons, one on each wing. The cannons were particularly effective. Just one or two hits could blow the thin-skinned Spitfire to pieces. By contrast, it would sometimes require several hundred rounds of machine gun fire for RAF pilots to destroy a Messerschmitt and thousands to take down a large German bomber. It was not long before Mulders got the chance to try out his new knowledge of the enemy's fighters. Barely a fortnight after his test flights at Recklin, on July 28, 1940, he took off on his first patrol since being shot down. Mulders was in a buoyant mood, having broken yet another record. He was now the youngest Commodore in the Luftwaffe after being promoted to lead all of JG-51. It had been almost two months since he had last killed, and he badly wanted to increase his score before others caught up with him. Mulder's wingman that afternoon was Eric Kerches, a squadron adjutant in JG-51. The mission nearly over, he recalled, Mulders ordered the other fighters to turn for home while he decided to fly some distance from the rest of the unit, perhaps so that he could observe things from a better position. Mulders and I thus found ourselves alone at twenty-five thousand feet. We knew that our situation was dangerous. We could be attacked by Spitfires, but even worse was the fact that it could get out that a Commodore had flown over England alone with his wingman. Goering had personally written an order to forbid such a situation. He wanted to preserve his Commodore. Meanwhile, 29-year-old Flight Commander Adolf Sailor Milan, a fair-haired South African, was flying in his customary position, ahead of the Spitfires of 74 Squadron. At 1.50 that afternoon, 74 had been scrambled from RAF Manston in 11 Group with orders to intercept JG-51 and other bandits. Since the outbreak of war, Milan had turned 74 Squadron into a highly disciplined and ruthless unit, advising pilots that it was better to shoot the hell out of a bomber than to down it because having to pull severely wounded flying crew out of a crippled plane had a chilling effect on the Germans' morale. 
the highest-scoring RAF ace of the Battle of Britain, Milan had quickly abandoned the standard tight V RAF formation, called Vic, and its rear defender, called Tail End Charlie, for a looser pattern similar to that devised by Mulders, which allowed every pilot to watch out for one another. It was around 2 p.m. Mulders ordered Kerchase to turn back and head for their base at Vizant on the Normandy coast, midway between Calais and Bologna. A few minutes later, just north of Dover, Kerchase saw a Vic of three Spitfires flying 5,000 feet below. His headset crackled to life. Let's shoot them down, ordered Mulders. The Spitfires, with their brightly colored roundels, had not seen Mulders and Kerchase coming out of the sun. Kerchase twisted and turned in his Messerschmitt's cramped cockpit, scanning the skies. Suddenly, he glimpsed several other planes far above, dark specks against the sun. He could not tell whether they were German or British. Achtung, warned Kerchais. A unit above us. Be quiet, snapped Mulders, totally focused on his prey below. Kerchais did as he was told. The legendary Mulders could do no wrong. I trusted him. From afar, aircraft are only small dots and very difficult to identify, Kerchase later explained. A few seconds later, Mulders dipped his wing and then dived. Tracers and cannons spat through the air. Mulders was back on form. Kerchase watched a spitfire fall from the sky. It was now around 2.20 p.m., Sailor Milan swooped down, closely followed by the rest of 74 Squadron, and soon Mulders and Kerchase were surrounded by Spitfires. There was no time for fancy footwork. Mulders opened his throttle and dived one way. Kerchase dropped his nose and went the other, losing 10,000 feet in just a few blood-chilling seconds, and then looked around. There was no sign of his Commodore. But there were still plenty of Spitfires in hot pursuit. Using all the skill he could muster, he dived, turned, dived again, and pushed his plane beyond its specified limits until he was certain he had escaped his attackers. Having lost his wingman, Mulders had meanwhile turned to face several Spitfires. Within seconds, an RAF roundel was in his sights. He instinctively fired. It was a perfect deflection shot. A few seconds later, another victim plunged in flames. Mulder's 26th kill. But now I found myself in the middle of a clump of Englishmen and they were very angry with me, he recalled. They all rushed at me, and that was my good luck. As they all tried to earn cheap laurels at the expense of one German, they got in each other's way. Well, I managed to maneuver among them and made them even more confused. Mulders pulled away and climbed again, intent on taking down another Spitfire. There were still plenty to choose from. According to several accounts, he picked out Sailor Milan and latched onto his tail. But Milan was no novice. He had seen Mulders maneuvering, and before the German could line up a deflection shot, he was pulling his Spitfire around, his face creased with G-force. The Rolls-Royce engine roared as Milan kept pulling his stick over and kept the Spitfire turning tight enough to bring Werner Mulders into his sights. Milan thumbed his firing button, spraying Mulders with a hail of lead. Bullets bespattered my aircraft, recalled Mulders. The radiator and fuel tank were shot up badly, and I had to make a getaway as quickly as possible. Milan had also hit Mulders several times in the leg, but not badly enough to cause serious blood loss. Mulders retained consciousness, though he was in considerable pain. He turned towards France, praying that he would not have to ditch in the shit canal, as many Luftwaffe pilots called the English Channel. Finally, chalk cliffs appeared below. He'd made it. But then the engine made a heart-stopping cough and began to misfire. Mulders checked his instruments. His home base, Vizant, loomed in the distance. He tried to lower his undercarriage, but it was kaput. JG-51's black men, the ground crew, watched with hushed anxiety as their new Commodore approached the airfield, wheels up, gliding towards the grass. To their immense relief, Mulders made a smooth belly landing. Mulders' wingman, 
Kerchase, also landed safely, and then discovered that his engine had been hit twice. I was very anxious to know what had happened to my Commodore, he remembered. As soon as I was on my legs, I was told that Mulders had already landed, but that he was wounded. At that very moment, he was on his way to hospital. Gehring had already been informed of his fate. That same day, I was ordered to call him personally. I did it with considerable anxiety, and I received the biggest bawling out of my whole life. Fortunately, Mulders was not long in coming back. We all remembered for a long time after that his first sortie with J.G. 51. Once again, God had been on Mulder's side. He was wounded, but alive. My visit to hospital proved that I had three splinters in my upper thigh, one in the knee joint and one in my left foot, recalled Mulders. In the heat of battle, I had not felt a thing. The splinter in my kneecap is still there. On this occasion, I experienced the fatherly solicitude of our Reichsmarshal once more. He had me flown to the Air Force Hospital in Berlin. The eleven days at the hospital were a wonderful convalescence. I believe I was something of the showpiece of the hospital when the sisters looked after me in a way that my own mother could not have bettered. Later on, I sent the good people a sack of coffee. It would be another month before Mulders would return to the skies, hungrier than ever to increase his score and prove that he was, without doubt, still the Third Reich's top ace. While Werner Mulders was recuperating, Art Donahue arrived at RAF Hawarden, near Liverpool, to join No. 7 Operational Training Unit. A few days later, his fellow American volunteers, Eugene Tobin, Andy Mamadoff, and Vernon Keogh, also turned up at Hawarden, all keener than ever to fly the fabled Spitfire. Because of Donahue's greater experience, he was given the chance to try out the plane first, only a few days after arriving. For any American pilot in 1940, being allowed to take up a Spitfire was an enormous and rare privilege. And for a first-timer, it was also a nerve-wracking challenge. The Spit was much faster than even the best planes operated by civilian pilots. She could top 400 miles per hour if pushed to her limits. Vastly more powerful than anything Donahue had handled before, her Rolls-Royce engine was capable of generating 1,500 horsepower at 7,000 feet. The last plane Donahue had flown, as an instructor in 1939, had boasted just 40 horsepower. Flying the Spitfire was like driving a sports car, wrote one young pilot. It was faster than the old Hurricane, much more delicate. You couldn't roll it very fast, but you could make it go up and down much easier. A perfect lady. It wouldn't do anything wrong. The Hurricane would drop a wing if you stalled it coming in, but a Spitfire would come wafting down. You couldn't snap it into a spin. Beautiful to fly, although very stiff on the ailerons. You had to jam your elbow against the side to get the leverage to move them. And so fast. If you shot the throttle in a hurricane, you'd come to a grinding halt. In a Spitfire, you'd just go whistling on. One morning that July, Art Donahue climbed nervously into the Spitfire's cockpit and started her up. The sound of the Spitfire's 12-cylinder Rolls-Royce engine was almost deafening, but steadied into a throbbing hum when he closed the canopy and was airborne. Feeling more like a passenger than a pilot, Donahue soon realized that the stories he had heard about the Spitfire were true. She was indeed a beautiful mistress, but treacherous if scorned, and terribly sensitive in the hands of a virgin. I was cruising along at about 280 and drew the control stick back about an inch, rather abruptly, to start my loop, he recalled. Instantly, the airplane surged upward in response, so hard that I was jammed down in the seat, feeling terribly heavy, feeling my cheeks sag downward and my mouth sag open from the centrifugal force on my lower jaw, and a yellowish-gray curtain closed off my vision. I eased the stick forward again to stop the change in direction, and my sight came back instantly. Donahue's fellow Americans had to show that they could handle the dual-control American-built Miles Master before being allowed anywhere near the RAF's best fighter. This kite is the closest thing there is to a Spitfire, Tobin's instructor told him. If you can handle her, you're okay for anything. 
Tobin was determined to prove himself on the Miles Master so that he could advance as fast as possible to the Spitfire. To his delight, it was obvious that he was back in his element the moment he took to the air. Boy, did it feel good to be sitting in an airplane again. Although the Master was three times the size of anything I'd ever flown, she was easy to handle. Duly impressed, Tobin's instructor smiled and then told Tobin to follow him to a corner of the airfield. They soon stood before a spitfire. Two and a half tons of flying heat with a 1,075-horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. What a plane! As soon as Tobin sat in the spitfire's cockpit, anxiety gave way to absolute concentration. Then it was chocks away, and he was bumping along the grass, nose into the wind. Before he knew it, he was airborne, the Spitfire responding beautifully to the slightest touch. To his east stretched the heather and gorse-spotted hills and wind-swept summits of the Pennines. For the first time in my life, he recalled, I had a real taste for speed. I was booming along at a cool 240 miles per hour, the slowest cruising speed of a Spitfire, and I opened the throttle wide to make a steep climbing turn. The next thing I knew, I was diving at a speed of about 430. Luckily, I came to with a couple thousand feet to spare. For Andy Mamadoff, getting into the Spitfire's cramped cockpit for the first time was also a dream come true. Flying one of these warplanes is something you just allowed yourself to think about back home, he later told a British journalist. The first time I was in a Spitfire, I went so fast, I kept getting lost. Those long three-mile loops and rolling at 240 miles per hour without any trouble. When I saw the narrow landing gear they have, I thought it would be dynamite to land. But it didn't worry me at all when the moment came. Over the next fortnight, the Americans flew the Spitfire on average five hours a day, weather permitting. As they learned how best to handle their new mounts, planes, they also bonded with other trainees, many of them drawn from foreign shores, as had been the case on Billy Fisk's training course. We were certainly an international brigade. Belgians, Frenchmen, Czechs, Poles, South Africans, and two Englishmen, recalled Tobin. And the English boys didn't like it at all when we dubbed them the foreigners. Of the 2,917 pilots who fought with fighter command between July 10th and October 25th, 1940, most were British. But a fifth were not. 145 Poles, 126 New Zealanders, 98 Canadians, 88 Czechs, 33 Australians, 29 Belgians, 25 South Africans, 13 French, 10 Irish, 3 Rhodesians, and even one Jamaican pilot. Among these 571 foreigners, seven were officially Americans, according to RAF rosters released in 1940. Of the many nationalities the Americans fought with, they were the only ones who did so against the laws of their country. Art Donahue got on particularly well with the youngest member on his course at Hawarden, 19-year-old Englishman Peter Kennard Davis, a big, dark-haired husky fellow, Kennard Davis had joined the Royal Navy at sixteen to see the world, and was far wiser and cool-headed than his age would suggest. Day after day, he and Donahue paired off to practice gunnery and aerobatics, dogfighting and flying in the RAF's tight Vic formations, wingtips sometimes only a few feet apart. Donahue's nationality was not an issue with Kennard Davis, but it was with others. Around two weeks into the Hawarden course, Donahue sat reading in the officer's mess. By now, he had been nicknamed America by Kennard Davis and his fellow trainees. "'When's your country going to give us some help, America?' asked a pilot. "'I don't know,' replied Donahue. "'They've sent me, haven't they?' "'Yes, but we're never sure whether that was helping us or Germany.' "'Seriously, though, what do you think about it? "'Don't they realize this is a world menace we're fighting?' Yes, most of them seem to realize it now. They seem pretty well agreed that if Hitler wins here, it will only be a matter of time before their turn will come. But they'd rather have it that way, it seems, than take any chances of having their boys fight on foreign soil. What? You mean they'd rather wait and fight in their own country? They say, 
What did we get out of helping England in the last war? They got rid of their menace, didn't they? They forget that they ever had a menace then, and all they remember is that it cost them money. Do they think England got rich on it? If you ask me, concluded Donahue, they don't think very deeply. By late July, the training was over. It had gone so quickly, perhaps too fast. For the princely sum of eighty dollars a month, half what Eugene Tobin had earned at MGM, the Americans could now call themselves pilot officers. We've made it, a relieved Tobin told Andy Mamadoff. Time will tell, replied Mamadoff, who had only just told his parents back in Thompson, Connecticut, that he was in England and had joined the RAF. In a matter of days, the Americans would be posted to frontline squadrons. Their instructors had drilled them over and over on how combat would require a whole new level of alertness and skill, but the Americans were confident nonetheless, aware that they enjoyed a marked advantage over most of the young men passing through Hawarden at that time. They had not tasted a dogfight, but they were experienced pilots, having flown for several years before even climbing into the formidable Spitfire. Donahue had logged more hours before even getting to England than any other American who fought in the Battle of Britain. 1,814 hours solo and four hours of dual flying. He also knew how to fly blind on instruments in bad weather, something every Minnesota pilot was forced to master. If it was action the Americans were still yearning for, their graduation could not have occurred at a more opportune time. On July 31st, with startling accuracy, General Raymond Lee, the military attaché at the American Embassy in London, jotted in his diary, Tomorrow, the 1st of August, is the opening day of the most critical month in history. If the British are standing upright on September 1st, I will say there is a good chance of beating the Bosch no matter what may be happening elsewhere. The next day, Adolf Hitler issued his famous Directive No. 17, calling for the total destruction of the RAF before launching an invasion of Britain. The Luftwaffe will use all the forces at its disposal to destroy the British Air Force as quickly as possible. The attacks must in the first instance be directed against flying formations, their ground organizations, and their supply organizations. Terror raids as revenge, I reserve the right to order myself. The plan to wipe out the RAF was codenamed Attack of the Eagles, and it would begin on Eagle Day sometime after August 5th, 1940. Chapter 6 First Blood Statistically, a green pilot on either side going into action for the first time had three rolls of the die. First roll, four, five, or six, and you get back with your aircraft undamaged. One, two, or three, and your aircraft is hit. Second roll, four, five, or six, and you bail out or force land unhurt. One, two, or three, and you are injured. Third roll, five, or six, and you recover from your injuries. One, two, three, or four, and you are dead. Stephen Bungay, The Most Dangerous Enemy When Art Donahue had signed away his nationality to join the RAF, he had hoped to be sent into combat as soon as possible. That would be his just reward. To his delight, he was not disappointed. On August 3, 1940, less than a month after arriving in England, he was posted to RAF Kenley outside London, at the heart of Fighter Command's No. 12 group. There was yet more good news. His friend, the young British pilot, Peter Kennard Davis, was also being sent south with him to join 64 Squadron. A charismatic 27-year-old Scotsman called Aeneas MacDonald led 64 Squadron. He later described how, despite heavy losses, his 20 operational pilots were in remarkably high spirits that early August and, like Donahue, raring to tangle with the Luftwaffe. It was difficult at times to rein them in. It's like holding a team of wild horses when I keep them in formation when there are Huns near, explained MacDonald, who had taken over command of 64 only a fortnight before. I'm almost afraid to give the tally-ho because I know I'll be alone about two seconds later. They just peel off like banana skins when they get the word to go after the Huns. 
slim, with fine wavy hair, a bushy mustache, and unforgettably piercing blue eyes. MacDonald was typical of the RAF's best squadron leaders. Matter of fact, unemotional about combat, far wiser than his age indicated, and fast on his way to becoming an ace, with three confirmed kills since July 25th, when he had destroyed a JU-87. Sadly, during the same engagement near Dover, two 64 pilots had been lost, shot down in flames as they patrolled over British shipping. Understandably, MacDonald's wild horses were now hungry for revenge. MacDonald did his best to prepare Donahue and Kennard Davis for combat, stressing that they should maximize the Spitfire's advantages over the formidable ME-109. The Spitfire could not outclimb or outdive the faster Messerschmitt. On the turn, however, it was quicker, so long as Donahue and Kennard Davis could stand punishing G-forces as they pulled round. In a dogfight, plane against plane, without the advantage of surprise, 64 Squadron had already proved they were the equal of the Luftwaffe's best. As long as they learned fast and kept their eyes peeled at all times, Donahue and Kennard Davis should be able to tune in and joust with Germany's deadliest aces— and live to tell the tale. The same day that Art Donahue arrived at Kenley, his fellow Americans, Tobin, Keogh, and Mamadoff, were posted to Middle Wallop, home to 609 West Riding Squadron, whose motto, Tally Ho, had been adopted as the RAF's official war cry. Unlike Donahue, the three Americans had joined the RAF looking to fly hot machines, make a little money, and have a million laughs, as Tobin often said flippantly. Now their commitment to fighting against the odds to save England, a country they barely knew, would be put to the test. To their relief, they were greeted warmly on the base. The reception we received at the new station made up for everything that had happened in France and then some, recalled Tobin. We were to go operational in the RAF, and the boys figured that called for a celebration. And what a swell bunch of guys. Two other newly qualified pilots arrived at Middle Wallop with the Americans and brought 609 back up to full strength. Flying officers Tadeusz Nowierski and Piotr Ostajewski. There was not the slightest doubt about their dedication to the cause. Both had fought to the bitter end with the Polish Air Force the previous September and had only just managed to escape ahead of the Nazis to England. They had undergone so much suffering and hardship, recalled pilot officer David Crook, a 609 stalwart, and had lost almost everything in life that mattered to them, homes, families, money, that I think the only thing that concerned them now was to get their revenge and kill as many Germans as possible. Twenty-four-year-old Crook also recalled his first impressions of Tobin, Mamadoff, and Keogh. They were typical Americans, amusing, always ready with some devastating wisecrack, frequently at the expense of authority. Andy was dark, tough, and certainly rather good-looking with his black hair and flashing eyes. Red was very tall and lanky, and possessed the most casual manner and general outlook on life that I ever saw. I don't believe he ever batted an eyelid about anything. Before the war, 609 West Riding Squadron had been an auxiliary unit, comprised mostly of prosperous sons of Yorkshire's factory and mill owners. Barely a year later, it was possible to count on one hand those from the squadron's original 18 pilots who had survived the winter in France and the Dunkirk campaign. In just a week, four of 609's pre-war stalwarts had been shot down. Three more had been lost by June 22nd, when 609 had received a new leader, 27-year-old Horace George Darley, a no-nonsense Londoner who had joined the RAF at age 19. Darley had been sent to command 609, he recalled, because of his awareness of problems peculiar to such squadrons, which were small squadrons of personal friends who had probably grown up together, and in which losses were particularly keenly felt. The general atmosphere in 609 was depressed, which did not help the younger pilots. The best way to raise the men's spirits, he believed, was to vastly improve 609's kill-loss ratio. As the new boys, the Americans would train to become tail-end Charlies, responsible for weaving behind their fellow pilots and protecting them from a surprise attack. Flying in that role was no piece of cake— Many a first-timer was so focused on looking out for his fellow pilots that he forgot to watch his own back. 
As the veterans in both 609 and 64 knew only too well, the result was predictable. Tail End Charlies died instantly in a hail of machine gun bullets. It was not yet 6 a.m., but 64 Squadron's ground crew had already set up a couple of deck chairs, parked two Spitfires to form goalposts, and were now playing a spirited game of soccer. Nearby, Art Donahue and his fellow pilots listened to the radio and sipped mugs of strong tea. It was already too warm for flying suits. Today they would go up in just their uniforms, yellow May West life preservers hanging limp across their chests, cockpits open to the elements, silk scarves tucked behind their starched collars to prevent neck burn from constantly swiveling their heads to scan the skies for bandits. By coincidence, a celebrated American correspondent, Brooklyn-born Quentin Reynolds of Collier's Magazine, was also at 64 Squadron's base on the morning of August 5, 1940. Reynolds had arrived before dawn and had then been introduced to Squadron leader Aeneas McDonnell. The Scot had chatted blithely with Reynolds for a few minutes and had then called Donahue over, knowing Reynolds would be interested in meeting the Squadron's only Yank. As Reynolds and Donahue talked, a telephone in the dispersal tent rang three times. The game of soccer stopped. McDonnell answered the telephone. Twelve or more heading for convoy off Dover. Yes, sir. It was 6.05 a.m. Scramble! Donahue sprinted to his spitfire and climbed into the cockpit. Before he knew it, his rigor had strapped him into his parachute and Sutton safety harness. Then he was pulling on his mask, turning the oxygen on. After a quick check of his oil pressure and fuel gauge and a thumbs up to the ground staff, Donahue's chocks were away and his engine was roaring as he followed McDonnell across the wind-ripped grass. A few seconds later, Donahue felt a tremendous thrill to be aloft with a fighter squadron for the first time. Soon he was jacking up the undercarriage by hand, correcting his course, climbing at 2,000 feet a minute, throttle open, circling the airfield, waiting for all the flights to take up formation. It was 6.09 a.m. as the last of 64 Squadron's Spitfires left the ground. The squadron circled as it climbed to Angel's 10, 10,000 feet, and then McDonnell led the way towards the English Channel. Gray waters appeared in the distance. Donahue felt a bump from the updraft above the coast. Then he heard 64's controller instruct McDonnell to climb to 20,000 feet so they could relieve a squadron protecting an important channel convoy. Bandits are approaching from the north. All Tiger aircraft, full throttle, ordered McDonnell. Full throttle. Donahue had so far been totally focused on flying in tight formation and following McDonald's crisp orders. Now he realized he was finally going to engage the enemy. My pulse pounded and my thoughts raced, he remembered. This was it. McDonnell again led the squadron in a fast climb. Donahue pushed his emergency boost and heard the engine roar with extra power as he tailed McDonnell upwards. The first rule of combat, McDonnell had stressed, was always to try to gain an advantage in height. Making sure he was not caught unawares by a hun in the sun was what most concerned every good pilot, and now compelled each member of 64 Squadron to soar towards the thinner air, spurred on by their emergency boosts. Trembling with excitement, Trying to realize that this was actually happening and I wasn't dreaming, recalled Donahue, I pulled the guard on my firing button. For the first time in my life, I was preparing to kill. The button was painted red, and it looked strangely grim now that it was uncovered. I turned its safety ring, which surrounded it, from the position which read safe to the position which read fire. Donahue then turned on his electric gun sight. An orange light in the form of crosshairs glowed on a six-inch square piece of glass tilted at 45 degrees in front of his nose. Steer 130 and climb to 20,000 feet. The squadron was now over the coast of France. It was Donahue's first sight of the country. Enemy occupied territory. Circle your present position. Watch to the left. Believe enemy is now heading south and passing behind you. Suddenly, a black dot appeared in the distance, and then several bandits were visible. Donahue dived after one of them. The wind shrieked against his canopy. His airspeed indicator moved beyond 400 miles per hour. His controls stiffened. 
He pulled on the stick and raised his Spitfire's nose. The bandit grew bigger, five hundred yards away, four hundred. A barbarous swastika soon visible on its tail. It was Hitler's best fighter, the ME-109E, and it belonged to JG-54's One Group, one of the Luftwaffe's most experienced and lethal units, nicknamed the Green Hearts. Then it was swimming into Donahue's reflector sight, and he fired for a second, the rattle of eight Browning machine guns providing an enormous thrill. But he was still too far from the plane, and his bullets went wide. Donahue saw the German turn abruptly, and then he lost sight of him, but a few moments later he glimpsed him again and dived after him. The German was soon in his reflector sight. Donahue crooked his thumb above the firing button. Pop! There was an explosion. Donahue was stunned. He'd been hit by a cannon shot. Then machine gun fire followed. Swiveling his neck, Donahue saw two Germans on his tail, spitting bullets through their propellers. He rammed open his throttle, making sure not to stall, pulled his Spitfire over, and then tried to outturn his pursuers. G-force quickly crushed him, so he planted his feet forcefully in his G-stirrups, and then he was diving, rolling, standing the Spitfire on its tail, doing aerobatics he'd never dreamt of pulling off as a barnstormer back in Minnesota. The bullets sounded very close. Again, Donahue pulled his Spitfire round. The sun scorched through his closed hood, and his heart raced as he then dodged and fought his adversaries all along the jagged French coastline. Finally, he got behind one of the German planes from one group. But just as he was about to fire, he realized his gun sight was broken. In his reflector mirror, he then saw another green heart on his tail, its yellow nose rocketing towards him. During the next few minutes, I think I must have blacked out at least twenty times in turns, he recalled. I remember starting to spin at least once from turning too violently. I wanted to flee but couldn't get my directions straight because I was maneuvering so fast. My compass couldn't help me unless I'd give it the chance to settle down. It was spinning like a top. Donahue finally managed to shake off the enemy. He had survived his first dogfight. But then he saw yet more Germans from JG-54. They were following him back across the channel towards England. He turned to face them head on, and to his immense relief saw them bank away and head back to France, no doubt low on fuel, red lights flickering on their tank gauges. Shaken and very much sobered, he set course for 64 Squadron's base at RAF Leckenfield. It was only now that he realized that the cannon shell had cut several cables, making the Spitfire barely operable and explaining why the gun sight had not worked. There was a large hole in the fuselage behind his cockpit. Part of his RAF roundel was missing. Donahue had learned his first crucial lesson. Only at a couple of hundred yards at most would he stand a decent chance of hitting the enemy in the brief moments his opponent might appear in his sights. Getting as close as possible was essential. Like most of the RAF's newest pilots, he was woefully inexperienced in gunnery. Now he knew how important it was to master the art of the deflection shot, which essentially meant firing into the patch of sky where the enemy was about to fly. For good reason, many of the RAF and Luftwaffe's best shots were keen sportsmen or had been raised on farms where they had learned to shoot just ahead of their game. Donahue could handle a shotgun as well as any Minnesota farm boy, but hitting a quicksilver target while trying to fly a Spitfire and watch out for bandits on his tail— was something else altogether. The channel stretched away into the heat haze below. A long stripe of white appeared, the high, chalky cliffs of Beachy Head and Dover. Home. Donahue landed back at Leckenfield and taxied to the end of the field, noticing that most of 64's planes were already down. Armorers ran towards him, carrying trays of machine gun bullets. As he shut down his Spitfire, they yanked off covers below and above his guns and rearmed. Donahue then joined the rest of his squadron in time to hear Squadron Leader McDonnell brief 64's intelligence officer on that morning's combat. We met them about halfway over the channel at 14,000 feet. There were about 20 Henkels and at least 21 109s and 110s. We came out of the sun and got fairly close. I sent a four-second burst at one of them. 
McDonnell had destroyed an ME-109 and damaged another. Then there were no enemy aircraft in sight. We came home. Is that all? asked the intelligence officer. Yes, except that Isaac failed to return. He got separated from the rest of the squadron. A Welshman with an uncanny resemblance to the movie star Errol Flynn, 24-year-old Lewis Isaac had flown with the squadron for less than a month as a tail-end Charlie. I saw him, said a nearby pilot. I saw him with two one tens on his tail. By the time I got to him, they had gotten him. He went down. He had no chance to bail out. He must have seen some Messerschmitts coming up to attack the squadron from behind and turned back and engaged them, said MacDonald. I noticed that we weren't attacked from the rear. Isaac had sacrificed himself to save Donahue and his new friends. Donahue went to check on his plane. He was still examining several bullet holes when squadron leader MacDonald found him later that morning. You put up a great show, said MacDonald. When did you get hit? Just when I was on the tail of an ME-110, replied Donahue. I felt a little jar and then all my controls went haywire. I sent one burst at the Messerschmitt but didn't get him. Even my sights were acting funny. But it was fun while it lasted. Donahue beamed, high on his first combat, and then turned towards the damaged Spitfire. It's a beautiful plane. I never saw anything handle quite so sweet. Not far away, Donahue's friend from training school, Peter Kennard Davis, lay in the ankle-length grass, trying to relax. MacDonald walked away, and soon Donahue was sitting beside Kennard Davis and picking shards of shrapnel from his flying boots. "'Will you do me a favor?' Kennard Davis asked. "'Sure. What is it?' replied Donahue. "'Let me have your notebook for a minute, and I'll tell you.' Donahue handed over a notebook he'd bought in a small town in Wisconsin three months before. Now those months felt like years, and Wisconsin felt like it belonged to a different planet. Kennard Davis jotted down the name of his girlfriend and her telephone number. If anything happens to me, will you telephone this number and tell her the story? And then if it's possible, I'd like to have you see that she gets this. Kennard Davis pointed to a wristband on his left hand. Donahue nodded. Okay. It would be 48 hours before Donahue and his 19-year-old friend, 64's youngest pilot, would return to the skies. Then they would be involved in the fiercest fight yet above the channel between the RAF and the Luftwaffe, a midday melee so costly that it would eventually be seen by the German pilots involved as marking the true beginning of their Battle of Britain. Chapter 7. The Channel The really good fighter pilot had a gift. He could scan the skies, take it all in, know how long he had to do something, and then do it. Very few people had that gift. Flight Lieutenant Frederick Rosier, 229 Squadron Art Donahue watched the blue flames in wonder. They flared from the exhausts of 64 Squadron's planes as he and his fellow pilots flew in perfect formation to their advance base near the coast, having left RAF Kenley well before dawn. It was the most beautiful flight he had ever experienced. We seemed to hover motionless, he recalled, except for the slight upward or downward drift of one machine into another in relation to the rest, which seemed to lend a sort of pulsating life to the whole formation. We were like a herd of giant beasts in some strange new kind of world. The Germans were now concentrating all their energies on destroying channel convoys, thereby drawing the RAF into exhausting battles above the cold waters. So confident were some of Goering's top fighter pilots of imminent triumph, they were advising subordinates to take leave in a few weeks' time, or at most a month, when the war would be over. The previous day, August 7th, JG-51's new commanding officer, Werner Molders, had told one of his young pilots, Why marry now when there is only England left? Marry later, to celebrate the victory. Earlier that morning of August 8th, the Germans had tracked the progress of a convoy of mostly coal-bearing merchant ships, codenamed Pewit by the RAF. 
Wanting to prove that the Luftwaffe now controlled airspace above the channel, Hermann Goering ordered that the convoy be destroyed. Soon, Major General Baron von Richthofen, the First World War ace's cousin, was barking at his Stuka pilots, This convoy must be wiped out. By mid-morning, Richthofen's eighth flying group was above Peewit. William Dawson, captain of a 500-ton coaster, the John M., watched as several Stukas broke from the clouds and screamed down in almost vertical dives. I saw a blinding flash, followed by a heavy explosion in the starboard column of the convoy, he recalled. A second later, the same thing happened out in the port column. The explosions rocked the ships and I could smell the cordite fumes blown over on the wind. Down came more bombs, flinging up great columns of water nearly one hundred feet high. Fortunately for Dawson and other British seamen, thick cloud cover prevented most of Richthofen's Stukas from attacking the convoy accurately. Only a few tenacious and brave pilots managed to drop their bombs on target. Peewit steamed on, bloodied but unbowed. Exasperated, Goering's lieutenants ordered a second attack. This time, around 30 ME-109s of JG-27 would escort three units of JU-87s, approximately 300 planes in all, under orders to obliterate the slow-moving convoy no matter how thick the clouds. Here was the Luftwaffe's opportunity to prove beyond a doubt that it could close the channel to British shipping. The strike force was first identified by the RAF's forward radar station at Ventnor, on the Isle of Wight. Such stations provided the RAF with perhaps their greatest advantage over the Luftwaffe, a system of detecting, through small blips on radar screens, any aircraft flying towards Britain from any base along the Normandy coastline. This information was quickly relayed to controllers at various operations rooms, where WAFs, members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, then plotted the enemy's exact whereabouts on large tables. In battle we had to rely on our own human eyes, recalled one German ace. The British fighter pilots could depend on the radar eye, which was far more reliable and reached many times further. It was around 11 a.m. in the operations room of Sector 11 headquarters. Air Commodore Keith Park, the 44-year-old New Zealand-born head of Sector 11, turned calmly to his controller and ordered him to scramble Art Donahue's 64 Squadron and several others. The unflappable Park, recognizable to many of his pilots because of his frequent visits to their bases in his own hurricane, was perhaps the greatest air commander of the Second World War. Tall, impeccably groomed, thin-faced, and ascetic, he had spent more than a hundred hours in the air during the Dunkirk evacuation, and therefore understood exactly what his men needed and confronted. There was no doubting his resilience and courage. He had fought at Gallipoli in World War I with his fellow Australians, had been carried, badly wounded, on a stretcher from the muddy killing fields of the Somme, and then had wangled his way into the Royal Flying Corps before ending the war as a widely respected squadron leader with twenty kills. At 64's advance base, there was an ominous click, and then a black Bakelite telephone rang. Squadron leader MacDonald picked up the receiver, nodded as he was given orders, and then turned to his pilots. Operations just called to tell us to be on our toes. There's a lot of activity on the other side, and they have a fifty-plus raid plotted, coming across farther down the coast. It may turn our way, though. Donahue was soon strapped into his Sutton harness and pressing his starter button, trembling with excitement, hearing other spitfires cough to life as engines turned over. We roared off like a stampeding herd of buffalo, climbing steeply and wide open, he remembered. Two thousand feet, four thousand. There were thick, fluffy clouds at five thousand, and we flashed up through their misty chasms, caverns, hills, and valleys. And then they were dropping away below us and forming a snowy carpet for us to look down on. Maintaining radio silence, Donahue and his fellow pilots glimpsed channel ports through gaps in the cumulus. And then they were above the choppy English Channel. It was around 11.30 a.m. when they spied the Peewick convoy below. Pilot Officer Richard Jones belonged to Donahue's flight. Sixty-four years later, he would vividly recall arriving over Peewick's beleaguered ships and then circling them. We were waiting for the dive bombers. 
Art Donahue got a bit near to the convoy, and of course all hell opened up at him. We had to shout out, Christ Almighty, Art, get out of there, they're shooting at you. It didn't matter to the gunners on the convoy what nationality you were. If they saw an aircraft above, they opened up on you. I didn't blame them. We had a rule never to get too near unless we saw the enemy. Donahue opened his throttle and joined Jones at a safer height. We were about 8,000 feet up, patrolling over the channel, and for a couple of minutes we had received no new orders, recalled Donahue. The sun was very hot, and I wished I hadn't worn my tunic. Donahue's radio whined. There were new orders to intercept incoming bandits, as many as three dozen, heading towards the Kentish coastline near RAF Manston. Breaking away from Pewitt, 64 Squadron flew east. It was around 11.40 a.m. when the bandits, 30 Messerschmitt 109s from the 2 and 3 groups of JG-26, led by 28-year-old Major Adolf Galland, spotted 64 Squadron's neat vicks in the far distance and several thousand feet below. Art Donahue and his friends had been vectored too late and too low and were now terribly vulnerable. It was high time Adolf Galland bagged another of the lords, as some of his colleagues called the RAF's pilots. Whether his prey was a lord or a giant stag mattered little to Galland, described as a shit by some and a gentleman by others. The hunt was what counted, the primeval, life-affirming thrill of the chase. His mission, the aim of every fighter pilot, he believed, was simply to attack, to track, to hunt and to destroy the enemy. Only in this way can the eager and skillful fighter pilot display his ability. Tie him to a narrow and confined task, rob him of his initiative, and you take away from him the best and most valuable qualities he possesses. Aggressive spirit, joy of action, and the passion of the hunter. Many said Galan was supernaturally gifted. Others were less charitable. Galand was very pretentious, recalled Hugo Dahmer of JG-26, who had survived several dogfights by flying as if he had been badly hit. He made himself a star, but in fact he was not as exceptional as has often been described. He used aircraft especially equipped for flying at high altitude, the same as flown by our squadron, the Hohenstaffel, high cover squadron. However, the other pilots in his unit had no such aircraft, so that when he sighted a possible target and accelerated towards it, they were unable to keep up with him. Galan, therefore, was always first to reach the enemy, and the first to be presented with an opportunity to shoot him down. None of the pilots in Galan's flight had the same advantage. They remained behind him and protected his back. In 1938, as a Condor pilot in Spain, Galland had completed more than 2,000 sorties, often flying in just his bathing trunks, and had contracted a severe case of throat ache, the Luftwaffe's term for every young ace's yearning to wear an ever more grandiose decoration at his neck. The Knight's Cross, the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, and ultimately, the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds. He now vied for the ultimate prize of being the war's highest-scoring ace with an exalted group of the Luftwaffe's best. JG-53's burly Karl Hans Mayer, the dashing 25-year-old Helmut Wick of JG-2, touted as a rising star of the Jagdwaffe, the German equivalent of the RAF's fighter command, wily Captain Wilhelm Balthasar of JG-27, with no less than 23 kills to his name, and last but not least, his good friend, Werner Mulders. With poor old Vati Mulders injured, seated behind a desk in Cafier, no doubt fingering his rosary beads, the time for Galland to catch up had arrived. The rudder of his ME-109 already boasted seventeen carefully painted white stripes. On August 1st, Reich Marshal Goering had personally awarded him the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, temporarily easing his throat ache. Only one other had been so honored with the same medal, Werner Mulders. His rudder already had twenty-six stripes. Galan checked his instruments and the electric gun sight in his cramped cockpit, the only one in the entire Luftwaffe fitted with a cigar lighter so he could puff on one of his beloved black Havanas as he glided home after a kill.
Then he opened his throttle and led JG-26's three group down. It was crucial to bounce, guns blazing, and then peel away. In a full throttle dive, he knew from experience the Messerschmitt could not be beat. Art Donahue's radio transmitter crackled to life. Bandits astern! Squadron leader McDonnell reacted instantly, leading Donahue and others in a violent turn. Donahue saw several planes from three group flash past. Tally ho, said McDonnell, his voice calm and reassuring, and then he dived after the Germans. An ME-109 appeared in Donahue's reflector sight. He thumbed his firing button and watched as bullets sprayed across the German plane. Then he broke away, afraid that he would be surprised by another bandit. We had a rule, recalled Donahue's fellow 64 pilot Richard Jones. If you were in a dogfight, you never stayed more than a few seconds on the enemy's tail, because there was always someone on your tail. So you kept moving every second, all the time. Invariably you found that those who wanted the kill and followed an enemy plane down ended up with a kill to their credit, but also got shot up in the bargain. Getting a confirmed target did not matter as much as living to fight another day. When Donahue broke off his attack, he was doing the right thing. Another ME-109 was soon in Donahue's crosshairs. Donahue opened fire. At the sound of eight Browning's letting rip, his confidence surged. They sounded terribly capable and completed the steadying effect of our leader's voice on my nerves. Turning sharply, he didn't have time to see whether the bullets had caused any damage. Then, suddenly, a Messerschmitt was snarling towards him at over 350 miles per hour, head-on, spitting four white tracers. Fortunately, they arced over his head, and then the bandit flashed by. The sky was now crowded with darting and diving machines, glinting like silverfish as they caught the sun. We seemed to be milling about like a swarm of great gnats in this giant, eerie amphitheater above the clouds, recalled Donahue. Sets of long white tracers crisscrossed the air and hung all about, like Christmas decorations. They stay visible for several seconds after they're fired. Donahue twisted and turned, sweltering in his cramped cockpit, looking for his next target and watching his tail. Then another Messerschmitt attacked, again head-on, his guns blazing out their tracers and his cannon firing through a hole in the center of his propeller, puffing blue smoke for all the world like a John Deere tractor. It wasn't a pretty sight. Two of the tracers erupted from guns on either side of its nose, at the top, and two from the wings. Donahue yanked his control stick, turning sharply away from the tracers. In the meantime, 65 Squadron had been scrambled and then vectored towards the mass dogfight involving Donahue, Galland, and JG-26. It joined the scrap around 11.45 a.m., and that's when the first excited shout of Orido filled the Germans' headsets. The shout of victory, the call required of all Luftwaffe pilots claiming a kill. A few seconds later, 65 Squadron's 21-year-old Sergeant David I. Curtin and his Spitfire were falling in flames. Adolf Galland and his wingman, Lieutenant Joachim Munkeberg, quickly fastened onto the tail of another 65 pilot, 31-year-old Flight Sergeant Norman T. Phillips, a former carpenter. It wasn't long before the blonde-haired, strikingly handsome Munkeberg had riddled Phillips with bullets and sent yet another Spitfire to the seas below, trailing black smoke. Galan pulled back on his control stick, opening the throttle to regain precious height. It was around 11.55 a.m. when he spotted Gerhard Grismala, another of JG-26's brightest young talents. Grismala was glued to another Spitfire's tail, busy peppering it with cannon and machine gun fire. A few minutes later, Galan ordered his flight to break away and follow him up into the sun. Meanwhile, the dogfighting between 64 and 65 squadrons and JG-26's other flights had stretched for more than 20 miles above the Kentish coastline. Over several minutes, Art Donahue managed to get shots in at several of Galan's young JG-26 pilots, aiming at their crosses as they flashed across his glowing gun sight. But he did no significant damage. Then, to his horror, he glimpsed yet another Messerschmitt on his tail, firing tracers at him. 
Donahue pulled over in a vertical turn, but the black-crossed hunter stayed with him. Galan had no doubt taught him well, and he effortlessly followed the Minnesotan down. Donahue had only one option, to try to outturn his JG-26 assailant. Stamping his feet into his G-stirrups, he struggled to fend off the gray curtain quickly falling across his eyes, the line of the horizon splitting his windscreen. Round and round he pulled his spitfire. Finally, Donahue eased out of the turn. It had worked. Now he was the hunter with his JG-26 opponent in his sight. The Messerschmitt dived, twisting down like a startled snake, its fuel injection engine screeching. Donahue opened fire. rat a tat tat And then three times more, each time thumbing the button for a second. His victim stopped twisting and appeared dead center in Donahue's crosshairs. Again, he pressed the tip, now for three consecutive seconds, the clattering staccato from his guns making his plane quiver slightly. Blue flashes exploded across the bandit, which then went into a spin. He disappeared into the clouds below, diving straight down, and although he might have gotten home, he certainly wasn't headed right then, recalled Donahue. Two more were following me down closely, and in pulling out of my dive I plunged momentarily through the clouds and then up out of them, turning to meet these two. The powder smoke from my guns smelled strong, and I felt good. This was battle royal. But my newest opponents failed me. As I zoomed up out of the clouds, I saw them just disappearing into the clouds and heading homeward. Another, diving out of nowhere, took a snap shot at me as he went by and down into the clouds, also heading for home. Recovering from the shock that gave me, I looked around and found no more planes of either nationality in view. I appeared to be in sole possession of this part of the battlefield. This was well out over the channel, and I knew I must be nearly out of ammunition, so I headed for shore and our advance base. As Donahue headed for home, Squadron Leader McDonnell and a fellow 64 stalwart, 26-year-old Sergeant Jack Mann, were readying for the kill. JG-26's Lieutenant Aim, at the controls of a state-of-the-art ME-109E4, didn't stand a chance. The 64 duo, flying with as much ferocity and tenacity as Galand and his wingman, stuck to aim like terriers and then opened fire, peppering the German's plane with bullets before watching him spiral into the channel four miles from Dover. It was around 1 p.m. when Art Donahue landed back at 64's forward base. As he taxied towards the dispersal tent, he noticed that one of 64's Spitfires was missing. It belonged to Peter Kennard Davis. Donahue braked, brought his Spitfire to a stop, pulled back on the throttle, reached down and switched off two magneto switches at the bottom of his instrument panel, climbed out of his Spitfire, greeted his fitter and rigor, and was soon part of an animated huddle of exuberant 64 pilots, hands weaving through the air as they recounted their dogfights. Several had seen JG-26's aim spin down and crash into the channel. Texas Shorty, as Donahue was now called, did not express the same passions as his English comrades, the same visceral rage at the Germans. According to MacDonald, he had almost the detachment of a war correspondent. That was about to change. Concerns grew over the fate of Kennard Davis. One of the 64 pilots told Donahue that during the morning's mass dogfight he had seen the white canopy of a parachute, but he didn't have any idea whether it was German or British. Soon, MacDonald was calling around nearby bases to ask whether Kennard Davis had landed there rather than at 64's advance base. He also ordered the rest of the squadron to fly back to its home base at Kenley without him while he tried to locate Kennard Davis. Meanwhile, across the channel, Werner Molders of JG-51 and every other senior Luftwaffe commander received the following order. From Reich Marshal Goering to all units of Luftlotters 2, 3, and 5. Regarding Operation Adler. Within a short period, you will wipe the British Royal Air Force from the sky. Heil Hitler. Back at RAF Kenley, Art Donahue was so worried about Kennard Davis that he couldn't eat that night's supper in the mess. Finally, word came of the 19-year-old's fate. 
At 12.05 p.m., his Spitfire had been badly shot up by machine gun fire from one of Adolf Galland's JG-26 pilots over Dover. Although suffering from severe shock and acute blood loss from several bullet wounds, Kennard Davis had managed to pull back the hood on his damaged plane and bail out. His Spitfire, L-1039, had crashed and blazed for several minutes in a field near the small village of West Langdon. He was admitted to the Royal Victoria Hospital, where he was reported to be in wonderful spirits, cursing the Huns and spoiling for another go at them. According to the doctors treating Kennard Davis, he would make a full recovery if he could survive his first twenty-four hours of hospitalization. Donahue went to sleep that night feeling confident that his young friend would pull through. As far as Galand and his fellow Yagdavafa aces were concerned, it had been an excellent day's hunting. They claimed to have shot down 49 British fighters, a record number. At air bases all along the Normandy coastline, there was also reason for celebration. The entire Luftwaffe's Luftflotte III had been involved in the fighting and had succeeded in virtually wiping out the Peewit convoy of twenty ships. Only four boats arrived at their destination, Swanage in Dorset. The next two days were quiet for 64 Squadron. Art Donahue caught up on his correspondence. Other pilots lounged around in deck chairs, played skittles and ping-pong, and listened to scratched records, hoping the black Bakelite telephone in the dispersal hut would stay silent for another hour, then another until finally the sun set and they were able to stand down and head to the local pub. The inactivity obviously meant something big was brewing, and pilots on both sides knew it. Hans Joachim Marseille, a young pilot with the JG-27's One Group, was one of many who had a gut feeling that the fight to defeat Britain was about to reach a decisive stage. Exhausted after daily combat in July, he sunbathed and slept as much as possible, steeling himself for the final challenge of the war, destroying the RAF. Word had got around that the Führer had endorsed a plan of the invasion of England, and we all believed that this was to be somewhere on or about the 10th or 12th of August. This period of quiet that we were experiencing was to get all our aircraft in 100% operational condition. Many trucks were seen arriving at our base, and we could only assume that they were bringing in fresh supplies of fuel and ammunition. Everyone seemed to know that the planned invasion of England was near. Art Donahue also had time to recuperate and reflect before returning to the fray. I took stock of the events of the week in relation to myself and decided it hadn't been bad, he later wrote. I certainly wasn't sorry I had come here. Although I was pretty scared while on patrol, I felt that, given a little more time to get used to it, I'd be all right. I'd been through two good engagements and felt quite sure that I'd already accomplished a little for the flag I was fighting under. Then tragedy struck. Shortly after breakfast on August 10, 1940, while Donahue was visiting 64 Squadron's adjutant, an orderly arrived carrying a telegram. The adjutant read it and then handed it to Donahue. The telegram was from the Royal Victoria Hospital. Nineteen-year-old Peter Kennard Davis had died from his bullet wounds earlier that morning. His mouth dry and in a state of shock, Donahue struggled to convince himself that this news was just what he needed. It would toughen him for the inevitable losses to come. Somehow, he kept his deep grief in check. I kept trying to tell myself, in the dazed moments that followed, that this was good for me. And somehow that seemed to help me keep control of my pounding heart and wild emotions. When I was alone, I murmured aloud, I'll make it up for you, pal. I'll get the ones you won't be getting now. Wait and see if I don't. The German onslaught resumed the next day, Sunday, August 11th, 1940. I didn't get to go to Mass, recalled Donahue. There were some other blood sacrifices being made to the ambitions of a hate-crazed, power-maddened little man who wanted to take the place of God. It was shortly after first light when 64 Squadron was scrambled. 
Perhaps there was no time to check his instruments properly, or maybe he forgot to do so. But in any case, as Donahue climbed at full throttle, following Squadron Leader McDonnell towards Dover, he realized his oxygen apparatus was not working. He informed McDonnell, who told him he could continue but should leave the formation if it went above 15,000 feet, at which height he would begin to be seriously affected by altitude sickness. For several minutes, Donahue flew on McDonald's wing at around 10,000 feet in perfectly clear skies. But then Kenley's controller ordered 64 to 15,000 feet, and then to 20,000. A large formation of bandits had been picked up by radar and were climbing fast, heading for home. As the Germans crossed the coast, 64 Squadron was to intercept them. Donahue, hating to do it, had to break away and lose height. He decided not to return to base, however, hoping any fight would work its way lower, where he could then rejoin 64. So he listened carefully to the Kenley controller's crisp orders to McDonnell and followed the same instructions, only at 10,000 feet rather than a brain-starving 20,000. Then it began. Donahue heard one of 64's pilots over his radio. Many bandits approaching from the starboard. Look out, cried another pilot. There's more of them behind and above. All right, called McDonnell. Tally-ho! Donahue's radio went silent. He knew 64 was engaged in a terrific fight and that it was close, but he could see no sign of it. Puffs from anti-aircraft fire dotted the sky a few miles to the east over Dover. Donahue opened his throttle and closed on them. The Germans had attacked the anti-aircraft balloons, suspended above the port to ward off attack. Donahue looked down and saw scarlet flames rolling upwards from one of the damaged balloons. A few minutes later, having spotted no enemy fighters, he turned back towards Kenley. At around 7,000 feet, as he neared the base, he saw a dot in his rearview mirror. The dot became a plane. It looked like a Spitfire. Donahue flew on, the Spitfire now on his tail. Tracer fire whizzed past him. The Spitfire was, in fact, a Messerschmitt ME-109. Donahue turned away from the fire and, to his relief, saw the bandit dive and then disappear into clouds. He checked his instruments. He had been hit. The airspeed indicator wasn't working. A few minutes later, he was on the ground, examining his plane with his ground crew. A bullet had cut through his wing and severed his airspeed indicator pressure tube. Donahue's fellow pilots returned one by one, having split up during a prolonged dogfight with ME-109s over the channel. Squadron leader McDonnell had shot down a Messerschmitt and hunted another almost all the way to France, but had then been forced to turn back, out of ammunition. In all, the squadron had claimed four of the enemy. We had one more patrol, which proved uneventful, recalled Donahue, and then our shift was over and we returned to our home airdrome. Our CO, Squadron Leader McDonnell, went to visit Peter Kennard Davis's parents that afternoon. So before he left, I told him the request Peter had made me about his wristlet, and he said he would have it taken care of. The funeral was to be Tuesday morning, and I planned to attend. It was also an action-packed day for 601 Squadron at RAF Tangmere on the southern coast. Early that morning, Billy Fisk learned that he had been designated number three, the tail end Charlie, to 601's blue section. His skiing friend, Willie Rhodes Morehouse, had been told to stand in for Sir Archibald Hope and lead the squadron. It was 10.25 a.m. when the millionaires heard the faint click that always preceded the ring of a black Bakelite telephone. They were soon aloft and then ordered to intercept a bomber fleet and dozens of escorting ME-109s over Hell's Corner. The second, increasingly violent phase of the Battle of Britain was about to begin. The Luftwaffe had changed strategy. No longer was the emphasis on destroying shipping, thereby drawing the RAF into a war of attrition over the Channel. Now the aim was to destroy Britain's key defenses on the ground— Goering's new targets were naval bases such as Portsmouth and Portland, airfields such as Tangmere and Middle Wallop, and early warning radar stations. 
One of the young Germans headed Fisk's way was blonde-haired, 22-year-old Rudolf Rothenfelder, an ME-109 pilot with JG-2. Rothenfelder was flying above his fellow Germans at 30,000 feet, acting as a lookout, breathing steadily from his oxygen. The southern coast of England spread before him. Attached to his leg were a flare pistol and a yellow dye pouch, which could be used to indicate his position to search and rescue planes if he ended up in the sullen waters far below. The pouch also contained rations, caffeinated chocolate, pervitin, amphetamine tablets, and a small bottle of cognac, which Rothenfelder invariably knocked back before takeoff. It was a truly uplifting sight to see what we had assembled in the air, recalled Rothenfelder, there were fighters, ME-109s, and the Stora, ME-110s, which were flying at various altitudes towards the Isle of Wight. We could see, in the far distance, that our fear that the British would not come up and engage us was groundless. Over Portland, there was already an intensive combat in progress, and we could see the first parachutes drifting to earth. In the water below, we recognized green patches which indicated our pilots. It was around 10.35 a.m. when Tangmere's station controller announced that bandits were close by. A few minutes later, at Angels 20, 15 miles south of Portland, Billy Fisk and his fellow millionaires spotted at least two dozen ME-110s and prepared to intercept. Pilot officer Jack Riddle recalled what happened next. The boys had seen the enemy, were all ready to intercept, but then Willie Rhodes Morehouse's aircraft coughed because of engine trouble, and he had to turn back for Tangmere. It was left to Billy to lead the squadron into combat, which he did without a flinch, of course. Vastly outnumbered, as was increasingly the case, Fisk and his flight attacked and were soon set upon from all directions by ME-109s escorting ZG-2, a heavy fighter unit of around a hundred ME-110s, formidably armed with two cannon and five machine guns, one rear-facing. The sky was quickly latticed with tracer fire and cannon bursts. Fisk's earphones filled with excited shouts and curses as he dived after an ME-110. Then, for the first time, the enemy appeared in the glowing orange crosshairs of his reflector gun sight. He thumbed his firing button, and eight Vickers 303 burst into life. Fisk saw blue flashes from his bullets as they spattered across the bandit's long wings and two-man cockpit. It started to fall, one of its two engines on fire, and soon looked as if it were a piece of rag soaked in gasoline, lit and then tossed away. But Fisk could not claim it as a confirmed kill because he did not see it crash. He was too busy trying to escape the attention of another ME-110 that was soon fixed on his tail, blazing away with its four machine guns. After some frantic maneuvering, Fisk managed to shake off the attacker. Within minutes, nine RAF squadrons, around a hundred planes, were fighting against overwhelming odds. Some five hundred German machines, according to JG-2's Rudolf Rothenfelder. The sky over Portland was crisscrossed with vapor trails. Parachutes drifted among falling planes, belching smoke and flame. It was the largest and fiercest fight so far between fighters of the RAF and Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain. To many of the Spitfire and Hurricane pilots battling Rothenfelder and his comrades, it seemed that the Luftwaffe owned the skies. However high they climbed, wherever they turned, there was another swarm of black-crossed bandits. None of Fisk's fellow 601 pilots later recorded their emotions during the battle, but perhaps most would have concurred with Peter Townsend of 85 Squadron, who also fought that day. In the mounting frenzy of battle, our hearts beat faster and our efforts became more frantic, but within, fatigue was deadening feeling, numbing the spirit. Both life and death had lost their importance. Desire sharpened to a single, savage purpose, to grab the enemy and claw him down from the sky. Fisk and his flight were lucky to escape with their lives. The other flight of 601 Squadron was not so blessed.
24-year-old pilot officer J. L. Smithers, a popular Etonian and stockbroker before the war, was last seen crashing into the sea around 10.45 a.m. Five minutes later, flying officer R. S. Demetriadi, brother-in-law of Willie Rhodes Morehouse, was hit by machine gun fire and instantly killed or so badly wounded that he did not bail out. His Hurricane R-4092 splashed into the channel off Portland and quickly slipped beneath the waves. Even the most skillful pilots did not survive for long. 26-year-old flying officer Jay Gillen, a former instructor at Bryce Norton, was shot down at the same time. Gillen and his aircraft were never found. Five minutes later, at 10.55 a.m., William Dickey was also swallowed by the gray waves. All but Gillen had belonged to 601 before the war, back when Willie Rhodes Morehouse had whipped out a checkbook and bought a local gas station so that the millionaires need not worry about filling up their Bentleys and Triumph motorcycles because of strict rationing. Back when Fortnum and Mason had delivered picnic baskets every lunchtime and the weekend flyers had dined on the grass next to their twin-engine Bristol Blenheims. Leading his flight back to Tangmere late that morning, Fisk did not yet know of 601's heavy losses. Jubilant as he landed, he was credited by 601's intelligence officer, Frank Ziegler, with a probable kill. In his flight log, Fisk jotted, Terrific fight. Terrified but fun. Had to lead the squadron in. Willie's engine failed. Then, one after another, four of his friends failed to return. By sundown, Fisk and his fellow millionaires were trying to come to terms with the news that 601 had suffered its greatest one-day loss of the war. Fisk had flown with both Gillen and Dickey only the day before. Across the Channel, the day's fighting was regarded as the ideal dress rehearsal for Eagle Day, Goering's planned coup de grace to finish off the RAF. There had been 38 German and 32 British losses. Six planes from Rudolf Rothenberger's JG-2 and 10 ME-110s had failed to make it back across the channel. Given the extent of the fighting and number of sorties, it was no great blow to the Luftwaffe. For Britain's fighter command, by contrast, the day's score was deeply troubling. 601 Squadron and others had been lured into the kind of dogfights that Adolf Galland had been arguing for since the fall of France. Freed of its role as escort to lumbering bomber fleets, the Jagdwaffe had jubilantly thrown off its chains and fought as it had been trained, machine against machine, ace against ace. If that bloody Sunday were to become the norm, there would soon be too few RAF pilots, let alone 601 millionaires, to fend off the ever more aggressive Luftwaffe. It seemed that there had never been a summer in England with such glorious weather, day after day of bright sunshine and mostly cloudless skies, with often only the faintest hint of a breeze. The perfect killing season. You were awake long before daybreak, recalled one pilot, busy in your cockpit as the first chill slivers of light thrust up out of the enemy's domain in the east. Scramble, climb, vector, buster. Your life was packed with action, the breathless, throbbing sensation of intense danger. You flew and fought the death-long day. Monday, August 12th, 1940, was such a day. It was late in the afternoon when Art Donahue's 64 Squadron was scrambled and ordered to intercept 18 DO-17s of KG-2 that had just bombed RAF Manston, causing severe damage and sending clouds of smoke and chalk dust spiraling several thousand feet into the air. I guess we were all feeling a little subdued, recalled Donahue. We knew that if we intercepted, we'd be fortunate if there was more than one other squadron at the most with us in the fight but 64 Squadron did not intercept KG-2. Instead, after just a few minutes in the air, it ran into the bomber's escorts. 30 ME-109s of JG-26, among them Adolf Galland's acolytes, one or more of whom had killed Peter Kennard Davis. Art Donahue did not know it, but here was his perfect opportunity for revenge. 
Within seconds, fighters were wheeling and diving, it seemed, across the entire horizon. Donahue closed on a bandit, throttle wide open, thumb crooked over his firing button. But then either Sergeant Gerhard Grismala or Lieutenant Heinz Ebling of JG-26's three group spotted Donahue and swooped down. Both were superb pilots and highly experienced. Ebling had already shot down two hurricanes that day. For a fraction of a second, Donahue saw a yellow-nosed Messerschmitt in his rear mirror. It was belching tracer bullets, stitching the sky with minute glowworms that then zipped into his plane. Pop! Pop! The familiar sound of exploding cannon shells racked my eardrums and my plane shook, recalled Donahue. Shrapnel banged and rattled and white tracers streamed by. The firing lasted only a second, but I expected it would start again. Donahue pushed his stick forward to dive. It flopped onto the instrument panel. His elevator cables had been shot to pieces. He pumped back and forth on the rudder pedals. They, too, had gone limp. It was soon a battle simply to keep his spitfire in the air. This was bad. I could smell powder smoke, hot and strong, but it didn't make me feel tough this time. It was from the cannon shells and incendiary bullet that had hit my machine. Smoke from an incendiary bullet was curling up beside me. It was lodged in the frame of the machine and smoldering there. Donahue wondered if he was going to die. His heart beat mercilessly fast. His mouth was salty with fear. He pulled open his cockpit and felt the wind tear at his goggles and helmet. Then there was another ear-splitting bang. Parts of his instrument panel were breaking up. Smoke trails of tracer bullets appeared right inside the cockpit, he recalled. Bullets were going between my legs, and I remember seeing a bright flash of an incendiary bullet going past my leg and into the gas tank. I remember being surprised that I wasn't scared anymore. I suppose I was too dazed. Donahue saw flames at the base of his fuselage. Then a little red tongue licked out inquiringly from under the gas tank in front of my feet and curled up the side of it and became a hot little bonfire in one corner of the cockpit. I remembered my parachute and jerked the locking pin that secured my seat straps and started to climb out just as the whole cockpit became a furnace. Donahue felt a blowtorch intense burst of heat as he lifted himself up in the open cockpit. Then he was yanked out by a two hundred mile per hour wind. Dimly aware that he was falling, he reached for the ripcord on his parachute and pulled it. There was a surreal silence now after the din of the battle. He noticed that one of his trouser legs was missing. His lower leg was blistered and badly burnt. The skin had come off in several places. Around his ankle, it flapped freely. Well, Art, this is what you asked for, he said out loud. How do you like it? Perhaps a minute after bailing out, as he fell through thick clouds, he heard a fighter nearby. The parachute obscured his view. Was it a fellow 64 pilot or one from JG-26? The Luftwaffe had strafed Polish pilots who had bailed out over Poland. Would they do the same over England? Donahue began to panic as bullets zipped through the air. My parachute canopy quivered with each shot, he recalled. It lasted for perhaps a second. I could think of nothing but that a Hun was firing at me and hitting my parachute canopy. I knew that if I pulled the shroud lines on one side, it would partly collapse the canopy and I would fall faster, so I just went hand over hand up the shroud lines on one side until the canopy was two-thirds collapsed. I wasn't taking any halfway measures. That changed my position, so I was looking up and could see the canopy, and I was surprised that there didn't seem to be any bullet holes in it. Then another volley sounded, and the canopy quivered in the same way, and still no bullet holes appeared in it. Donahue looked down. The bullets were from an anti-aircraft gun on the ground. Then the earth was rushing up to meet him, and he landed in a field of oats. Before long, a group of home guard soldiers approached, rifles at the ready. Donahue struggled to his feet, his burns agonizing now as the shock wore off. The men lowered their guns, recognizing the RAF blue of what remained of his uniform, and helped him towards their barracks. Halfway across the field, Donahue's knee buckled and he had to be carried the rest of the way.
In the soldier's barracks, a young medical orderly was soon tending to Donahue's burns. You'll get about a six weeks layup out of this, sir. Don't be silly, replied Donahue. This won't keep me laid up more than two or three days, will it? Well, you've got a couple of pretty nasty burns there on your leg and your hand. The one on your face isn't so bad, but the other two ought to take a month to heal. Then you'll get a spot of sick leave, of course. Yes, I'd make it all of six weeks before you're fit again. A British Air Ministry communique issued early the following day, August 13th, reported, It is now established that 61 enemy aircraft were destroyed in yesterday's air fight over our coasts. Thirteen of our fighters were lost, but the pilot of one of them was saved. Because of his injuries, Art Donahue was unable to attend his young friend Peter Kennard Davis's funeral as he had planned. He would spend a month being treated for his shrapnel wounds and burns near Canterbury. He would then return to 64, by which time it would have moved to the far quieter 13 group area so that its exhausted pilots could get some desperately needed rest. For Arthur Gerald Donahue, the Battle of Britain was over. For his fellow Americans in 601 and 609 squadrons, however, it was only just beginning. Chapter 8. Tally Ho Scarcely had I dropped off when I was in my hurricane, rushing head-on at a 110. Just as we were about to collide, I woke up with a jerk that nearly threw me out of bed. I was in a cold sweat, my heart banging wildly. I dropped off again, but the nightmare returned. This went on at intervals of about ten minutes all night. I shall never forget how I clung to the bed rail in a dead funk. If there is ever a choice between physical and mental pain, I'll take physical every time. Paul Ritchie, Number One Squadron Eagle Day dawned. It was August 13, 1940, the date set by Goering for his knockout attack on Britain's airfields and defensive installations. Billy Fisk and his fellow 601 squadron pilots trudged to their dispersal hut, sheepskin jackets hanging around shoulders to fend off the chill, wet grass slicking flying boots stuffed with maps. Air crews warmed up 601's hurricanes, props blowing away the dew from the Perspex windscreens, revealing the usual specks to be wiped away so pilots didn't suddenly mistake a piece of grit for a Messerschmitt. Billy Fisk was increasingly tired, but could not have been more content. Life has never seemed so good, he told family and friends. It was as if he had found his true calling, and he now fitted into 601 perfectly. The squadron's stalwarts had all hardly accepted him as one of their own, a throwback to a more chivalrous age, a fellow aristocrat who also cultivated an air of suave nonchalance in the face of danger, a jolly good sport who had quickly seen to it that a scarlet silk lining was sewn into his RAF uniform. The RAF's dark blue was not sufficiently flamboyant. They wore red linings in their tunics and mink linings in their overcoats, wrote Fisk of his fellow millionaires. They were arrogant and looked terrific, and probably the other squadrons hated their guts. Rumor had it among Tangmere's ground crew that it cost a hundred pounds, around four hundred dollars, to get a stake in a 601 poker game while awaiting the call to scramble. It was 10.25 a.m. The telephone rang in 601's dispersal hut. Darts and newspapers were dropped, backgammon games suspended. The millionaires were in the air within two minutes. Climbing steeply, Fisk heard over his radio that bandits were in the vicinity. He opened the throttle, heard the growl of the Merlin engine, and checked his instruments. It was around 10.45 a.m. when he spotted several slow-moving Ju-88 bombers, the spearhead of KG-54. Large swastikas emblazoned their tails. Fisk picked out a target, dived until the German plane loomed large in his reflector sight, and then fired. Rat-a-tat-tat. His tracer looked like a stream of vicious ping-pong balls. The German plane's engines began to stream smoke. Then it rapidly lost altitude, but Fisk did not follow it down. There were other bandits to watch out for, other machines to destroy. 
Soon his bullets were ripping into two more gray JU-88s, yet they were somehow able to limp on. One was credited to Fisk as a probable and was later seen spewing black smoke as it struggled south over the Solent, the four-mile blaze of water separating Portsmouth from the Isle of Wight, under heavy anti-aircraft fire. Low on ammunition, Fisk returned to Tangmere where his hurricane was quickly refueled. At 11.50 a.m., the telephone in the dispersal hut rang again. Fisk once more sprinted to his plane and was soon in formation, line astern, flying wingtip to wingtip over nearby Bosham Harbor. A few minutes after noon, he spied around 40 ME-110s flying in what he described as a defensive circle to protect each other's tails. It was the standard tactic for flights of the two-seater fighter touted by Goering as unbeatable. But even though the ME-110s were capable of higher speeds than the Hurricanes, they were so slow to turn that they were highly vulnerable in a dogfight. The German pilots used a different term for the defensive maneuver, the circle of death. And so it proved to be that day. The Millionaires the 601 Squadron sounds very strange. Let's avoid that at all costs because it really is improper usage. Tore the invaders to pieces. Fisk fired on two ME-110s from LG-1. Then suddenly, perhaps for the first time, he knew real fear as cannon fire smashed into his aileron, jamming it. Perhaps he had flown too straight for too long, making himself an easier target for one of the ME-110s armed with four forward-firing machine guns and two cannons. Thankfully, his other controls worked fine. Fisk radioed that he had been hit and then set course for Tangmere. Soon, he could see the airfield in the far distance. He eased off on the throttle and saw his clock airspeed indicator, fall, and then the glow of the green light, which indicated that his undercarriage was down. At last he was safe, his wheels bumping along the turf. His ground crew sprinted towards him, glad to see him home, and were soon helping slide back the hood. Although he had been in combat for just a few minutes, Fisk was exhausted. The strain of a dogfight was immense, and at twenty-eight he must have felt it more than most of his fellow pilots, whose average age was just twenty-two. It was the kind of fatigue that made even the most experienced pilots feel like simply sitting and staring at flies on the dispersal hut's wall, speechless as they tried to unwind. Fisk's fellow American, Art Donahue, already knew it. I didn't want to sleep, but I didn't want to move or talk, or fly, or anything else either. Just relax. As nearly as I can describe it, it is a sensation of being drained completely, in every part of your body, though I don't know what of. But you seem to just want to surrender to relaxation, sitting or lying inert and absorbing whatever it is back into your system. I've heard many other pilots say they get the same feeling. The stress of combat was now taking its toll on every fighter pilot, especially those like Fisk who were still learning to master the hurricane. Throughout fighter command, nerves were fraying and tempers were on a hair trigger. As pilots were strapped into their Sutton harnesses, their cheek and eye muscles twitched. Anything unexpected, any sudden sound or movement, however banal, could fill even the most unflappable with rage. The sight of an airman running for no good reason to a plane. The sound of a bicycle bell. A lukewarm cup of tea after a sweat-soaked dawn patrol. A streamlined piece. A well-proportioned young woman who turned up late because the trains weren't running on time. Constant tension and fear wore down even the most experienced pilots and within a few weeks made them gaunt. Sprogs, young recruits, suddenly looked like their fathers. Lovers and wives suffered perhaps just as much nervous strain. They could not experience combat, but they could easily imagine how it might end. They also awoke on soaked sheets. They too knew the nightmares. Falling, unable to pull the cockpit hood back, clawing at the perspex, yanking a ripcord and then seeing the parachute not open, Blowtorch flames melting eyebrows, the face leaving soft lips feeling like a beak, mangled limbs amputated after a wreck. Like every other pilot's wife, Rose Fisk worried constantly, 
but it was perhaps easier for her to say goodbye and wish her husband good luck each morning before dawn than it was for other spouses. Living with a fighter pilot was not so terribly different to being the lover of a bobsled champion who daily risked life and limb on the ice at St. Moritz. When she had married Billy, he had made it clear that he would not stop testing himself to the limit. He had always admired men who lived at full blast and wanted to emulate them. Nor was he afraid of death, for he had been brought up to believe that the next life would be even better than this one, so long as one earned one's passage to it through noble sacrifice. So many nice people have died in the last few years, Fisk wrote in a letter to his family that year. One is assured of pleasant company on the other side of the pearly gates. And I bet they are all laughing like buggery at us poor mortals. Rose was one of the top debutantes of her generation, so striking that her portrait was hung in the Royal Academy in London that long, hot summer, but there was no haughtiness about her. She dusted, cooked, cleaned, and dutifully tended a vegetable garden as if she were married to some lowly sergeant pilot rather than the celebrated King of Speed. Rosie is the most efficient settler in her and housekeeper I've ever seen, Fisk told his family proudly. She works like a Trojan from dawn till dark and is as happy as a clam. On the morning of August 14th, however, Rose Fisk was not up at dawn. It was long after first light when her mother, who had moved down to Tangmere from London to provide emotional support, woke her and told her to jump out of bed, put on a robe, and run outside. A German bomber was passing low overhead, tailed by a hurricane. Rose ignored her, rolled over, and fell back asleep. An hour later, the telephone rang. Rose answered. Maybe you're not interested, but we fought a terrific battle over the channel, said Billy angrily. One of the Huns, badly shot up and out of ammunition, headed towards Tangmere to force land. I line up alongside to bring him in, take all the trouble to push him five miles off the course in order to bring him over the house and show him to you, and you can't even be bothered to get out of bed and look. Apparently, it was a rare outburst. As with most couples in wartime, for the most part the Fisks avoided argument and instead squeezed as much joy from their limited time together as possible. The urge to make every moment count was particularly strong that summer of 1940, and it was reflected in radio plays and films as well as on the bestseller lists. The most popular book, selling more than 300,000 copies in hardback in just a few weeks, was a long and patriotic poem by Alice Duell Miller titled The White Cliff. One of its stanzas read, Lovers in peacetime, with fifty years to live, have time to tease and quarrel and question what to give. But lovers in wartime better understand the fullness of living with death close at hand. The Fisks understood only too well. Thanks to foul weather, August 14th had so far been a quiet day at RAF Middle Wallop, now dubbed Center Punch by Eugene Tobin. During recent lulls, 609's pilots had tried to distract themselves as best they could. The Polish duo, Tadeusz Nowierski and Piotr Ostrzewski, nicknamed Novi and Osti, often lay on their bunks watching flies climb up a wall, working their eye muscles, improving their long-range sight. And Imamidov preferred to gamble, wagering any spare cash in seemingly endless bridge and cribbage games. Tobin sometimes joined in, but usually opted to be 609's disc jockey, playing over and over the Bing Crosby records he had brought all the way from California. Around 4 p.m., the black telephone rang in 609's dispersal hut. The squadron's adjutant, Flying Officer Dick Anderson, was on the line, asking for Red Tobin. Tobin soon picked up the receiver. Hey, Red, Anderson said. If you hop down to Hangar 5, there's a spit to deliver to Hamble. Tobin grabbed his flying gear, stuffed a few maps into his boots, and headed out of the hut on yet another ferrying mission. He hoped it would be a more successful flight than his last one on August 9th, when he had taken squadron leader Darley's bullet-holed Spitfire to Hamble to get it repaired, but had then wrecked its prop by pushing the stick too far forward on takeoff for the return flight. From Hamble, it had been a long journey back by road to Middle Wallop, where he had had to explain, shamefaced, what he had done to Darley's plane. 
blast it, had been Darley's only recorded response. When on earth would he see some real action? The evening before, in the smoky blue haze of the Black Swan pub in nearby Monkston, he had listened to story after story about 609's best day yet in combat. On Eagle Day, August 13, 1940, the squadron had intercepted 52 JU-87s of Major Graf Schoenberg's STG-77 as they hightailed it back towards France. The pilots of 609 had heard the Germans' terrified shouts of Achtung! Spitfire! over their radios as they tore into the infamous hook-winged bombers, whose maximum speed was 250 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour less than the Spitfires. The ensuing Stuka party had been like swatting flies for Osti and Novi, who had claimed two planes each, and so thrilling that Johnny Dogs Dundas joked that although he had missed the famous glorious 12th grouse shoot in Scotland, the glorious 13th had been the best day's shooting he had ever had. Osti and David Crook had also engaged the Stuka's escorts from the Ace of Spades and given Werner Mulder's boys a bloody nose, shooting down two Messerschmitt ME-109s, one crashing into Weymouth Bay, the other into Poole Harbor. Tobin hoped he would soon be able to share in the spoils, but first he would have to convince squadron leader Darley that he should go operational. Not crashing another Spitfire on today's ferrying mission would be a start. And looking on the bright side, the daily run to Hamble and back left him with plenty of time to flirt with English girls and practice his wisecracks. With this no doubt in mind, Tobin decided to look in on the operations room and its wafts, with their neatly pinned hair, black stockings, and saucy smiles. Then he would stroll over to Hangar 5, at the opposite end of the middle wallet base, and fly to Hamble. Tobin found the girls hard at work, with no time to laugh at his jokes today. Bandits had been detected and were heading towards the area. With a fellow pilot, 32-year-old Flying Officer Alexander Edge, Tobin hurried towards the hangar where his Spitfire was being warmed up. But then, around 80 yards from the hangar, he heard the drone of a fully loaded bomber and looked up to see a JU-88 of the Luftwaffe's Elite Lergeschwader, LG-1 unit, sneak below the clouds. Edge began to run away, but he doubled back and ran directly beneath the bomber after Tobin yelled for him to follow him instead. The bombs landed near enough, but we were unharmed thanks to Red's better understanding of ballistics, recalled Edge. The row of craters lay right across my original line of escape. The bombs kept falling. Edge and Tobin dove to the ground as one landed on Hangar 5, destroying it, killing every man inside, and stunning everyone within fifty yards. My head was spinning, recalled Tobin. It felt as though I had a permanent ringing in my ears. I felt the blast go over me as I lay there, flattened on the ground. I got up and my instinct was to run towards the hangar. It was carnage. I saw one overalled person with his foot and half a leg blown off. Another had a great red patch on his chest with a load of mess hanging from it. Another was rolling in agony with one of his arms missing. The door of the hangar was only half closed, and just inside I could see the bodies of four overalled men on the ground with one seemingly splattered against the edge of the door. I felt sick. I almost threw up there and then. Other Air Force personnel came into the hangar, and they just seemed to go about their business in a respectable and calm manner with no sign of panic. Then I remembered what I was told about the British. No matter how bad the situation, they will always keep that stiff upper lip. Meanwhile, 609's only sergeant pilot, 28-year-old Alan Feary, had managed to get airborne. Thirty seconds after LG-1 had struck, he was banking sharply, his wings at ninety degrees to the ground, chasing the offending JU-88 over Boscombe Down as it fled for the nearest clouds. Slamming open his throttle, the Derbyshire-born pilot closed fast and soon had the bomber exactly where he wanted it, two hundred fifty yards ahead of him, at the center of his reflector sight. Fury opened fire. Over two thousand rounds ripped along the bomber's undercarriage, tearing its belly to shreds and killing all but one of the crew. The bomber started to fall, the altimeter needle in the cockpit spinning hysterically. To observers below, it then appeared to hang in the sky before plunging to the ground, five miles away, 
at North Charford, near Romsey. Back on the ground at Middle Wallop, as soon as the all-clear sirens sounded, Eugene Tobin rushed to 609's dispersal hut. Tobin turned up grinning as usual, recalled David Crook, but with his clothes in an awful mess and covered in white chalk because he had to throw himself several times into a chalk pit as the Huns dropped out of the clouds. Ah, hell, Tobin grinned. I had a million laughs. The Luftwaffe had so far failed miserably to land a decisive blow, even though Goering had thrown the best of his dive bombers at the British day after day. Between them, 609 and 601 squadrons had destroyed more than 20 Stukas on August 13th alone, making them the RAF's most successful squadrons on Eagle Day. Such losses could not be sustained, so Goering reluctantly agreed with his senior commanders to withdraw the highly vulnerable Stuka from the battle as soon as possible. The pride of the Luftwaffe, having terrorized troops and massacred countless civilians from Poland to Plymouth, had finally been neutered. On the evening of August 14th, at Fighter Command Headquarters, Stuffy Dowding and Sector 11 Commander Sir Keith Park pondered the Germans' next move. They're playing games at the moment, said Dowding. They're not going to achieve anything by these scant and random attacks. Something is building. What damage they have done to the airfields has been a setback, but they're still operational, replied a confident Park. Middle Wallop is already back at full strength. We will be ready for them. Chapter 9. That England Might Live High Summer at Tangmere I shall never forget those stirring days, when it seemed the sky was always blue and the rays of the fierce sun hid the glinting Messerschmitts, or when there was a high layer of cirrus cloud. Although this filtered the sun and lessened the glare, it was dangerous to climb through it, for your grey-green spitfire stood out against the white backcloth. When the grass was burnt to a light brown color and discolored with dark oil stains where we parked our spitfires, and when the waters of the channel looked utterly serene and inviting. Air Vice Marshal Johnny Johnson It was still dark when Billy Fisk and his fellow pilots sat down the next day, August 15th, 1940, for their usual breakfast. Bacon and eggs and jam on toast, washed down with mugs of piping hot strong tea. Dawn heralded gray skies, but as the morning wore on, the sun burnt off the cloud cover, and by 10.30 a.m. the conditions were ideal for dropping bombs on England. The first scramble of the day came around 11 a.m. 601 Squadron was ordered to prevent the attack of 60 JU-88As of LG-1, escorted by 40 ME-110s of ZG-2 on the airfields at Middle Wallop and Worthy Down. By midday, the millionaires had destroyed five JU-88s and returned to Tangmere to refuel. A fine morning's work, but not without cost. Fisk's close friend Billy Clyde and another pilot officer had been shot down, but were unhurt. Another of his pre-war skiing friends, Gordon Mouse Cleaver, had been almost blinded from pieces of his Perspex cockpit hood and had only just managed, with great bravery, to nurse his badly damaged hurricane home to Tangmere. Cleaver would soon be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and eventually regain his eyesight, but would not fly again with 601. Fisk himself had been in particularly fine form, managing the difficult task of maneuvering a struggling JU-88 into the Portsmouth Balloon Barrage, having exhausted his ammunition, as the squadron records put it. At the ship pub in Bosham that evening, with the sound of engines still roaring in their ears, one thing was understood by even the most intoxicated 601 pilots. The odds were heavily stacked against them if they were to continue fighting as they had all week. We all knew it was like a game of roulette, backing black all the time, recalled Flight Lieutenant Tom Hubbard, who had shot down a German search-and-rescue seaplane a month before. Our luck wouldn't come up forever. By nightfall, the Luftwaffe had completed its largest attack to date, hitting targets the length and breadth of England, but at the loss of 75 aircraft, causing its shaken pilots to dub August 15th Black Thursday. Tangmere had been singled out by the Germans for attack, but, just as with the raid on Middle Wallop, only a few bombers had penetrated Fighter Command's defenses, and the base had sustained negligible damage. 
Undeterred, Goering ordered the Luftwaffe to return en masse and wipe Tangmir and other eleven group bases off the map the following day, August 16, 1940. The Reich Marshal was certain of success this time, so much so that he ridiculed the concerns of escalating losses expressed by his senior commanders, Kesselring and Spurl, and shrugged off the previous day's serious bruising as simply bad luck. He had not been outsmarted by fighter command. Only three hundred RAF fighters were left, according to Beppo Schmid, the Luftwaffe's chief of intelligence. With the right protection from the Jagdwaffe, his bombers would now finish off Park's force. Conditions were once again ideal as Goering marshaled every available fighter and more than half his bombers. Among the 1,720 German aircraft directed to give the RAF the big lick was a flight of courageous young Stuka pilots. Around noon, they left their base in Normandy with orders to attack Tangmere. Ten minutes later, they were approaching the middle of the English Channel, nervously scanning the skies, painfully aware that at just 200 miles per hour, the Stuka's maximum speed, they were sitting ducks if they came across Spitfires. At Tangmir, meanwhile, an informal party was underway. In the officers' mess, several young wafts mingled with a dozen or so of the base's pilots. Suddenly, the station commander rushed into the room. Girls, get in your cars and out of here, he shouted. Leave everything. Get out. 601 Squadron, readiness. Air crews jumped into action. Among them was 20-year-old airman William Higgs. He had been on duty for 52 hours at a stretch for several weeks and was so tired these days that he often fell asleep on the grass, head resting on a wheel of an assigned plane as soon as he had serviced it. Now, yet again, he and his mates quickly shrugged off their fatigue as they readied 601's hurricanes for combat. It was 12.25 p.m. In Tangmere's operations room, a young waff named Anne Turley George heard a warning of bandits approaching across the channel and went to work. We felt we were a part of things at last, transmitting directions and logging messages. It usually took no more than two minutes to get all twelve of 601's hurricanes off the ground, but that lunchtime the scramble was twice as long because of craters left in the grass runways from the previous day's raid. Knowing they had lost precious time, Fisk and his fellow pilots then climbed as fast as possible to intercept the incoming German bombers. As 601 soared towards the sun with throttles wide open, one of the most extraordinary episodes of individual heroism during the Battle of Britain was unfolding. At around 1.45 p.m., 249 Hurricane Squadron's Flight Lieutenant James Nicholson spotted three JU-88s and attacked. Suddenly, an escorting ME-110 opened up on him. Cannon fire ripped his canopy apart and he was partially blinded by blood from a wound to his forehead. A second explosion set his cockpit on fire. Machine gun bullets then riddled his hurricane from nose to fin, hitting him in the left leg. Yet Nicholson somehow controlled his plane and then, incredibly, set off after the ME-110. The glass on his burning instrument panel had soon popped and shattered in the intense heat, but Nicholson still gave chase. Finally, he got the enemy in his sights, fired, and watched as his tormentor spiraled down to the English Channel. Nicholson then found the strength to get out of his blazing cockpit. He was in such a state of shock from severe burns that he dropped 5,000 feet before he remembered to pull the ripcord on his parachute. When he landed, he noticed that blood was gushing through the lace holes of his left boot. The glass on his wristwatch had melted, but he had the satisfaction of having destroyed a German plane and his courage would soon be justly rewarded with the only Victoria Cross, Britain's highest award for gallantry of the Battle of Britain. Meanwhile, 601 Squadron had been scouring the skies and listening carefully to the Tangmir controller as he plotted the German advance. Many bandits were now closing fast on Tangmir at 20,000 feet. You are only to engage the little boys, fighters, the controller instructed, on no account must you attack the big boys, the Stukas. There they were, small gray dots at first, around fifty Stukas from St. G2 in the hazy distance, flying without escort in a diamond formation. They were crossing the coast. 
A few minutes later, they were nearing Tangmere itself. The squadron leader of 601, Sir Archibald Hope, reported to Tangmere's controller, There are no little boys, but plenty of big ones. Permission to attack? No. They were to engage only escorting fighters. Then Hope heard the high-pitched whine of several Stukas beginning to dive on Tangmere. To hell with this, said Hope. I'm going after the bombers. Disobeying his controller, Hope ordered 601 to attack. But it was too late. The big boys had got through. Dipping his wing to swing around and give chase, to his dismay Hope saw a bomb explode less than fifty yards from 601's dispersal hut, narrowly missing his car. Below, Airman William Higgs heard the ear-piercing whistle of another bomb as it fell towards him. I took off like a rocket for the nearest shelter, which was just outside the barrack block, he recalled. I got to it just in time, just as another airman behind me was hit by splinters and a soldier was badly wounded in the back. The shelter was rocking and swaying and earth was falling from the roof. Fortunately, it stayed in one piece. Shelters, the officers' mess, and two hangars were hit as more gull-winged stukas swooped down out of the sun, their air brakes squealing. Seven hurricanes on the ground were quickly destroyed. They had not been dispersed around the base. After the first stunned disbelief, recalled Waff and Turley George, we tumbled into the shelters whilst they beat and hammered us into the ground. The squadrons thundered off the ground tirelessly. Off they pelted, those glorious, radiant boys. Nearby, Gunner J. J. Ingle of the 98th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Regiment watched in mounting frustration. Neither we or the ground defenses on the airfield could open fire as our fighters were taking off as fast as they could and were mixed up with the Germans. Tangmere's doctor, 27-year-old Dr. Courtney Wiley, had just gone on duty when a bomb landed on his sick quarters. I was suddenly aware that it was disintegrating around me, he recalled. Luckily, I was standing behind a chimney stack with a tin hat on. That took the brunt of the fall. It was lucky that we were in a single-story building. Although the ceiling fell in on me, I was able to get out unaided. Immediately adjacent to the sick bay was a bomb-proof shelter with a red cross on it. The sick were in there, and none had been hurt. The airfield was now dotted with craters. In many places, the earth bulged, indicating delayed action bombs. After a brief lull in the bombing, yet more Stukas attacked. Two airmen were suddenly blown to pieces. Their bodies were being placed on a tarmac path as some captured German aircrew were marched through the gate, stated the official squadron history. One of the Germans was imprudent enough to laugh when he saw the bodies, and a senior RAF officer who was walking to meet them lengthened his stride and punched the German on the nose. At last, the all-clear siren sounded. Ten RAF personnel and three civilians lay dead. Twenty others were wounded. Airman Bill Higgs emerged from his shelter to find utter devastation. The whole area was a mass of bricks and rubble. We had taken quite a beating in such a short time. In one place, airmen had taken shelter in a tanker shed which had nine-inch thick walls, a steel shuttered door, and about a one-foot thick roof. A bomb had burst close by and the blast from it had blown the walls out, the roof crashing on those below. The pilots of St. G-2 had struck with devastating accuracy. Now it was 601 Squadron's turn. Leading the hunt, determined to avenge Tangmere's losses, was Billy Fisk's flight. His close friend Billy Clyde, by now one of 601's leading aces. Working-class 21-year-old Sergeant Norman Taylor. 28-year-old Hugh Riddle, later to become a celebrated portrait artist. 31-year-old Michael Dalton, reputed to be the tallest pilot in the RAF, and Sergeant Pilot Alexander S. MacDonald, who had risen fast through the ranks, having joined the RAF as a lowly airman in 1937. To a man, they attacked with unflinching courage, flouting fierce volleys of rear gunner fire to pepper the cumbersome Stukas as they fled across the channel, sometimes just a few hundred feet above the water, straining to get above 200 miles per hour. It is thought that Billy Fisk dipped his wing and soon fixed on a Stuka, its hooked wings looming in the glow of his reflector sight. Fisk may then have opened fire only to see the Stuka's rear gunner shoot back at him. 
What's certain is that at least one bullet, perhaps an incendiary, struck Fisk's reserve gas tank in front of his cockpit and set it ablaze. Fisk reported to the controller at Tangmere that he had been hit. Bail out! No, I think I can save the kite, replied Fisk. I'm coming in. Flames were licking up his legs and then scorching his hands and the exposed parts of his face. As Fisk struggled to bring the hurricane home, the flames roasted the skin around his ankles, causing horrific third-degree burns, leaving his feet looking like stumps. Pilot officer Jack Riddle had landed, refueled, and was now taking off to go bash the Bosch again when he saw an aircraft coming in with smoke pouring out of her back. It belonged to Fisk, who somehow managed to fly over the airfield's boundary and then touch down. He had extinguished the fire in the reserve tank, perhaps through a sharp dive. Twenty-year-old nursing orderly Jeffrey Faulkner and his buddy, Corporal George Jones, set off in an ambulance, a so-called blood bucket, ringing its bell constantly. We got to Fisk's hurricane on the western boundary of the airfield, recalled Faulkner. The plane was damaged, but it wasn't on fire. Fisk was conscious, but in a terrible state, as Faulkner reached into the cockpit, pulled him out, and then removed his flying jacket, helmet, and earphones. His burns were really horrific. When we took his gloves off, the skin just sort of fell away from his hands. Faulkner knelt close to Fisk and tried to comfort him. It was a marvelous thing that he had brought his plane in. He could have turned upside down and bailed out. But if he had been attacked below a thousand feet, he probably wouldn't have had time in which case he may have just torn back to the aerodrome and landed. I noticed that Fisk's plane was shot up and the fabric of the plane was split. The only thing I remember him saying was, God damned thing. He swore at the aircraft in no uncertain way. The next man on the scene was Flight Commander Sir Archibald Hope, who had been returning to refuel and rearm when he spotted Fisk's damaged hurricane near the airfield's boundary. Fisk's plane was on its belly, belching smoke, he remembered. It must have got a bullet in its engine. There were two ambulance men there. They had got Billy Fisk out of the cockpit. He was lying on the ground. They didn't know how to take his parachute off, so I showed them. Billy was burnt about the hands and ankles, so I told them to put on Tanifax, the stuff we were supposed to put on burns. Hope leaned over Fisk. Don't worry, he said. You'll be all right. Hope returned to his hurricane and then taxied towards 601's dispersal hut. Meanwhile, Faulkner placed blankets around Fisk to keep air from his burns, gave him a shot of morphine, lifted him with Jones on a stretcher into his ambulance, and then drove back to the sick quarters, where Dr. Wiley was waiting. Hello, Billy, said Wiley calmly. What have you been up to? Fisk did not reply. Wiley administered another painkiller. There's nothing more I can do, he told Faulkner. Get him in the hospital as fast as you can. It was twenty minutes later when an ambulance arrived to take Fisk to the St. Regis Hospital in nearby Chichester. Some people say that there was a woman in the ambulance, recalled Faulkner. Perhaps the operations room had phoned his wife Rose, who lived not far from the aerodrome, and she may have come and then sat in the ambulance with him. Fisk was admitted to the St. Regis near death and still wearing his scorched flying boots. There was little hope of him surviving, but then, by some miracle it must have seemed, he began to make a startling recovery. When 601 Squadron's adjutant visited the hospital later that afternoon, he found Fisk sitting up in bed, perky as hell. The tension was yet again almost too much to bear at Fighter Command's 11 Group Operations Room in Uxbridge. Prime Minister Winston Churchill sat impatiently in the gallery overlooking a large plotting board. It was around 6 p.m. when he saw the wafts below push several markers across the board that dominated the room, and then place them mid-channel. Yet another mass raid was headed England's way. Seated at Churchill's side, Sick with fear was General Sir Hastings Ismay, secretary to the War Cabinet, and a glum-looking, blue-suited Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister of Aircraft Production. All three were soon transfixed by a display panel across the room. Red bulbs indicated that every squadron available to Air Commodore Keith Park was either in the air or unavailable. 
Britain's fate appeared to hang in the balance, the margin between victory and defeat excruciatingly narrow. The Luftwaffe's targets were now London's perimeter airfields. The minutes passed slowly as Park issued crisp commands. Churchill appeared not to move a muscle. The wall display finally showed that some of Park's squadrons were available and that the German raiders were turning and heading back across the channel. Visibly weary, Churchill stood up and then walked quickly to his waiting Humber staff car, deep in thought. A few minutes later, he and Ismay were being raced through empty streets towards Chequers, the British Premier's country retreat. Ismay turned towards Churchill. Don't speak to me, snapped Churchill. I have never been so moved. They passed neat gardens, suburbia, and leafy parks in the gathering dusk. Several minutes later, Churchill broke the silence. Never in the field of conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. Ismay was speechless. Back at Tangmere, RAF ground crew and other personnel struggled to get the base operational again. Sandy Johnstone, 602 Squadron Leader, recalled driving to the airfield that evening and finding it in utter shambles, with wisps of smoke still rising from the shattered buildings. Little knots of people were wandering about with dazed looks on their faces, obviously deeply affected by the events of the day. I eventually tracked down the station commander standing on the lawn in front of the officer's mess with a parrot sitting on his shoulder. Jack was covered with grime, and the wretched bird was screeching its imitation of a stuka at the height of the attack. The once immaculate grass was littered with personal belongings that had been blasted from the wing which had received a direct hit. Shirts, towels, socks, and a portable gramophone. A little private world for all to see. Rubble was everywhere, and all three hangars had been wrecked. At the St. Regis Hospital in Chichester, the blackout blinds came down as Rose sat beside her husband, trying to comfort him as best she could. Meanwhile, at the officer's mess at Tangmere and at the ship pub in Bosham, Fisk's fellow pilots waited for news about his condition. He was no longer as perky as hell. In fact, it was now questionable whether he would make it through the night, and if he did, he would never drive a bobsled, drive a fast car, or fly again, unless he learned to use prosthetic limbs. Below the knees, his legs would probably need to be amputated to prevent gangrene. Rose Fisk stayed with her husband throughout that long night as doctors and nurses worked to save him. But his heart and lungs could not cope with the massive trauma caused by such terrible burns, and some time after dawn, 28-year-old pilot officer Billy Fisk passed away. He was the first American pilot to lose his life in the Battle of Britain, eighteen long months before his own country was attacked at Pearl Harbor and finally joined the fight against Hitler. As one of his contemporaries later recalled, his had been a life of many notable firsts. The news of Fisk's death spread fast through fashionable London society and then across the Atlantic and around the world. The celebrated CBS broadcaster, Ed Murrow, was one of many American correspondents in London who paid tribute. The British writer and advocate for women's rights, Vera Britton, wrote perhaps the most poignant epitaph. In smoke and flame, the most highly trained young airmen of two nations have fallen from the sky, and with them a youthful American, gay, fortunate, brilliant, an only son whose best years should have lain before him. In the cafes of the Reich's capital, and all across conquered Europe, that summer's hit song was Bombs on England. The macabre ditty saddened Adolf Galland as much as it stirred the Nazi faithful sunning themselves that Saturday, August 17th, on the sidewalks of the Unter den Linden and on the lawns of the Tiergarten. But what really depressed him was the sight of his fellow Germans carrying on with not a care in the world as he was driven that morning in a horse staff car from the center of Berlin to Karrenhall, Hermann Goering's vast estate forty miles northwest of the capital. Indeed, Galland would never forget his profound sense of alienation on arriving back in the fatherland for the first time during the Battle of Britain. 
Unlike the British, the German people clearly had not the faintest idea what the conflict entailed, how fierce and unrelenting it had become. Galan, by contrast, knew only too well. By now, even some of the hardiest pilots in JG-26 threw up their breakfasts before sorties. And at JG-51, Werner Mulder's unit, the first stop after a briefing was often not the dispersal hut, but the toilet. I had come out of a battle of life and death, recalled Galand, the brunt of which so far had been borne by the fighter force. We guessed fairly accurately that the battle we were fighting on the channel was of decisive importance to the continuance and the final outcome of the struggle. The colossus of World War II seemed to be like a pyramid turned upside down, balancing on its apex, not knowing which way to lean. And for the moment, the whole burden of the war rested on the few hundred German fighter pilots on the Channel Coast. The dark pine forests separating Berlin from Karenhall seemed to stretch endlessly. Eventually, the horse slowed and then Galan's identity was being checked by a phalanx of guards at the entrance to the sprawling estate. Galan was expected and was quickly flagged through razor-wired fences fitted with photoelectric devices to detect any movement from unwanted visitors. Then the horse was cruising along a two-mile avenue, edged with marble lions, toward the massive building that resembled a Swedish hunting lodge, Karenhall, built in 1931 to honor Goering's deceased Swedish wife. Galan stepped out of the horse. Young staff officers in white and red striped trousers scurried to greet him. Werner Mulders waited nearby. There were the usual pleasantries. His leg wound had healed nicely. He would be back in the air soon. Galand and Mulders entered Karenhall together. When they had arrived in Berlin, it had been disorientating, but walking now along Goering's main hallway was disturbingly surreal. Silk hangings adorned the walls. Massive crystal chandeliers, shimmering in the light, dangled from the wooden rafters high above. The ascetic molders and even the bon viveur Galand, with his shiny new silver Mercedes, film star friends, and ostentatious falconer's gloves, were unnerved by the excess. It was grotesque, too far removed from reality. The mud and sandbags of Cafier Airfield, dubbed Devil's Village by Galan's fellow JG-26 aces. It was not the place from which great men ran wars. There were too many monuments to Goering's ego. Too many hunting trophies, too many pelts strewn across the marble floors, too many biographies of his idol Genghis Khan in the library. Mulders and Galand hurried on down the entrance hall, flanked by long carved tables bearing decanters filled with France's best vintages. Their commander arrived to welcome them, dressed in one of his specially tailored uniforms. He pointed to the decanters. Fine wine for my bold eagles, Goering quipped, and then belly laughed. Galand looked at Mulders, who remained silent. The five-foot-nine Reich Marshal had a powerful handshake. Up close, his clear blue eyes were equally forceful. There was no doubting his formidable charm. Servants dressed like medieval courtiers were soon at the aces' sides, holding silver trays bearing Havana cigars and flutes of champagne. Galand took a cigar. Goering appeared mildly euphoric. Little did Galand know that his commander was now taking thirty paracodine tablets a day, his addiction to the narcotic as hard to shake as his reliance on morphine in the 1920s. And Goering was also his usual loquacious self. The decanters held fine wines, he explained, but far inferior to cases now on their way from Bordeaux and Lyon. If the Luftwaffe hadn't been so busy recently, the best vintages would have already been flown in. Again, the belly laugh as Goering rocked back and forth on his heels. Galand and Mulders took their place in Karenhall's vast banquet hall with a group of high-spirited Luftwaffe officers. Goering was soon holding court. As Hitler often did, he began a rambling lecture on the battle, on its broader implications for the Reich and how Britain could be best defeated in the air. The other officers nodded, not one daring to interject. 
Molders and Galand hid their boredom. Goering was telling them nothing they didn't know already. But the atmosphere of confidence and enthusiasm was somehow seductive. Galan began to wonder whether he had too narrow a view of the battle. Perhaps Goering made sense. Maybe Galand had spent too long analyzing the war from a cockpit. Goering announced a break in proceedings. To their surprise, Molders and Galand were then invited into the Reich Marshal's library and awarded the pilot's badge in gold with diamonds, the most prestigious award they could hope for, devised by Goering himself. Only thirty-eight others received this utmost honor during the entire span of the Third Reich. Having softened up his eagles, Goering now began to berate them, imitating the primitive tactics that Hitler used on the Reich Marshal himself to great effect. Cruel words followed. The Jagdwaffe was not trying hard enough. Its tactics were far too cautious. Too many bombers were being shot down, and it was all the fighter escort's fault. The bombers were what mattered, not the fighters. When Goering finally ended his rant, Mulders tried to explain the operational difficulties he and his men faced. They were flying over enemy territory, with only ten to twenty minutes' supply of fuel. London was the limit of their operational range. Engine failure, a broken aileron, often the smallest malfunction could lead to the loss of plane and pilot. Having to get back across the channel after a sortie was often as treacherous as combat and sticking close to bombers made the Jagdwaffe a slow-moving, easy target. Shooting down spitfires and hurricanes was what really mattered. After they had been destroyed, Goering's precious bombers would always get through. Goering again tried to blame the fighters for the failure to bring the RAF quickly to its knees. Galand had heard enough and was about to speak his mind when Mulders cut in quickly, explaining diplomatically that dogfights at 400 miles per hour were different from combat with the Richthofen squadron. The Red Baron's flying circus, back in the good old days when Goering had been the squadron's leader. Goering nodded in agreement. Yes, of course, it was different now. But some things never changed. Just like in the last war, the ablest pilots needed to be promoted to high command to ensure victory. What the Jagdwaffe needed was new blood, new leadership. Men like Mulders and Galand would now take the reins. Mulders had already done a fine job commanding JG-51. Galand would be just as successful in charge of JG-26. Galand protested. He was already in the best position, leading his squadron. He didn't want an entire wing of nine squadrons and a desk job ordering around a hundred fellow pilots. He was a fighter pilot, not a pen pusher. My group is a pleasure to me, and the responsibility is sufficient, said Galand. I am also scared of being tied to the ground and not seeing enough action. Don't worry, said Goering. Galan could still fly with his squadron. Of course he could. But he would also lead all of JG-26. Goering concluded the meeting by asking whether Mulders and Galand had any requests. Ja, Herr Axmarschall, said Galand, to remain a group commander. Goering refused. It was pointless to argue further. Galand had been promoted and could still fly. It was best to leave it at that. By late afternoon, Galand and Mulders were in the horse, winding its way back through the suburbs of Berlin. Galand complained to Mulders about his new role. It would inevitably hamper him. He would not be as free to hunt and kill. Mulders was not in the least sympathetic. He relished the role of fighter pilot, but also high command. Here was his chance to influence strategy and the broader development of the Luftwaffe. Brilliant though Mulders was as a fighter, recalled Galand, his actual abilities and ambitions lay more in the field of tactics and organization. Galand said that Mulders could be the Oswald Bolker, the grand tactician of the last war of this conflict. Galand would be the ace of aces, the Richthofen of the Second World War. Well, said an indignant Mulders, 
You can be the Richthofen. I prefer to one day be its Borker. As long as Galland focused his anger on the enemy and not on his superiors, added Mulders, he might even go one better than Richthofen by actually surviving the war. A veil hid Rose Fisk's pale beauty as she followed behind young men in dark blue uniforms. At Rose's side was her mother, Lady Rosabel Brand. It was all too easy for her to imagine how her daughter was feeling. Her first husband, an officer in the Coldstream Guards, had been killed in action in 1914 when Rose was a baby. Her second husband had passed away in 1929, leaving mother and daughter twice bereaved. And now it was happening all over again. The central band of the Royal Air Force accompanied the funeral cortege as it wound its way through the small village of Boxgrove. Locals bowed their heads. An old man was seen to salute as the bier carrying Fisk's coffin, draped in the Stars and Stripes and Union Jack, moved into the moss-covered churchyard of St. Mary and St. Blaise. The service that followed was short, but packed with emotion as 28-year-old William Meade Fisk, America's youngest ever Olympic gold medal winner, was lauded as a selfless American as well as a skilled fighter pilot. Then Billy Fisk began his last journey. His fellow pilots carried him into the graveyard, to a spot at its far corner, a stone's throw from the airfield he had died protecting. It was thought that this was where he would have wanted to be interred, his headstone overlooking Tangmere Airfield. Buglers played a final farewell for the supreme artist of the run, and then a firing party cracked the silence with parting shots. Among the wreaths then placed on Fisk's grave was one from Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister of Aircraft Production, and another delivered that very morning to the station headquarters at Tangmere. There was a card with it, recalled Geoffrey Faulkner, the airman who had pulled Fisk from his hurricane. I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but it was definitely from Winston Churchill. I told the medical officer. He said, Good God. Having sent flowers with a personal message to Fisk's funeral, Winston Churchill addressed the House of Commons that same day, August 20th, 1940. The gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Part 3. The Narrowest Margin My first emotion was one of satisfaction, satisfaction at a job adequately done, at the final logical conclusion of months of specialized training. And then I had a feeling of the essential rightness of it all. He was dead, and I was alive. It could easily have been the other way round. And that would somehow have been right, too. I realized in that moment just how lucky a fighter pilot is. He has none of the personalized emotions of the soldier, handed a rifle and bayonet and told to charge. He does not even have to share the dangerous emotions of the bomber pilot who night after night must experience the childhood longing for smashing things. The fighter pilot's emotions are those of the duelist. Cool, precise, impersonal. He is privileged to kill well. For if one must either kill or be killed, as now one must, it should, I feel, be done with dignity. Death should be given the setting it deserves. It must never be a pettiness. And for the fighter pilot, it never can be. Flight Lieutenant Richard Hillary, The Last Enemy Chapter 10 Huns in the Sun Hardly a day was now passing without some striking event taking place. The death of a friend or enemy provided food for a few moments' thought, before the next swirling dogfight began to distract the cogitating mind from stupid thoughts such as sadness or pity. Remorse had long since died. 
It was the act of living that perhaps became the most exciting form of occupation. Any fool could be killed. That was being proved all the time. No, the art was to cheat the reaper and merely blunt his scythe a little. After all, it was only a game, and he was bound to win. But it was fun while it lasted. Jeffrey Page, DSO, OBE, DFC, and BAR. The long wait was over. Finally, the 609 Yanks were to go operational. On August 16, 1940, the same day Billy Fisk was shot down, his fellow Americans in 609 Squadron learned that they were to alternate weaving behind 609's two flights, A and B, watching for surprise attacks by the swarms of German ME-109s that were now escorting bombing raids on Fighter Command's 11 group bases. If you want to go chasing a DFC all over the deck, go somewhere else, squadron leader Darley warned them. We go up as twelve and we come down as twelve. If we lose even two, the odds are shortened immediately. Tobin had been assigned to be the tail-end Charlie to A-Flight's commander, Frank Howell, a Dunkirk veteran, and his wingman, Jeffrey Gaunt, a tall and gregarious character brimming with humor and life. He was one of the best-looking fellows I've ever met, recalled Tobin. He had a rosy complexion, a big set of white teeth, blonde wavy hair, and a perfect English accent. Before dawn, 609's pilots gathered in their dispersal hut, a small brick bungalow on the edge of Middle Wallops airfield. It was always the worst time of day on the airfield. Pilots were tired, anxious, and increasingly tense as they waited for the call to action. Since the wisecracking Americans had arrived, however, plenty of laughs had lightened the mood. Even the most exhausted and depressed pilots couldn't help but smile when Shorty Keogh had to be given a leg up into his Spitfire. Shorty was the smallest man I ever saw, recalled David Crook, barring circus freaks, but he possessed a very stout size in hearts. When he arrived in the squadron, we couldn't believe that he would ever reach the rudder bar in a spit. Apparently the medical board thought the same and refused to have him at first, as he was much shorter than RAF minimum requirements. However, Shorty insisted on having a trial, and he produced two cushions which he had brought all the way from the States via France, especially for this purpose. One went under his parachute and raised him up, the other he wedged in the small of his back, and thus he managed to fly a Spitfire satisfactorily, though in the machine all you could see of him was the top of his head and a couple of eyes peering over the edge of the cockpit. According to Crook's fellow pilot officer, Michael Appleby, Shorty was so short because he had had two vertebrae removed after a parachute accident. It was around 8 a.m. The telephone in the dispersal hut rang like some monstrous alarm clock, jolting, dozing pilots awake. A few seconds later, they were sprinting to their planes. Saddle her up! I'm riding! shouted Tobin to his ground crew. Tobin jumped up onto the wing and climbed into his cockpit. Quickly, with the engine roaring, he fitted his oxygen mask and checked his fuel gauges, headset, and instruments. Undercarriage light on. Okay. Oil pressure. Okay. Then he adjusted his helmet and made sure he plugged it into the radio transmission set in the Spitfire. Suddenly, he could hear the middle wallop controller, squadron leader Gavin Anderson. Many, many bandits headed southeast. Twenty thousand feet. Tobin taxied to take off, his eyes glued to his A-section leader, Frank Howell, the twenty-eight-year-old ace who through hard-won experience had learned how to maximize his chances of survival. If Tobin could stick with him, he might also stay alive long enough to learn the basics of successful air combat, how to hunt without becoming the hunted. Howell's long-nosed spitfire lifted off the grass and was closely followed by that of Jeffrey Gaunt, Howell's number two. A few seconds later, their arse end Charlie, Tobin, was opening up his Spitfire MK-1 to full throttle and climbing with them. He manually pulled up the undercarriage and then closed his hatch. Then Howell, whose radio designation was Sorbo Leader, and Gaunt took up position and Tobin slotted in behind them, completing the standard RAF-V, or VIC, formation. The Germans had a derisive name for the RAF's V formation. They called them rows of idiots because they were easy prey for Messerschmitts diving out of the sun, especially the tail-end Charlies.
like Tobin. Hello, Sorbo leader, called the controller at Middle Wallop. Hello, Sorbo leader, Howell replied in his North London accent, receiving you loud and clear. Have you any information? Hello, Sorbo leader. Scramble at 20,000 feet. Many, many bandits. Tobin climbed behind his section leader, checking his instruments and looking around as often as possible for enemy fighters, his shirt collar chafing against his neck. He then turned on his reflector gun sight, flicking a switch above his airspeed indicator. His guns had been set for convergence at 200 to 250 yards. His mind raced with concerns. Is the manifold pressure too high? Will the guns work? Is the motor getting hot? Is the oil pressure dropping? Tobin had been climbing fast for around six minutes when he noticed that he was at 15,000 feet. His flying helmet felt tight, so he took his hand off his control stick to adjust it, but in so doing his plane shifted a few degrees and he fell out of formation. To his embarrassment, he saw the whole of 609 change course to compensate. Tobin tried to correct. His rudder pedals felt sluggish. Not a good sign. But there was nothing he could do about it now. Hello, Sorbo leader. Hello, Sorbo leader. Are you receiving me? Hello, Bandy, replied Howell, receiving you loud and clear. Nothing yet. Have you any further information? Hello, Sorbo leader. Vector on compass course 230. They were headed over the channel. Tobin reached down and set his compass and concentrated on keeping up with the squadron. Again, he checked his altimeter. 18,000 feet. He was now beginning to feel slightly giddy, as if he'd knocked back a couple of cocktails on an empty stomach. He had climbed so fast that he had not had time to adjust to the thinner air. Tobin saw Howell pull out of the climb. He followed, and again 609 began to cruise in tight formation. Tobin then throttled back and forward to adjust his position. All the time he twisted around, scanning the vast sky for the enemy. Then he increased his oxygen intake, holding the stick with one hand while using the other to pump more head-clearing gas into his mask. Howell's voice crackled over the headset. Okay, Charlie. Weave. Tobin began to weave, watching the other planes fly on their straight course. Many, many bandits at three o'clock. Tobin looked up. Forty-five JU-88s were barely visible through a swarm of protective ME-109s. Hello, Sorbo leader. There are many, many bandits in your vicinity. Hello, Bandy. Your message received and understood, replied Howell calmly. Okay, Charlie. Come on in. Tobin stopped weaving and drew closer to Gaunt and Howell, who then led the flight beyond the effective range of the bomber's gunners. Soon Tobin spotted another RAF squadron, flying hurricanes, well below the JU-88s. The odds were a little better now. Both sides sized each other up. The Messerschmitts hovered, adjusting to their prey's movements, waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. A lone German fighter swooped down, hoping to lure a Spitfire out of formation so the sharp-eyed dog packs above could instantly lunge and then tear it apart. Get the wise guy coming down, shouted Tobin. The hurricanes below reacted immediately. Tracer fire zipped into the bandit. Tobin watched it stall and then tumble down in flames. Howell carefully edged towards the JU-88s, Gaunt sticking with him. Tobin stayed as close to Gaunt and Howell as he dared. By now, all 609's twelve planes were lined up, both flights preparing to attack. Tally-ho! shouted Howell. Pilot Officer David Crook flew at the tail of 609. I shall never forget seeing the long line of spitfires ahead, he recalled, sweeping round and curling round at terrific speed to strike right into the middle of the German formation. It was superb. All of a sudden, the waiting was over. Tobin screamed down after Howell and Gaunt midway along the line of spitfires. Then the sky suddenly seemed to be crowded with spitfires and Messerschmitts, their vapor trails crisscrossing the bright blue like skate marks on an ice rink. Tobin caught sight of an ME-110 and was soon chasing it. The German went into a climbing turn and Tobin followed, gradually closing. Yellow tracer fire flashed past. The ME-110's rear gunner was blasting away at him. 
It was mesmerizing. Bullets left the bandit so slowly, it seemed, arcing across the sky with elegant precision. They looked as if they were moving away, but then curled violently towards him, skipping over his head. Get the rear gunner, Tobin said to himself. Tracers again zipped past him, uncomfortably close. Tobin opened his throttle. The Spitfire seemed to leap forward as if he'd given it the spur. He gained fast, and then the rear gunner was clearly in his reflector sight. Tobin thumbed his firing button and felt the Spitfire shudder. Rat-a-tat-tat. Tobin saw his tracers go far wide and tried to adjust, but in his excitement he pulled the stick too hard. Gravity punished him, G-force ramming him back into his harness, yanking at his jaw muscles. A gray curtain began to fall across his vision. Just in time, he righted the Spitfire and then swore at himself for being so clumsy. A few seconds later, he again had the German in his sight. Tobin thumbed the button. One. Two. Three. But again, he missed. Tobin glanced at his airspeed indicator, a few inches above his stick. He didn't want to overshoot the slower-moving ME-110. He eased back on the throttle, and again the bandit was in his crosshairs. Thumb to button. Finally, he had his man. Tobin saw the fuselage around the German pilot's cockpit fly away. He had killed for the first time. He knew it. He saw the plane fall away, out of control, down to his right. The pilot made no attempt to hit the silk. Bail out. Adrenaline coursing, Tobin took a deep breath and then remembered to scan the sky for enemy fighters. There were no more fighters on his tail. He checked his plane, wings first. He'd been hit. In some places they looked like a sieve. Light pinpricked through the fuselage only a few feet from him. Where did they come from? Tobin asked himself. Maybe his victim's rear gunner had got him. Or had the bullets come from a bandit he'd not even seen? Tobin looked around. No sign of Howell or Gaunt. Far above, the indigo haze was scarred with the tracers and smoke of dogfighting planes. Then a Messerschmitt 110 was spinning down, belching flames. Tobin saw the pilot crawl out and jump. A white silk parachute snapped open. A couple of seconds passed. Now the sky was strangely quiet and empty. Tobin realized he was all alone and therefore easy prey. He tried to work out his position, checking his compass a few inches in front of his left knee. The damned thing wasn't working. He reached down and pulled a creased map from one of his fur-lined boots. He kept two maps in each, just in case. Then he glanced at the fuel gauge to the lower right of his control panel. There were just twenty gallons left. Not enough to get back the middle wallop. Tobin quickly located the nearest airfield on his map. Twenty minutes later, he was on the ground watching his Spitfire being refueled. It wasn't long before he was back in the air and then beginning his approach to Middle Wallop. Smoke drifted lazily up to greet him. The base had been attacked in his absence. Unexploded bombs littered the runways. Several hangars had burnt to the ground. Then his wheels were down and he was taxiing towards the dispersal area, and his ground crew was jogging over to greet him, two of them carrying a tray of 2,000 fresh three o three bullets, eager to reload the Spitfire. Another airman sprinted over and then leapt up onto a wing. You all right, sir? Yes, I'm all right, but you better load them up fast. I've got a feeling the enemy will be coming back soon. Yes, sir. A gas tanker rumbled over the trampled grass towards the plane and started to fill up the Spitfire with one hundred octane fuel. Tobin watched his crew open up the wings and begin to replace the gun belts. His armorer shouted that he had fired just a few short of two thousand rounds, and holes were all over his plane. Tobin saw his fitter and rigger begin to examine the Spitfire, working out how best to repair it in double time. They may have hit something vital, one of them said. Afraid you'll have to take one of the spare machines today if you go up again. Tobin's ground crew took his plane to a hangar for repair. Next, they moved another one out for him to use if he was again scrambled. Tobin checked it over and then went to the dispersal hut to find out what had happened to the rest of 609. 
To his relief, a jubilant Howell and a grinning Gaunt were waiting for him. Howell had shot down a JU-88. In all, the squadron had claimed three bombers, one of them confirmed, Howell's JU-88, and another two as probables. Tobin sat down with 609's intelligence officer, Frank Ziegler, and made out his combat report. He was suddenly ravenous, but just as lunchtime neared, 609 was scrambled again. The patrol was uneventful, and by nightfall Tobin was headed for drinks in the Black Swan Pub, now dubbed the Mucky Duck by the Americans. Even though Tobin, Mamadoff, and Keo had all fired more than 2,000 rounds, none had made a confirmed kill. Nevertheless, there was reason to celebrate. They had survived the most intense, terrifying hour of their lives. Pilot officer David Crook later recalled that Tobin was surprisingly calm after his first combat. He never showed the slightest trace of excitement. Tobin had yet to master the art of the deflection shot, but he had learned one thing very fast, how to hide his fear and exhaustion. Back at Tangmere, 601's pilots were determined to avenge the attack on their home base, in whose defense Billy Fisk had been killed. On August 18th, late in the afternoon, the squadron was directed to intercept 80 or so dive bombers from St. G-77, which were heading to attack radar stations and airfields along the southern coast. Pilot officer Carl Davis, a South African born of American parents, was on superb form, taking down a Stuka and an escorting ME-109E. But that day's combat also saw the loss of two more 601 pilots, both sergeants, who had fallen prey to the German fighters. There were also unsustainable losses in several other frontline squadrons. Twenty-seven planes shot down, ten pilots killed, and eighteen badly wounded. In fact, 601 Squadron was now nearing the breaking point, having been in continuous action since the spring. The chain of reactions from scramble, takeoff, to pancake, landing, which were the fabric of the pilots' lives, was taking its toll of their ability to remain constantly alert and responsive to danger, recalled the squadron's official history. On August 19th, therefore, in exchange for Number 17 Squadron, 601 was withdrawn from the southern battle skies to Debden, just north of the inner ring of fighter stations around London. Here the fighter pilot's life, though active, was more peaceful than over Hell's Corner, but there was to be little respite for the badly battered unit. A few days after the exhausted pilots got to Debden, the Germans intensified their attacks on bases in Eleven Group, so 601 was once again in the thick of things, protecting other airfields farther south. Now began the hardest time for both sides, a battle of attrition above England that would soon be decided by simple numbers. The victor would be the air force that shot down more than it lost— at a similarly critical period at the Battle of Waterloo, the Duke of Wellington had urged the British to greater feats with the famous words, Hard pounding, gentlemen. Let us see who pounds the longest. By the last week of August 1940, both sides were pounding harder and harder. But it was the Luftwaffe who looked like they would pound the longest. More RAF pilots were being lost than could be replaced. In some squadrons, the veterans were too tired to be effective. With novice pilots now being lost at five times the rate of veterans, the strain felt by flight commanders and squadron leaders was immense, and no relief was in sight. Every one of them knew that they would have to fly on to the bitter end, which could not be far off. For 609 Squadron, the last week of August started with a visit from royalty in the form of the Duke of Kent, the Americans were very intrigued, recalled David Crook. Being good Republicans, they are always much impressed by royalty. Shorty said, Say, what do we call this guy? Duke? We hastily assured him that Sir would be sufficient. Anyway, the Duke arrived, shook hands with each of us, and spoke to us, and had a particularly long chat with Shorty, who was immensely gratified. In his diary that night, Tobin wrote, he seemed like a nice guy, but he looked mighty tired. We had one scramble at 25,000 feet over Portsmouth, but we didn't see anything. 
went to the Mucky Duck and had a good time drinking and listening to some Crosby records. The following morning, August 24th, promised another sultry day as 609 gathered in the dispersal hut. The mood was far from upbeat. As David Crook recalled, the pilots felt only intense disgust. The fine weather meant the Germans would again have the advantage of flying out of the sun. It was also Andy Mamadoff's 28th birthday. Tobin had decided not to give him a present, perhaps having lost to him at poker. 27-year-old Flight Lieutenant James Butch MacArthur, leading Mamadoff's flight, looked up into the sky. There were no clouds, not even a wisp of cirrus. It was impossible to get a sunny, warm day if one took leave, but it seemed that this was no problem at all during a battle when every fine day simply played into the hands of the German bombers. Without cover, the odds of fending off the Grim Reaper, as MacArthur put it, dropped dramatically. MacArthur was something of a swashbuckling character, with a thick mustache and slicked back hair, and the squadron's royal blue scarf always draped around his neck. He had held the record for the fastest flight from London to Baghdad in the 30s and had been a civil pilot before joining the RAF in 1936. Posted to Middle Wallop on August 1st as B flight commander, he had already taken down two JU-87s and several Messerschmitts, making him one of the squadron's deadliest aces. As the morning wore on, 609's pilots grew more anxious as they lounged in their deck chairs and tried to lose themselves in games of cards or a newspaper. It was around 1 p.m. across the channel when several young German pilots belonging to JG-53 gathered around and listened to the crisp commands of their squadron leader, 29-year-old Hans Karl Mayer, one of the leading aces of the battle with 15 white stripes on his ME-109's tail fin. For the last week, the Ace of Spades had not seen much action, mostly because of adverse weather. There had been plenty of time to catch up on much-needed sleep, write letters home, and gorge on lobster and oysters in Mayer's favorite seafood restaurant in Rennes. Hans Karl Mayer had learned how to fight in the air from none other than Werner Molders. Like his mentor, he had served in the Condor Legion in Spain, gaining vital experience. A fellow JG-53 pilot, Werner Karl, recalled that Mayer was so tall that he used to cram himself in his cockpit and when on missions used twice as much oxygen as the rest of us. Karl had fought before with Mayer and respected him for his humanity and the example he set of chivalry in combat. He had recently seen Mayer shoot down an RAF fighter. The British pilot had bailed out, to Mayer's delight, but then Carl had seen the pilot fall and an orange glow getting bigger and bigger. The parachute was on fire and soon collapsed, and the British pilot fell to his death. On landing, I told Captain Mayer what he had not seen. He was genuinely upset. Today's mission would be a big one. JG-53 would be part of a huge escort of 300 German fighters, protecting 50 bombers bound for Portsmouth. They would fly to the airfield at Cherbourg East and refuel, so the fighters would be able to fly at their maximum range, before meeting up with the bombers over the channel. The British were certain to pick up the raid as it crossed the channel, so Mayer's pilots were more than likely to be engaged by several squadrons of Spitfires. It was crucial that they maintained their height above the bombers. Mayer would choose when to attack. The very moment they started to get thirsty, low on fuel, they were to turn around and head for home. The briefing over, several pilots joined a long line waiting to use the latrine. Others swigged back the brandy in their emergency pouches and holstered pistols in case they ditched and could stand the cold of the channel no more. There was just time for a last cigarette, and then Mayer led his men to their Messerschmitts, It was 1.30 p.m. as Mayer and his men then took off from their base in Rennes and headed towards Cherbourg East to refuel. At Cherbourg East, Mayer again gathered his flight, his so-called dog pack around him. He assigned two pilots the role of lookout pair. Then he asked his men to synchronize their watches. Twenty-two-year-old Josef Broker made certain he was in time with his leader. He was about to go on his first operational sortie with the Ace of Spades' highest-scoring squadron, which he had joined just over a week ago. 
Moreover, he was to fly as Mayer's wingman. Mayer would expect him to stay with him at all times, watching for Tommy's, protecting his tail. In all, eighty-one Messerschmitts from the three groups of JG-53 now stood, their engines idling in neat rows on Cherbourg East's airfield. Sun-tanned and shirtless, the ground crew crawled over the planes, starting batteries, cleaning canopies, making sure the fuel tanks were full to the last drop and their warning lights were working. The aces of spades went to their planes. Props whirred and dust flew as the German pilots climbed into their cockpits. The ground crew pulled away chocks, shielding their eyes from the blasts of dirt, clothes flapping in the prop wash, and covered their ears as the growl of 81 Daimler-Benz engines became a roar. Hans Karl Mayer checked his instruments and then signaled that he was ready. A member of JG-53's ground staff pointed a flare pistol towards the sky. Hans Karl Mayer released his brakes and pushed a yellow knob to the left of his control stick. His engine responded and he began to move forward. We're off, Mayer called to his men. All the best. A green flare exploded, signaling takeoff, and then one after another, JG-53's flights took to the skies. Back at Middle Wallop, 609's pilots still basked in the sunshine. Andy Mamadoff's wristwatch showed 4.10 p.m., in 609's dispersal hut, the telephone shrilled. A couple of minutes later, the squadron was airborne and heading towards Portsmouth under orders to patrol above the city at 10,000 feet. Other squadrons would be doing the same, but at a far greater height. We were the luckless ones, sent low down to deal with any possible dive bombers, recalled David Crook. We hated this. It's a much more comforting and reassuring feeling to be on top of everything than right underneath. Eugene Tobin flew behind Frank Howell and Jeff Gaunt again, about a thousand feet above Andy Mamadoff's flight. Both Tobin and Mamadoff were now at the rear of their sections, nervously performing their role as tail-end Charlies. Mamadoff's job was more difficult because he was flying the oldest plane in the squadron, which had been with 609 since a few days before the outbreak of war. Soon, Tobin could see that Mamadoff was having trouble keeping up with the rest of his flight as it climbed above an intense barrage from anti-aircraft guns below. To one of the pilots, the barrage looked like a large number of dirty cottonwool puffs in the sky. Every gun anywhere near the port of Portsmouth appeared to have opened up. Mamadoff could see tiny frigates and cruisers crowding Portsmouth's docks below, also blasting away. He looked up and to his shock saw a formation of 46 JU-88s, escorted by well over 300 ME-109Es and ME-110s, several thousand feet above him. Bombs began to rain down. Mamadoff watched as they exploded, fire and clouds of debris spreading steadily across the city, nowhere near military targets. By sundown, 104 people would be killed, 237 injured, and 700 rendered homeless in the worst raid yet on a British city. It was now around 4.40 p.m. Squadron leader Hans Karl Mayer scanned the skies, squeezed into his cockpit with barely enough room to move his legs. He was well over six feet and around 230 pounds. Then he checked that his wingman, Josef Broker, was in position, protecting his tail. Five thousand feet below, Mamadoff continued to weave behind his flight. We were flying at two thousand three hundred feet and going into the sun, he recalled. I was told to investigate a plane below and behind us, and I flew off, but found it was one of our own. I tried to rejoin the squadron, but I had lost them. Hans Karl Mayer spotted Mamadoff and pushed his stick forward and opened the throttle. Broker followed him down out of the indigo haze. Then Mayer was on Mamadoff's tail, thumbing the firing button on his control stick, letting rip with twenty rounds of twenty-millimeter cannon and one hundred forty rounds of machine gun fire, watching as Mamadoff's plane disappeared in a shower of tracer puffs, explosives, and pieces of fuselage. There was just one burst, but it was enough, recalled Mamadoff. Eight bullets went through the prop, twenty through the fuselage, and one through the armor plating. 
I tried some violent evasive tactics and pulled out at 8,000 feet. My plane wasn't too good after that, as you can imagine, but I flew it all right. An utter professional, Mayer did not hang around to see what had happened to Mamadov. Instead, he turned back, concerned about Broker and the rest of his squadron, and led them safely to their base in Rennes, where he would incorrectly claim his sixteenth victim. Meanwhile, Mamadov struggled back to Middle Wallop. With great skill, he somehow managed to land despite intense pain and extensive damage to his Spitfire. His rigor, Flight Sergeant Titch Cloves, was soon running over to him. Mamadoff looked badly shaken and complained of a bad backache. According to Cloves, a 20mm shell had entered the tail of the aircraft, gone straight up the fuselage, through the wireless set, just pierced the rear armor plating, and presumably dented the pilot's uniform. Fifty percent of the starboard elevator had been ripped away and the wings and fuselage peppered by Mayer's 7.92-millimeter machine gun bullets. The plane was a write-off. Thankfully, Mamadoff was the only pilot hurt in 609's first tango with JG-53. He never saw Mayer following him, and Mayer put a lot of bullets into Andy's machine, remembered David Crook. He was very lucky to get away with it. In the Mucky Duck pub in the nearby village of Monkston later that evening, Tobin commiserated with a badly bruised Andy Mamadoff. For a week after, he looked like the hunchback of Notre Dame, he later wrote. It was Andy's birthday, so we drank to the present he'd received from the Krupp factory. As 609 slept soundly that night, several frightened pilots from KG-1 were making a break for Germany in their Henkels, hoping British night fighters had not been scrambled to give pursuit. The pilots had attempted to bomb the Thameshaven oil terminal on the far eastern outskirts of London, but they had fouled up, and their bombs had landed wide, hitting densely populated streets in the working-class East End and ruining the church of St. Giles in Cripplegate. It was a momentous mistake. Soon, Goering would be asking for the pilot's scalps. Hitler had explicitly stated that London itself was not to be bombed. The following morning of August 25th, the British War Cabinet agreed to send a reprisal raid to Berlin. It was an abject failure, with the only damage inflicted on a summer house in a suburban garden. The Germans responded by hitting at the outskirts of London the following night. For the first time, air raid sirens sounded throughout the city. At Downing Street, Winston Churchill, wearing a dressing gown emblazoned with golden lions, paced back and forth, growing angrier with the distant thud of each explosion. The next morning, he sent a note to the chief of the air staff. Now that they have begun to molest the capital, I want you to hit them hard, and Berlin is the place to hit them. The RAF's next visit to Berlin killed just eight people, a minuscule toll in human lives when contrasted with the firestorms that would eventually engulf cities such as Hamburg and Dresden. But the raid's psychological effect was enormous. Berliners were stunned. Goering had vowed that the city would never be hit, and naively they had believed him. Suddenly, they felt vulnerable. Hitler was no less surprised and returned from the Berghof to the Chancellery in Berlin as soon as he was informed about the raid. The following day, he lifted his restriction on terror bombing of London. The Luftwaffe's next targets would be millions of defenseless civilians. Chapter 11 Achtung! Spitfeuer! If you are on fire, do not open the hood until the last moment, as it will draw flames into the cockpit. If your clothes are soaked in petrol, switch off the engine switches and leave the throttle open. Otherwise, as you get out, sparks from the exhaust may act like the flint in your cigarette lighter. Air Ministry Instructions to Pilots on Bailing Out, 1940 Among Eugene Tobin's fellow pilots, there had been a lot of belly aching of late, Life at Warmwell, 609's advance base, was awful. The accommodations were so pitiful that Tobin and others had opted to sleep under dirty blankets in the dispersal tent, a long walk from running water and toilets. A road ran close to the tent, and most of the pilots now relieved themselves there rather than be caught short in the officer's mess. 
One risked either prosecution for indecent exposure, recalled squadron leader Darley, or returning too late for a scramble. The station commander had been less than helpful. When Darley had asked him to improve 609's living arrangements, he had responded by locking the officer's mess except at assigned mealtimes, hoping this would encourage 609's pilots to arrive on time for supper. All our efforts to get the Luftwaffe to respect mealtimes having failed, deadlock occurred, recalled Darley. To make matters worse, the civilian cooks had then gone on strike, refusing to get up at 3 a.m. to prepare breakfast. That morning, some of the ground crew had used a Primus stove at the dispersal tent and done a first-class job with the bacon and eggs. Later on, another airman had gone over to the cookhouse to scrounge a cup of tea and to his amazement had found a mountain of eggs, tea, sugar, tins of Nestle's milk, and packets of Kellogg's cornflakes waiting for him. It had taken three trips in pilot officer Johnny Dogs Dundas's flashy Lagonda to cart the booty over to the dispersal tent. Several airmen working in the cookhouse had pooled their rations to show that they thought 609's pilots were bloody marvelous, even if the civilian cooks did not. Rumor had it they'd also procured barrels of beer. It was now late afternoon on August 25th, and once again Eugene Tobin had had nothing to do all day except bask in the sunshine and crack jokes about Andy Mamadoff's bruised back. With any luck, the damn station commander would call through in a couple of hours and order 609 to stand down. Then Tobin could retire to the pub for a pint with the chaps. It was too much to hope for. Suddenly, 609 Squadron was scrambled. Tobin was soon seated nervously in his baking cockpit, as if trapped in a sauna, waiting for Squadron Leader Darley to open his throttle and taxi across the sunburnt grass. Finally, RAF ground crews pulled away the chocks. Darley's Spitfire shuddered for an instant and then sped across the airfield. Tobin and the rest of 609's pilots followed in sections of three. Patrol channel at 25,000 feet, announced the middle wallop operator. The squadron climbed fast, throttles wide open, knowing every angel, thousand feet, gained, could be invaluable. Tobin looked out of his cockpit as they reached the assigned height above the English Channel. Below, a convoy showed as minute specks in the middle of a stretch of grey separating southern England from the French coast. Such convoys usually attracted plenty of German attention. Heading towards Tobin were around 350 bandits, some intent on destroying RAF Warmwell, 609's advance base. They included Hans Karl Mayer's JG-53, more than a hundred of Goering's much-vaunted ME-110s, and thirty-five bomb-laden JU-88s. Mayer was once more with young Josef Broker as his wingman. After the previous afternoon's nerve-jangling combat, Broker was glad to be at his squadron leader's side. The sound of the burly, paternal Mayer snapping instructions over his radio set calmed his nerves. Flying with the huge formation of twin-engine ME-110s were ZG-2's Lieutenant Westfall and his rear gunner, Corporal Brief. In recent weeks, their unit's morale had plunged as the RAF had ripped them apart. Now, every time they left their base in Guillencourt, they knew the odds of returning were less than 50-50. The heavy ME-110 was simply no match for the more maneuverable Spitfires and Hurricanes— Pulling an ME-110 around in a tight turn, Westfall knew only too well, took enormous strength. The controls went infuriatingly stiff at relatively low levels of G-force. Meanwhile, Eugene Tobin was doing a fine job of weaving behind his section as it climbed higher and higher above the Solent. He looked at his clock, 15,000 feet, high enough for him to be breathing oxygen. He reached to turn on his supply, but nothing happened. There was no head-clearing whiff, just a grogginess that grew as he flew to twenty-five thousand feet. If he dropped back behind Darley, he could soon find himself unable to catch up and flying alone. Darley had drummed into his head that sticking together was paramount. Stragglers never lasted long. What should he do? Fly on and perhaps black out with altitude sickness, or break off and risk being bounced by some Messerschmitt prowling several thousand feet above, its better-designed prop biting the even thinner air with ease. Tobin now felt lightheaded. 
Thankfully, he heard Darley order 609 to drop down to 19,000 feet. The loss of altitude cleared his head a little, but he was still too high. He had better ask Darley if he could break for home. Breathing the thin air at that altitude wasn't very pleasant, he recalled, but it didn't bother me for long. More than fifty ME-110s of ZG-2 emerged from clouds two miles away. Thank God 609 was higher. Darley ordered 609 to form up line astern. Then came the call to attack. The squadron dived. Break left, screamed a German rear gunner, Corporal Walter Wotzel, as he opened fire. Wotzel's pilot, Staff Sergeant Siegfried Becker, reacted, but not quickly enough. A split second later, 609 pilots Jeffrey Gaunt and Noel Agazarian snapped off the first of several quick bursts, riddling the German's plane. The port engine caught fire. The other jammed. Then Becker and Wotzel were bailing out. Tobin and squadron leader Darley picked out another bandit, the ME-110 of ZG-2's Lieutenant Westfall and his rear gunner, Corporal Brief. In a few seconds, Tobin and Darley were on their tail, the ME-110's 56-foot wingspan soon appearing in the orange glow of their reflector sights. Tobin opened fire, aiming just ahead of the ME-110's nose. The stream of tracers raked his fuselage, recalled Tobin, the plane climbed almost vertically as though Westfall was trying to loop. For an instant it seemed to remain motionless, pointing to the sun. Then it fell off to the right and disappeared. Tobin did not follow the stricken bandit down. There were too many planes in the air, and if I started down, it would leave me wide open to a tail attack, he explained. It's always nice to know whether you've scored a bullseye. But you're worth more alive than dead. Tobin had indeed scored a bullseye. He and Darley had killed Lieutenant Vestfall and his rear gunner, Corporal Brief. A few seconds later, the German's plane crashed and exploded at Winfrith, East Chaldon, near RAF Warmwell. Tobin broke away, following Darley, and then looked around. Fighter Command had scrambled 87, 213, and 152 squadrons, and they were now attacking from all directions, tearing into the ME-110s and firing tracers into the dark gray bombers below. Then Darley was dipping his wing again. Tobin did the same and was soon diving through the swarms of ME-110s and towards the real prizes, the heavily laden JU-88s trying to obliterate 609's forward base at Warmwell. High above, Hans Karl Mayer watched as Tobin and others tried to break up the bomber fleet. Everyone attack, ordered Mayer. It was around 5.25 p.m. as Mayer dropped like a hawk onto the tail of a hurricane and let rip with his cannon and 7.9 millimeter machine guns. Orido! The hurricane exploded in flames and Mayer saw its pilot bail out, apparently unharmed, the sky was now a chaos of diving fighters and panicked Ju-88 bombers, breaking formation, turning tail, and diving low, throttles open, their crews praying they would make it home. Mayer's radio crackled. It was his wingman, 22-year-old Josef Broker. Achtung! There were bandits above and behind. Mayer took evasive action. A few seconds later, his radio hissed to life again. I've been hit, cried Broker. I've been hit. Broker was spinning as he called out, burning planes falling past him, and then there were glimpses of water and suddenly green fields surging towards him. Bail out or crash land, Mayer replied calmly. Then the radio went dead. Busy watching Mayer's tail, Broker had not seen a hurricane from 152 Squadron behind him. By the time he realized that he was being followed, the hurricane had opened fire, hitting his engine and causing him to stall. Rapidly, like circling sharks, other hurricanes had then attacked as Broker had lost control and gone into a violent spin. Around 3,000 feet above England, Broker pulled on his stick. It responded. Somehow, he eased out of the spin. But his engine had gone dead. He had no choice but to glide down and crash land. At 5.30 p.m., he did so in a field a few miles north of Weymouth.
Above, 609's David Crook circled and watched Broker coolly get out of his stricken plane, pull out a box of matches, soak his scarf in gasoline, light it, and fling it into his fuel tank. The plane exploded, burning Broker on the face and hands. He staggered away and collapsed not far from the roaring fighter, its ace of spades insignia consumed by the blaze. Meanwhile, 609 fought on in the skies above, all across the white-capped Solent from Weymouth to the Isle of Wight. Eugene Tobin was one of several who dived on yet more bandits. At around 19,000 feet, he fired at a twin-engine ME-110. The German's left motor stopped, and he started down in a series of crazy turns and spins, recalled Tobin. This time I followed, to give him another burst and finish him off. His airspeed topping 400 miles per hour, Tobin chased the German in a tight turn. Then, suddenly, everything went blank and his Spitfire began to spin down. He had blacked out from lack of oxygen and too much G-force. Above, the other 609 pilots watched, sickened, as Tobin plunged towards the channel, slumped forward in his harness, dreaming while unconscious. Everything seemed fine, yet something seemed to say, You are in an airplane and you are fighting, recalled Tobin. You'd better come, too. There may be someone on your tail. A few seconds later, Tobin opened his eyes and saw that, by some miracle, he was flying straight and level at just over a thousand feet. He took a firm hold of his stick, gulping air, and quickly checked his controls. Close below were the cold gray waves of the English Channel. Far above, Hans Karl Mayer and the fighters from the Ace of Spades fought on. Most of my squadron was engaged in combat with the Hurricanes, recalled Mayer. Suddenly, I saw a hurricane diving on the last JU-88 of the formation. I followed him. The hurricane opened fire at long range. Simultaneously, I fired also at long range, and the enemy aircraft broke away downwards. I followed the hurricane in the dive and closed to fifty meters. I fired, and the hurricane went up in flames, the pilot bailing out at five hundred meters. Meanwhile, a shaken red Tobin had flown back towards Middle Wallop. The other pilots in 609 were overjoyed to see him. They had assumed the worst after seeing him fall towards the channel. I was sure you'd been hit, the way you broke off and went spinning down, one of them said. I knew you hadn't bailed out, so I watched you as long as I could. The last I saw, you were still spinning and awfully close to the water. Squadron leader Darley was just as relieved to learn that Tobin had survived after they had combined so well to down one of Goering's ME-110s. I blacked out colder than a clam, Tobin told him. Darley had just returned from the dispersal hut, where he had placed a call to RAF Warmwell. Thanks in part to 609 Squadron, only seven JU-88s had managed to drop their loads on the base, damaging a couple of hangars and cutting telephone lines, but failing to knock it out of action. I could not resist the temptation to ring up the station commander, Darley recalled, and say that I did not expect any thanks for saving the hangars, personnel, and planes, not to mention the officers' mess and kitchen. On the other side of the English Channel, around 6.10 p.m., Hans Karl Mayer landed back in Cherbourg, delighted that he could add another two white stripes to his tail fin, and others in his squadron could add another five. That night, the lobster and oysters in Rennes must have tasted particularly good. The only sour note was the sacrifice of Mayer's wingman, Broker, on his second mission. He would be lost to a POW camp for almost seven years because he had been too busy watching Mayer's backside to see Tommy shooting at his. Back in England, 609 also lifted many a glass to their good fortune and happy hunting. Tobin had brought over a whole suitcase full of jazz records, recalled a fellow pilot. We played them on a battered hotel phonograph. No matter what their nationality, everybody enjoyed the music. The favorite was Roll Out the Barrel. The two poles in 609 could not understand the lyrics, but would hum along. In the space of twenty-four hours, both Tobin and Mamadov had cheated death. Others had not been so lucky. Eight RAF pilots had been killed or wounded that day alone. Tobin's flight commander, Frank Howell, had only recently commented, 
Our luck can't last at this pace. Now the Joker from California knew he was right. Indeed, flying the sweetest ship he had ever seen was no longer a million laughs. Later that night, before turning in, Tobin scribbled in his diary, Today at 6 p.m. I had my first combat, and I probably shot down two Messerschmitt 110s, but I don't know for sure because I did not actually see them go in. I dove after one from 19,000 feet and blacked out and had a funny dream. I came to at 1,000 feet over Burnmouth, doing better than 500 miles per hour, and it was all I could do to keep the plane under control. It was one of the scariest days I have ever had in my life, but I learned plenty about combat. Berlin was again the target. On the night of August 28th, Bomber Command hit civilian areas in the vicinity of the Gerlitzer rail station. The following morning, Hitler ordered yet more reprisals. He also sent an urgent message to the commander-in-chief of his air force, Hermann Goering. It was brutally simple. Either the Luftwaffe destroyed the RAF in the first weeks of September, or the invasion of Britain would have to be postponed until the spring of 1941. The stakes were now set for the climax of the greatest air battle in history. At Middle Wallet, meanwhile, the end of August was duly noted by 609's diarist, Johnny Dogs Dundas. The squadron was becoming cosmopolitan, he wrote in his final entry for the month. One might think that this heterogeneity would interfere with teamwork or morale, but this was not so. Under squadron leader Darley's quietly firm and competent leadership, the squadron gained steadily in skill and confidence, and remained a veritable band of brothers. The twenty-one brothers included three Americans, two Poles, and a Dominion pilot. As the squadron's official history records, between 8th and 18th August alone, the Phase II period during which Fighter Command destroyed 367 enemy aircraft at a cost of 154 of its own pilots killed, missing, or severely wounded, this band had been credited with 34 confirmed victories plus 10 probables for the loss of a single pilot. It was the best performance of any squadron, and because of it, 609 bubbled with enthusiasm and radiated confidence. Whenever in the future the squadron went into action, recalled David Crook, I think the only question in everybody's mind was not, shall we get any Huns today, but rather, how many shall we get today? There was never any doubt about it. Nor was there any doubt, as that summer waned, that 609 had been extraordinarily fortunate. For the rest of Fighter Command, that August had been a bloody, enervating month, the deadliest in its history. The endless round of fear, anxiety, heart-stopping excitement, and primal elation, followed by loss or relief, was gnawing at every pilot, no matter how experienced. Several aces now tucked their feet under their rudder bars to stop their knees knocking. You drag yourself into the air more exhausted each morning, recalled one pilot, and you came back at nightfall too keyed up to rest. Long after you landed there was a roaring in your ears, so you shouted and drank with your pals in the mess or at the local pub. At last you got back to your little room and crawled between the soft white sheets, and you found you couldn't sleep because of the sudden silence, so you just lay there alone in the darkness, and it was then your nerves began to totten and twitch inside their casing of beaten, numbed flesh. It was then that you were forced to listen to your thoughts, to take a tally. Every day now, somebody you knew got the chop. Secretly, so secretly that you kept it from yourself most of the time, you'd face the fact that your turn was bound to come soon. There was a noose around your neck. It was a question of time. You were just a number that would be wiped from the slate tomorrow. Or the day after tomorrow. Lord Beaverbrook's Ministry of Air Supply was churning out more and more planes, but Churchill's fear now was that they would stand idle for lack of pilots to fly them. The loss of experienced leaders in the air was even more worrying. There remained no more than a dozen squadron leaders who had been with their units since the battle began, and they had to fight, inspire, and try to teach replacement pilots, such as the Americans, how to stay alive. 
It was a Herculean challenge, given that the training period for new pilots had recently been slashed from a month to just two weeks. Teenagers were being sent up with just a few hours in a hurricane or a spitfire, unable to work their reflector sights, told they would receive their final polish at their new squadrons. All too often, it was the Luftwaffe who polished them off instead. One mess steward recalled that pilots died before he had even had a chance to change their sheets. Middle Wallop's 609 squadron had indeed had a very good month. Elsewhere in fighter command, it was now common for ground crews to find pilots slumped in their cockpits, asleep, only a few moments after their planes had taxied to a halt. After eight scrambles in a day, you came to write up your logbook, one pilot recalled, and you couldn't remember beyond putting down the number of times you'd been up. I had nightmares about blazing planes crashing all around me. One airman remembered how boys came back men after an eighty-minute sortie. Faces would be gray. There'd be yellow froth round their mouths. Alcohol had become the universal anodyne. Teetotalers such as Art Donahue, still recovering from his burns, were few and far between. According to one pilot, people in squadrons who used to go to bed early and not go out and chase a few pints were far more likely to buy it than people who were a little on the wild side. In many squadrons, the race to the pub at Stand Down was as earnest as any sprint during a scramble. No matter how many losses or how hard the day's combat had been, getting to the local pub before closing time at 10.30, only an hour after sundown, was a must for many pilots. At the square club in Andover, where Tobin and the other 609 pilots sometimes drank, the cocktails were now so strong that pilots would be plastered after just one round. Sometimes, pilots would stay in London's West End all night, getting back to their dispersal huts around 4 a.m. and napping in deck chairs, flying jackets draped over their beer-stained uniforms until a greasy breakfast of bacon, eggs, and baked beans arrived just before dawn. A few strong whiffs of oxygen and gut-wrenching fear were remarkably effective cures for even the heaviest hangover. By contrast, other pilots now lived on such taut nerves that they could no longer tolerate even a half-pint, vomiting several times before every sortie. On the German side, the strain was just as great, perhaps more so. Pilots were not rotated and remained in combat until they were either promoted or became casualties. Twenty-four-year-old Captain Helmut Wick, the young star of JG-2 fast closing on Mulder's and Galan's scores, now survived on English cigarettes and black coffee, unable to keep solids down. As long as I can shoot down the enemy, he declared, adding to the honor of JG Richthofen and the success of the Fatherland, I am a happy man. I want to fight and die fighting, taking with me as many of the enemy as possible. Some German bomber crews were so drained that they were starting to turn back at the first sight of Spitfires, dropping their deadly loads into the channel. In one Junkers 88 outfit, 25% of air crews had mysteriously reported sick. Forced to escort these lumbering targets, much to their bitter frustration, even the Jagdwaffe's highest scoring units, such as Galan's JG-26 and Werner Mulder's JG-51, were starting to crack. Only foul weather was their friend, calling a time-out in a daily grind of often five sorties before sundown. You could count on your fingers when your turn would come, recalled Adolf Galland. The logic of the theory of probabilities showed us incontestably that one's number was up after a certain amount of sorties. For some it was sooner, for some later. Protected by his two loyal wingmen, Galand hoped it would be the latter. Superstition reigned all along the Normandy coast, from Mulder's base at Guine to the heavily camouflaged dispersal areas at Adolf Galand's base in Cafier, where every morning now, it seemed, there was an empty chair at the breakfast table and extra hot rolls and coffee for the weary survivors. Some German pilots even refused to have their photograph taken, remembering that Baron von Richthofen in World War I had died only minutes after he'd been snapped. 
Among Mulder's former comrades in JG-53, it now seemed that their fate was to be attacked, no matter how low they flew to avoid being detected by radar. It often happens that some of us came home with bent propeller tips after having touched the water, recalled Eric Bodendick of JG-53. Red lamp, screamed others in their nightmares, echoing the cry of many a Luftwaffe pilot halfway across the channel when his fuel gauge suddenly showed that his tank was almost empty. Red lamp! On both sides of the channel, pilots knew they were in a desperate battle of attrition. From their inner resources, all but a very few found the will to keep flying, scramble after scramble, attack after attack. From his hospital bed, one badly wounded RAF pilot wrote to his parents late that summer, I go forth into battle, light of heart. I regard it as a privilege to fight for all those things that make life worth living, freedom, honor, and fair play. Flying has meant the companionship of men, the intoxication of speed, the rush of air and pulsating beat of the motor awakened some answering chord deep down, which is indescribable. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, more and more Americans were following the battle, aware that their own future would perhaps be decided by its outcome. Given unprecedented access to RAF operations by Churchill's propaganda chiefs, CBS's Ed Murrow and Collier's Quentin Reynolds were thrilling millions of readers and huge radio audiences with vivid reports on mass dogfights above the White Cliffs of Dover. Meanwhile, German propagandists in Washington spread stories that the RAF's claims of downed planes were vastly overstated, giving the false impression that Britain was not yet on the ropes. But these faded fast from the public consciousness thanks to the cinematic prose of eyewitnesses such as Ben Robertson from the New York Daily PM. In Robertson's eyes, all Americans should know about a new frontier— the skies above Britain, where the future was being decided by the RAF's knights of the air, soaring and diving with breathtaking elegance, like the white birds you see in far-off parts of the Pacific Ocean, like the white birds you see off Pitcairn. In Britain, every newspaper had adopted 609 and the RAF's other fighter boys as the men of the hour, the potential saviors of England and of far more, according to some editorial writers who echoed Churchill's rhetoric about civilization itself being on the line. Pilots seldom had to buy a drink in pubs. Young women, humming the hit of the summer, a nightingale sang in Berkeley Square, flocked around them in nightclubs in Mayfair's Shepherd's Market, a popular stomping ground for off-duty pilots. With the popular press splashing each day's score across front pages as if the battle was a celestial cricket match, the boys in blue batting for England became enormously attractive. Losing one's virginity in the back row of some Piccadilly cinema, shrouded by blue cigarette smoke, was almost as easy as losing one's life. Art Donahue, fast recovering from his burns, wrote his folks in St. Charles, Minnesota, My uniform has become the key to the best hospitality everywhere. These people almost worship the Royal Air Force pilots. Conductors on buses, policemen in the streets, just fall over themselves to help me find my way about. A number of times I've had just ordinary people say to me, Words can't express how we feel toward you boys. You're wonderful. You're the greatest heroes we've ever had. They meant every word. As never before, the British people felt intensely alive and proud. Memories of that late summer of 1940 would never wane. Rebecca West, one of the period's finest reporters, would write, Under the unstained heaven of that perfect summer, Curiously starred with the silver elephantines of the balloon barrage, the people sat on their seats among the roses in London's Regent's Park, their faces white. Some of them walked among the rose beds with a special earnestness, looking down on the bright flowers and inhaling the scent, as if to say, that is what roses are like, that is how they smell. We must remember that, down in the darkness. Most of these people believed that they were presently to be subjected to a form of attack more horrible than had ever been directed against the common man. They were right. 
On September 3rd, Goering and his deputies, Field Marshals Albert Kesselring and Hugo Spurl, met to discuss how best to finish off the British. Spurl was all for continuing the offensive against the RAF's bases and communications. Fighter Command was now almost on its knees. In fact, all but one of eleven Group's sector airfields had been badly hit. Several operations rooms had been put out of action, and although Goering had ordered a halt to the bombing of radar stations, arguing that they had little effect, such strikes had caused considerable chaos. Kesselring was far from convinced. We have no chance, he countered, of destroying the British fighters on the ground. We must force their last reserve of spitfires and hurricanes into combat in the air. Only by luring the RAF's remaining pilots into the crosshairs of Galand, Mulders, and their like could the battle be won. If Goering sent huge bomber fleets to flatten London, argued Kesselring, the British pilots would have no option but to defend their capital in large numbers, thereby exposing themselves to the Luftwaffe's best. Much to Spurl's frustration, Goering agreed with Kesselring. And so the date for the first mass attack on the city was set. Saturday, September 7th. The change in strategy would be codenamed Target Switch. For the second time in 25 years, 85 Squadron's Peter Townsend would later write, the Germans were out to subdue the British with their own Teutonic invention, murder from the sky. The following day, September 4th, Adolf Hitler made it chillingly clear what he now had in store for the buffoon Churchill and his deluded people. But first, before a vast audience in Berlin's sports stadium of mostly female nurses and social workers, Hitler addressed the question everyone was asking, when would Germany invade England? The British are just as anxious to find out, Hitler quipped. They keep asking... When is he coming? Don't worry, Hitler shouted. He's coming. He's coming. They should not be so curious. Laughter filled the stadium that had hosted the 1936 Olympic Games. Hitler then got down to business. The RAF's night bombing of Berlin, Churchill's new invention, would not go unavenged. We are answering night for night, and in growing strength, we will eradicate their cities. Again the women of Berlin were on their feet, the stadium thundering now with applause. The hour will come when one of us will go under, Hitler concluded, and it will not be National Socialist Germany. Again the women leapt from their seats. Never, they screamed. Never! In the meantime, Fighter Command continued to absorb blow after blow. On Saturday, August 31st, it had suffered its worst losses of the battle to date. Thirty-nine fighters shot down and fourteen pilots killed. Now, as Goering and his deputies conspired to obliterate London, some squadrons were shot to pieces. In nine days or less, 603 Squadron lost 12 pilots and 16 Spitfires, 616 lost five pilots, and 253 lost nine pilots. The RAF was being bled dry with precious few reserves to fill ever more empty cockpits. By September 6th, a fifth of the RAF's active duty fighter pilots had become casualties. 103 pilots killed and 128 severely wounded. At Tangmere, 601 Squadron was also fast running out of luck. On September 4th, Carl Davis took down his 10th bandit, an ME-110 from ZG-76's 2 Group, over Worthing. The next day, the squadron learned it would be withdrawn from the battle in 48 hours. It was also scrambled and soon found itself pitted against 50 Messerschmitt 109s. In the ensuing dogfight, two 601 pilots were badly wounded but managed to bail out of stricken planes. A further three pilots only just nursed their hurricanes home. It was the worst battering the squadron had yet taken. The following day, September 6th, 601 again scrambled to intercept a large group of German bombers. Before it could do so, a far superior force of ME-109s bounced the millionaires over Tunbridge Wells. 
In less than a minute, four hurricanes were falling to the earth, belching smoke and flames. Two pilots managed to bail out. But Willie Rhodes Morehouse and his fellow ace, Carl Davis, went down with their planes, dying within a few miles and a few seconds of each other when they slammed into the ground at more than 500 miles per hour. Rhodes Morehouse, Billy Fisk's former flight commander, and Davis had both won the DFC and were the last of the squadron's stalwarts, having joined the millionaires well before the war. In the ensuing obituaries, it was noted that Willie Rhodes Morehouse's father had won the first Victoria Cross in the air during the First World War. The loss of Davis and Rhodes Morehouse was a crushing blow to a squadron whose morale had been continually eroded since Billy Fisk's death. The death of one experienced pilot was a bigger loss to a squadron in those days than ten Spitfires or Hurricanes, because however many fighters we lost or damaged, replacements always turned up immediately, recalled a fellow ace. But experienced pilots could never be replaced. You could only train the new ones as best you could, keep them out of trouble as much as possible in the air, and hope they would live long enough to gain some experience. Sometimes they did. Yet again, 601's intelligence officer, Tom Waterlow, was sent out to find deceased comrades. A joyful and dedicated man, he loved most aspects of his work, but not when it entailed rushing around the countryside looking at crashed aircraft and identifying my friends by the numbers on their machine guns. The next day, a badly mauled 601 squadron was pulled from the front line and sent to Exeter. None of Billy Fisk's old skiing friends remained. The millionaires were no more. The last days of summer were, by contrast, rather a bore for 609 Squadron. No bombings today, no dogfights, Tobin complained in his diary. We just sat on our ass and told dirty jokes. Assigned to factory and airfield protection patrols, the squadron was scrambled many times but did not encounter the enemy, and on the one day when a nearby factory was heavily bombed, it was ordered to patrol elsewhere. It seemed that the luck of the Irish was still with red-haired Tobin, his fellow Yanks, and their English mates. Miraculously, they still held the Grim Reaper at bay. Chapter 12 the Blitz. Within fifty feet of a large bomb, its wind blast will tear a man to pieces and will shatter a solid brick wall. Further away, the blast will deafen people by bursting their eardrums and may kill them by paralyzing their lungs. A Practical Guide for the Householder and Air Raid Warden, 1940. For the first time since joining 609 Squadron, pilot officers Eugene Tobin and Shorty Keogh were enjoying a break from the war, sauntering around London, buying souvenirs, getting tickets for a matinee in the West End. It was Saturday, September 7, 1940. Early that morning, unknown to the Americans, the Air Ministry had issued its first invasion alert, attack imminent. The Germans were coming. Across the English Channel, Hermann Goering sat in his personal train, Asia, relaxing after being injected by a Luftwaffe flunky, Herr Dr. Ondarsa, who now joined Goering's ever-present needlewoman, Christa Gormans, in keeping him smiling. Dressed in a new, pale blue uniform, he toyed with his gold baton as Asia pulled into a siding near the Pas du Calais, from where he planned to watch his bombers pass over on their way to Pound London. Goering had come up with a suitably Wagnerian code name for the day's attack. Loge, the god of fire. Goering stepped out of Asia to be greeted by a sycophantic Kesselring and lackeys carrying picnic baskets and crates of champagne. Before the big show began, Goering inspected a group of LG-2 pilots, bantered with them, recalling some of his own exploits as a First World War ace, and then tried to climb into the cockpit of an ME-109 conveniently parked nearby. Fatty Goering, as every Luftwaffe pilot already called him, had put on a hundred pounds since the Great War and failed to fit into the Messerschmitt's cockpit. 
Shrugging off his embarrassment, Goering grabbed a couple of bottles of the finest champagne and was soon settled down above the cliffs of the Pas du Calais beside a picnic basket to watch the progress of Loge through his binoculars. The white cliffs of Dover, just twenty-three miles away, were clearly visible in the bright afternoon sunlight. From airfields across Normandy arose the largest air armada in history. It had only one objective, to carry out an enormous reprisal attack against the British. And today, the navigators had only one route to mark on their maps. Nash, London. It was 3.54 p.m. when a young WAF at Fighter Command's headquarters placed a counter indicating that many bandits were airborne. By 4 p.m., Goering was squinting into the sky, watching fleets comprised of 348 bombers escorted by 617 fighters lumber towards their target. His chest swelled as the countless bombers droned overhead. He had told some aides that today, finally, the battle would be won. It was 4.30 p.m. at Middle Wallop when 609 was scrambled. Andy Mamadoff's flight commander, Butch MacArthur, recalled what happened next. Whilst on patrol at 10,000 feet between Brooklands and Windsor, we saw about 200 enemy aircraft surrounded by anti-aircraft fire. We climbed towards them, and I led the squadron into a quarter attack. 609 faced daunting odds, being outnumbered at least 10 to 1. 25-year-old Flying Officer Keith Ogilvie, a Canadian who had joined 609 on August 20th, recalled that there were so many 109s in the air that day that they seemed to be zooming and dancing round us like masses of ping-pong balls. Meanwhile, Eugene Tobin and Shorty were seated in a posh hotel in London's West End, the Regent Palace, chatting with Colonel Charles Sweeney. After sharing their stories of escape from France, the American flyers and Sweeney got around to the dough angle, as Tobin put it. When would they receive the money owed them from their time in France? Sweeney promised he would sort things out and get back to them within days. Across town, at an anti-aircraft installation in the East End, a searchlight operator, Lieutenant Alan Rook, was suddenly disturbed by his commanding officer. My God, they've started! Rook ran out of his office and looked up into the clear skies. It was a wonderful summer's day, he recalled. Coming up the river in close order was the biggest fleet of aeroplanes I have ever seen. White against the blue sky, like cherry blossoms seen from below, in level rows of squadrons, hundreds strong, filling the air with a throbbing roar. They came very slowly, following the river towards London. It was around 5 p.m. when Eugene Tobin, Shorty Keogh, and millions of Londoners heard the sound of sirens. Then bombs began to whistle down. The blitz had begun. There would be no respite for almost three months. Within minutes, the sun looked as if it was setting in the east, a violent red tinge spreading across London's docklands. Watching from St. Paul's Cathedral, the Reverend William Matthews heard a frightened worshipper mutter, it's the end of the world. It's the end of a world, said another. It certainly felt that way in Poplar, at the heart of the Luftwaffe's target zone, where 18-year-old Len Jones was pulled and pushed by the suction and compression from the high explosive blasts. You could actually feel your eyeballs being sucked out. I was holding my eyes to try and stop them from going. I thought, well, I must be dead. So I struck a match and tried to burn my finger. I kept doing this to see if I was alive. Back at Cap Grenet, Hermann Goering's wife was on the line. Yes, it has been a wonderful day, Emmy, said the Reich Marshal. I've sent my bombers to London. London's in flames. Twenty-five thousand feet above the city, JG-26's Adolf Galland gazed down in awe as the flames leapt into the evening sky. According to his biographer, he felt a pang of horror at the thought that such punishment could ever be meted out to a German city. Above the chalk cliffs of Cap Grenet, Goering could no longer control himself. The sight of his bombers crowding the skies had gone to his head. Suddenly, the pink-booted Luftwaffe chief grabbed the microphone of a radio reporter standing nearby. I have heard the roar of victorious German squadrons, Goering told his fellow Germans, 
which have for the first time struck the enemy right to the heart. Now the River Thames itself was on fire. Far above, the middle-aged pilot of Hurricane OK-1 looked down on a vast column of smoke rising towards him and sighed with relief. Now London is taking it, thought Sector 11's Air Vice Marshal Keith Park. We shall be saved. The Germans had switched targets, and not a moment too soon. Had they continued to attack Park's airfields, the fighter defense of London would have been in a perilous state. Now his Sector 11 might be able to recover from the previous week's hard pounding and repair its ravaged communications. Indeed, the Luftwaffe's new focus on the capital, then the largest city in the world, was bad news for the people of London, but offered a much-needed respite for fighter command. Park hoped there would now be time to train more pilots, refresh others, and bring new planes into the front line. And while doing so, Park knew he would enjoy a critical advantage— Thanks to radar, he could more easily pinpoint the enemy flocks of bombers because his observers would know where they were all headed. Towards London. Below, the fires raged on and on, soon spreading for a continuous nine miles across the East End, designated Sector A by the Luftwaffe. Not since the Great Fire of London in 1666 had an inferno so engulfed the city, People coming out of a performance of Faust at Sadler's Wells looked into the sky and saw a real hell reddening the sky to east. Later that evening, when the all-clear sirens had sounded, Tobin and Shorty returned to Middle Wallop. The officer's mess was strangely quiet. All of 609, including Andy Mamadoff, had gone to a cocktail party organized by the British actor Gordon Harker to raise money for the Spitfire Fund, which helped the families of killed and wounded pilots. The fundraiser was no idle gesture. That day, 19 more RAF pilots had been killed. Over a late-night meal of ham and eggs, as stragglers from the party returned to Middle Wallop, Tobin learned that 609 had had a very good day. Our squadron got 10 confirmed and 10 probable. Damn good. No loss to ourselves, Tobin noted in his diary. But 234 lost its CO. That's bad. In fact, 609 had claimed two DO-17s, three ME-110s, and one ME-109 destroyed, and five others damaged. Eleven of the squadron's twelve pilots in the air that day had fired on the enemy, with MacArthur, Howell, and the squadron's sole sergeant pilot, Alan Ferry, inflicting particularly heavy damage. The next day... September 8th, 609 was ordered with all other 11 group squadrons to concentrate its energies on the defense of the capital. Once more, it would fly into the eye of the storm, now centered over London. That morning, Winston Churchill toured the bombed-out areas of the East End where just hours before, 430 Londoners had lost their lives. The bombing had continued through the night. Churchill was seated in the back of his staff car beside his brother Jack and Lord Ismay, his chief of staff. The car moved slowly, avoiding still smoldering ruins and rubble, and then stopped at an air raid shelter that had been hit. When Churchill learned that forty people had been killed, he could contain his emotions no more and began to cry. As he got out of the car, he was quickly surrounded by a crowd of onlookers. It was good of you to come, Winnie. We thought you'd come. We can take it. Give it them back. The tears did not stop. You see, said an old woman, he really cares. He's crying. Churchill moved on, through smoke, past children whose homes and parents were gone forever and whose lips twitched with the trauma. To one teenage bystander he looked invincible, tough, bulldogged, piercing. Despite the devastation, Londoners were trying to get to work, to carry on as if as normal, bonded as never before by rage and dread. Churchill's aides tried to get him to return to the car. Sirens sounded. Churchill would not be budged. Good old Winston. Give him socks. Churchill cried out in his deep baritone, Are we downhearted? No! As he finally returned to his car, Churchill turned to Ismay. Did you hear them? he said. 
They cheered me as if I'd given them victory, instead of getting their houses bombed to bits. That night, the Luftwaffe returned, and by dawn the next day, another 412 Londoners would be dead, only a hundred less than the total for RAF fighter pilot losses during the entire Battle of Britain. By September 11th, more than a thousand civilians had perished. That day, Churchill made a radio broadcast which was heard by an estimated 70% of the nation as it gathered silently around radio sets in factories, pubs, and bomb-damaged homes. The next week may be one of the most important in British history. It ranks with the days when the Spanish Armada was approaching the Channel and Drake was finishing his game of bowls, or when Nelson stood between us and Napoleon's Grand Army at Bologna. We have read all about this in the history books. But what is happening now is on a far greater scale and of far more consequence to the life of the world and its civilization than these brave old days of past. These cruel, wanton, indiscriminate bombings of London are, of course, a part of Hitler's invasion plans. He hopes, by killing large numbers of civilians and women and children, that he will terrorize and cow the people of this mighty imperiled city and make them a burden and anxiety to the government and thus distract our attention unduly from the ferocious onslaught he is preparing. Little does he know the spirit of the British nation or the tough fiber of Londoners who have been bred to value freedom far above their lives. This wicked man, the repository and embodiment of many forms of soul-destroying hatreds, this monstrous product of former wrongs and shame, has now resolved to try to break our famous island race by a process of indiscriminate slaughter and destruction. What he has done is to kindle a fire in British hearts, here and all over the world, which will glow long after the traces of the conflagration he has caused in London have been removed. He has lighted a fire which will burn with a steady and consuming flame until the last vestiges of Nazi tyranny have been burnt out of Europe, and until the old world and the new can join hands to rebuild the temples of man's freedom and man's honor upon foundations which will not soon or easily be overthrown. Among those profoundly moved by Churchill's defiant words was Eugene Tobin, now determined to kick the living hell out of the German bombers. Today will be a day that will go down in history, he noted in his diary after hearing Churchill's speech. Churchill gave a speech. He summoned everybody to do his part. Every night the Germans drop their damn bombs anywhere and run like cowards. There have been many casualties, mostly harmless civilians, but everybody is going on just as though nothing happened. We are bombing the Germans much more, though. I wonder who will hold out the longest. Chapter 13 Their Finest Hour you catch him right smack in the middle of your sights and give him a complete burst. The Brownings go to work, and brother, when they are working, they're not kidding. Eight guns, fourteen hundred rounds per minute. Figure it out for yourself. Eugene Tobin, 609 Squadron. Air crews stretched away their fatigue and hooked starter batteries to 609 Squadron's Spitfires, standing silhouetted in the dawn light near the bungalow that doubled as the dispersal hut. A few hundred yards away, Eugene Tobin lay in deep slumber in his quarters. I say, old boy, better wake up. Pilot Officer Johnny Dogs Dundas was trying to shake Tobin awake. I say, old boy, you really must pull yourself together. Tobin opened his eyes. Dundas yawned, still dressed in his bathrobe. What's the idea, said Tobin groggily. Why do I have to get up at this ungodly hour? I'm not sure, old boy, but they say there's an invasion on or something. Tobin leapt out of bed. We didn't know then that September 15th, 1940 was going to go down as the biggest day in the history of the Royal Air Force, Tobin recalled and that never before had so many planes filled the sky in aerial combat, that more than 500 planes would be zooming and diving in the fighting over London. 
Tobin dressed quickly and then sprinted out to the airfield. For the next two hours, he and his fellow 609 pilots flew above London, seeing familiar landmarks and still smoldering fires below, but no action. Meanwhile, Air Vice Marshal Keith Park was seated opposite his wife, Dahl, at the breakfast table in their home, a stone's throw from his office, the so-called Bunker, Fighter Command's Sector 11 Operations Control Room. It was not a good start to the day. Dahl said something about it being her birthday. Park had forgotten. He apologized. Dahl understood. He had been rather busy recently. Never mind. A good bag of German aircraft would be an excellent present, she told him. By mid-morning, 609 Squadron had returned to Middle Wallop. Pilots now lay on the grass or slouched in deck chairs. Eugene Tobin dozed, trying to make up for just twenty minutes' sleep the previous night. Yesterday had been stormy, with heavy thunder and cloud cover. But this Sunday morning, when Tobin should have been at Mass, the skies were an ominous blue. It was fifty-seven degrees, warm enough to roll up shirt sleeves. A thin film of mist hung above the airfield, but the sun would soon burn it off. At Checkers, Winston Churchill also noted the weather and decided to pay Air Vice Marshal Park a visit. He was soon speeding towards Uxbridge, west of London, with his armed bodyguard, his private secretary John Martin, and his wife Clementine. The car's police bell clanged. It was around 9.30 a.m. at cormet en vaccin the home base of Dornier Bomber Unit KG-76. Glum-looking air crews streamed out of debriefing rooms. Watching them leave was a 38-year-old Bavarian, Alois Lindmeier, leader of the KG-76's Three Group, a cool-headed veteran of devastating raids on RAF Kenley and Biggin Hill. He had just briefed his men on that day's mission. The news that KG-76 was to have the great honor of leading the Luftwaffe across the channel had not been received with stamping feet and applause. Earlier that morning, Field Marshal Kesselring had ordered Lindmeier to fly at the spearhead of the greatest strike force ever sent against a civilian target, more than 1,120 German aircraft. Although Lindmeier had few experienced pilots at hand, having lost 11 bombers out of 30 in the last fortnight, he had been able to cobble together the required number of planes by combining the remnants of his three group with one group, an even more heavily battered unit. Lindmeier's men were soon clamoring aboard their Dornier 17 bombers. Among them were Sergeant Rolf Heitsch and his crew of three. Each man had a pistol strapped to his belt. If he found himself trapped in his burning plane, unable to bail out, he could put the Mauser to his temple and pull the trigger. The Dornier was nicknamed the Flying Pencil by RAF pilots, for whom its long, slim body was easy prey. With no armor plating, underpowered, and capable of carrying at most 2,200 pounds of bombs, it was also called a flying coffin by some former crews now in British POW camps and French hospitals. It had started life, like so many of the Luftwaffe's medium-range bombers, disguised as a mail carrier back in 1934, when every German aircraft was supposed to have a non-military function. By now, it was clearly obsolete, and yet one out of every four bombers sent over Britain was a Dornier. The only two strengths Heitch and his fellow pilots found in the lumbering albatross were its reliability and capacity to absorb large quantities of Tommy lead. Radio operator Technical Sergeant Stephen Schmidt made his way to the rear of the plane. He had been chosen to operate a top-secret weapon when KG-76 inevitably clashed with the hurricanes and spitfires that now flocked to greet the fleet whenever it neared the English coastline. The new device was, in fact, a flamethrower that had been borrowed from the Wehrmacht and fitted to the rear fuselage. If it worked, it would be fitted to other bombers. Heitch ran through his checks, and then the plane's two 1,000-horsepower, nine-cylinder Bramo 323P air-cooled engines roared to life. With his left hand, Heitch opened the throttles and the Dornier sprang forward, its wings rocking as it picked up speed on the uneven airfield. At 10.10 a.m., Heitch felt the Dornier leave the ground and set course for Cap Grenet. It was not an auspicious beginning to the mission.
Because of heavy cloud cover, ten minutes were lost trying to link up with one group. Back in England, it was around 10.30 a.m. when Keith Park learned that the Prime Minister was about to arrive at the bunker. Fighter Command's Sector 11 Operations Control Room. Sure enough, Churchill and his party soon filed in. Park greeted them and once again had to explain diplomatically that the Prime Minister could not smoke inside the bunker. Churchill grunted and then bit down on his unlit Cuban. I don't know whether anything will happen at ISA, said Park. At present, all is quiet. Churchill and his party took their seats in the gallery above a plotting table and several wafts. Around 11 a.m., over the chalk cliffs of Cap Grinet, Technical Sergeant Heitch breathed a little easier. He spotted his escorts above. ME 109s from Hans Karl Mayer's Ace of Spades and several squadrons from JG 3, who would stick as close as possible to the Dorniers. It was 11.04 a.m. in the bunker at Uxbridge. Radar reports indicated that KG-76 and its escorts were stacking up over Bologna and Calais. Then a young waff put down her knitting and walked calmly over to the plotting table and placed a wooden block on it. The block indicated that at least 30 bandits were heading towards England. A few minutes later, two more blocks were on the plotting table. There appear to be many aircraft coming in, said Churchill. Park looked calm. There'll be someone there to meet them. More blocks appeared on the plotting table. Northolt, Kenley, Debden, Park called out. Bulbs on panels covering a wall opposite the gallery began to light up, indicating each squadron's status. At readiness, scrambled, or engaged. More blocks appeared on the table. There was now a palpable sense of crisis in the sixty-foot square room, fifty feet below ground. At 11.20 a.m., Park ordered the rest of his squadrons into the air and told Ten Group to alert Middle Wallop. A few minutes later, 609 Squadron was scrambled. Eugene Tobin tucked maps into his boots and followed several other pilots out of the dispersal hut at Middle Wallop. Shorty Keogh did the same, two cushions under his arm, and was soon being helped up onto the wing of his Spitfire by his ground crew. Andy Mamadoff climbed into his cockpit and was quickly strapped into his safety harness. At 11.30 a.m., 609 reached 20,000 feet, the best performance altitude for the Spitfire. Tobin checked that his oxygen supply was working. London was below, terraced housing stretching far into the distance, skirting the Thames. Barrage balloons hung like giant grey sausages over the charred east end. Climb to 25,000 and maintain patrol. Back at the Uxbridge bunker, Winston Churchill looked with mounting concern at the wall of bulbs facing him. All but a few of the bulbs now glowed, indicating that most of fighter command was in the air or intercepting the enemy. It was around midday when the Dorniers of KG-76, led by Alois Lindmeyer, began a flak waltz, zigzagging to avoid anti-aircraft fire as they crossed over the southern outskirts of London. In a few minutes, they would begin their bombing runs. Then the flak stopped and hurricanes and spitfires began to attack. At the rear of the Dornier formation were Rolf Heitsch and his crew, in his headset, Heitch suddenly heard the excited voice of Stephen Schmidt, who was manning the flamethrower. A hurricane was fast closing in on them from astern. At four hundred yards, its pilot let rip. Bullets tore into the Dornier. Schmidt grabbed the flamethrower and sent a giant squirt of burning gasoline towards the hurricane. The jet of flame fell far short, but Schmidt succeeded in spraying some unlit oil over the British fighter's windscreen, forcing its pilot to push its nose down, duck below the Dornier, and pull away. Rolf Heitsch flew on, now straggling dangerously behind the rest of KG-76. Meanwhile, 20,000 feet above central London, pilot officer Andy Mamadoff looked around and up, watching for bandits. Once again, he was weaving back and forth, the RSN Charlie to 609's B flight led by Butch MacArthur, who had been in a particularly gloomy mood of late and so depressed a week back that he could not eat. As Butch saw it, 609 and the rest of Fighter Command had failed miserably to protect the people of London from the Grim Reaper on September 7th. Maybe today, 609 would have some success 
in keeping him at bay. Eugene Tobin was, as usual, weaving behind Johnny Dogs Dundas and his A-flight leader, Frank Howell. "'Many, many bandits at four o'clock!' shouted Dundas. Tobin looked up and saw more than fifty 109s from Hans Karl Mayer's JG-53, around 4,000 feet above. "'Okay, Charlie, come on in,' Howell called to Tobin. Tobin glanced over his shoulder. Three bandits were diving towards them. "'Danger, Red Section!' shouted Tobin. "'Danger! Danger! Danger!' Howell heard him and broke fast to the right. Tobin began a 360-degree turn, immediately feeling the G-force. He lifted his feet to the G-stirrups and pressed down. The blood returned to his head as he spotted 609's pilot officer Jeffrey Gaunt climbing to his left, followed by a furious Messerschmitt. Then Tobin was turning tighter and tighter, pulling the stick as far over as he dared without blacking out, holding the Spitfire in its life-saving arc. The cockpit controls shook with the strain, and his face contorted as he struggled to stay conscious. Tobin yanked his emergency boost. The engine howled, and he was kicked back in his seat. A Messerschmitt flashed past at more than 400 miles per hour. Then he was easing out of the turn, head spinning as he searched the sky for bandits. And there they were. More ME-109 Messerschmitts. Tobin set out after one of them. A black cross was soon in his crosshairs. He fired. Smoke streamed from the German's motor. But before he could fire again, the German disappeared in cloud cover. Tobin broke to his left and began to climb, opening the throttle, weaving back and forth violently behind Howell and Dundas at around 275 miles per hour, not caring now whether he or his Spitfire could take the strain. He had no time for pretty tricks. The main thing was to get where you could shoot, and then get where they couldn't shoot at you. A neat barrel roll looks nice from the ground, and so does a wreath. Tobin suddenly saw a 609 Spitfire and felt sick. The plane was around 200 yards away, out of control, cockpit ablaze. It began to spin down trailing black smoke. Then Tobin spotted Technical Sergeant Rolf Heitch's Dornier diving towards clouds. Again, he pushed his Spitfire to its limit. She responded beautifully, like a thoroughbred in peak form. He was still a long way off, but decided to fire because he lost the ugly gray bandit to the clouds. His tracers streaked through the sky and, to his delight, struck the bomber's left engine. Heitch looked out of his cockpit and saw his left propeller stop spinning. He knew the cloud cover would not last for long. Even if he could escape Tobin, could he then nurse the stricken bomber back across the dreaded channel, or should he try to land? Now white smoke was billowing from his other engine. Tobin had hit the glycol tank or a radiator. Then 609's Johnny Dogs Dundas suddenly appeared as if from nowhere. He had climbed almost vertically below the bomber and also let rip. More pieces flew off Heitch's plane. Then both Tobin and Dundas were pressing the tit, sending streams of bright tracers and incendiary bullets through the sky. Stephen Schmidt, Manning, the flamethrower, was hit badly in the chest. He dropped the flamethrower and slumped to the floor. Heitch somehow flew on. He had trained as a doctor before the war and knew that to stand a chance of saving Schmidt from bleeding to death, he would need to land as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Tobin was lining up for the kill. I moved the ship over a bit so that his left wing was right in the bullseye and sawed off his aileron, he recalled. Part of the wing fluttered off and he disappeared into the cloud. A few seconds later, he reappeared. Any moment now, it would surely be all over, but seeing that Heitch's plane was critically damaged, Tobin and Dundas chose not to press on with their attack. Heitch came down after a while, recalled Tobin, just from sheer weight of lead, but we didn't knock him apart. Heitch spotted a field near the village of Shoreham and told his surviving crew to brace themselves for a forced landing. With great skill, he brought the stricken bomber down, narrowly avoiding power lines. The Dornier crashed wheels up with an awful screech of metal and breaking propellers and skidded to a sudden halt, just missing several cows. Heitch threw off his harness, stood up, and struggled furiously to open an escape hatch. A few hundred feet above, Tobin circled the crash site. He opened his cockpit and slid back the hood. 
He could see Heitch and another of his crew climbing out of the Dornier, carefully pulling the badly wounded Schmidt after them. Tobin waved his handkerchief, signaling to a growing group of hop pickers to stay back from the German plane. A mile away, a spitfire and a hurricane were down in the same field, he recalled. But the white billowy folds of two parachutes nearby showed that their pilots were safe. Crashed planes were a dime a dozen. Wherever you looked between London and the coast, there were cracked-up airplanes. White Tracer flashed past Tobin. He yanked his stick back and climbed. Then he realized that the Tracer had been meant not for him, but for another Spitfire, dueling with an ME-109 2,000 feet above him. It was quite a show, remembered Tobin. Once in a while, the German would loose off with the two cannons in his wings, and they would blink like a couple of rabbit's eyes. Cute as can be until one of the shells screams past your cowling. Then you move out of the way fast, just as I did. By the time I climbed above the two fighting planes, the Spitfire had sent the German down in a long, sickening spin, and the air was clear of enemy planes. Tobin was suddenly alone. He checked his fuel gauge. Just seven gallons left. It was around 12.20 p.m. After refueling at Biggin Hill, he flew back towards Middle Wallop. The airfield soon appeared below and he began his approach, but then a truck suddenly emerged from behind a hangar into his landing path. It was too late to climb. Tobin heard one of his wheels skim the vehicle and jolt back into the fuselage. Now I couldn't even make a belly landing, which is the safest thing to do if your landing gear goes haywire. I circled the field a couple of times and then came in to land on the one wheel with the other wing up. It was a pretty tricky business, but my luck held. As the wheel touched the ground, the ship wobbled for an instant, and then I felt the other wheel flop down from the impact. I eased the stick, and she settled down nicely. Elated, Tobin taxied towards the dispersal hut. A few minutes later, he was jumping down to the oil-stained grass and heading towards an animated group of his fellow pilots. But then one of his ground crew came over with bad news. His plane needed to be serviced, and there was no other available, which meant he was effectively grounded for the rest of the day. Bitterly frustrated, Tobin joined his fellow pilots for lunch. They were particularly pleased that, unlike on September 7th, Fighter Command had scrambled them early enough and had then sent them high enough to avoid being bounced. Before long, 609's intelligence officer was examining Tobin's combat report. He was given a share with Dundas of the stricken Dornier. Though I had the satisfaction of knowing that the 109 was a pretty good probable, recalled Tobin, I could not claim credit as I hadn't actually seen it crash. Back in Shoreham, Kent, the local home guard was soon on the scene and arresting the crew of Tobin's down Dornier. Technical Sergeant Souter had been badly wounded in the ankle and was taken to Maidstone Hospital. Technical Sergeants Rolf Heitsch and Pfeiffer, the bomber's observer, were taken to the nearest pub. Someone bought the two trembling German airmen a couple of brandies to calm their nerves. Then they were driven to Seven Oaks Police Station. Their other comrade, Technical Sergeant Stephen Schmidt, did not go with them. He was pronounced dead on arrival at Seven Oaks Hospital, his chest torn apart. According to one subsequent news report, the hospital also admitted a hop picker with a bullet wound in the leg. Allegedly, one of two circling Spitfires— Either Dundas or Tobin had opened fire on the grounded bomber and hit the man in the leg. Meanwhile, Heitch's fellow KG-76 pilots struggled back across the unforgiving channel. Just fifteen of Alois Lindmeyer's Dorniers were still in formation. Ten were missing. It was a pitiful sight. The flying pencils limping across the dark waters, full of dead and wounded, cockpits holed and smeared with blood, engines coughing, props flailing, gashed fuselages letting in gushes of freezing salty air, white glycol smoke trailing several as if they were signaling surrender. Many of the surviving pilots were resentful and angry. Had Goering not claimed that the RAF had just fifty Spitfires left? that it would take just a few days in early September to finish the Lords off? The chilling truth was that the Lords were stronger than ever and better organized, attacking from higher than before out of the sun. The change of targets from airfields to London had been a disastrous mistake, allowing them time to recover. They had been out for the count, 
Now they were surely ahead on points. Alois Lindmeyer had only to glance out his cockpit to see how they had won this round. Very soon, another round would begin. Kesselring had gathered an even greater force for an afternoon attack on the capital. One hundred fifty bombers escorted by three times as many fighters. Once again, the bombers would simply be bait to draw up park squadrons so that the Luftwaffe could then tear them apart, thereby dealing fighter command the death blow, or so Goering hoped. Among the flocks of Messerschmitts would be two of the most lethal Jagdwaffe units, JG-54 and JG-26, led by an increasingly ill-tempered Adolf Galland. Just a few days ago, Galland had been forced to stand between his two greatest rivals, Mulders and Helmut Vick, and listen as Goering had yet again upbraided him over his Jagdwaffe's lack of aggression. The bombers are more important than a fighter pilot's record of kills, Goering had complained. Your job is to protect them, and each time you fall down on it. Galland had defended his men, but Goering had dismissively ignored him. Then Goering had asked what the group commanders needed. Werner Mulders had said he would like as many ME-109E4N planes as possible. Their new engines would allow JG-51 to outperform the Spitfire. Goering had begun to walk away when he had suddenly turned around and looked at Galland. And you? Galland had looked straight into Goering's bright blue eyes. I'd like some Spitfires. Goering had sighed, his cheeks reddening with anger, and walked off. It was now early afternoon on September 15th as Galland made his way towards his Messerschmitt at Caffier, black Havana clenched between his lips, wrapping a yellow scarf around his neck. Yet again he was suffering from throat ache. He knew that Werner Mulders would also be flying later this afternoon, also looking to add another stripe to the thirty-seven carefully painted onto his tail fin. Galland was now just five kills behind. But at the rate Mulders was taking down planes, it wouldn't take long for him to hit forty, and then he, not Galland, would be off to have tea with the Führer at the Chancellery. His beaming, bony face splashed across the front pages. The oak leaves, added to his knight's cross, clear for everyone to see. At 1.45 p.m., back in the bunker in Uxbridge, a young waff placed a marker on the plotting table. Several more soon followed. From the gallery, Winston Churchill again watched intently as Park once more marshaled his forces, scrambling several squadrons. Gambling that the Germans were all headed towards London, just as on September 7th, Park decided not to intercept until Kesselring's armada had reached its most vulnerable position, the big turn over London. By then, the German pilots would be getting nervous, glancing at their fuel gauges, able to fight for only a few minutes at the limit of the Messerschmitt ME-109's range. Luck was on Park's side. The German bombers were forced to circle over Maidstone because they missed their rendezvous with their escorts. From Maidstone, it was sixty miles to London, a heart-pounding journey now dubbed the race course by many a rattled German pilot. That afternoon, it took the bombers and their escorts thirty very long minutes, more than enough time for Park to direct his forces towards them. It was 2.15 p.m. when the first two squadrons intercepted. Mitre and Gannick squadrons, tally-ho, tally-ho! Twenty-seven British fighters dived out of the sun into Kesselring's armada of four hundred fifty planes. Achtung, Spitfeuer! Churchill's few had the sun and height on their side, and some had learned how to fight like Galan's hunting packs. A screaming dive, with the target in sights and guns blazing, and then break away in a flash. Minute by minute, more RAF squadrons followed. Soon the bright blue sky was scarred by tracer bursts and the oily smoke of burning planes. At Middle Wallop, the telephone rang. Within seconds, pilots were grabbing their flying gear. Eugene Tobin watched in frustration as Shorty Keo grabbed his two cushions and then sprinted with Andy Mamadoff and the rest of 609 towards Spitfires waiting close by, their engines warm. Meanwhile, 
Goering's bombers lumbered on. But not for long. Over the East End, thirteen more RAF squadrons pounced on them, ripping several to shreds in seconds as pilots literally lined up to wait their turn to open fire. The formations finally broke up, and the German pilots then turned tail, dropping their loads over leafy suburbs, and began the desperate journey back to France. One in four would not make it home. High over London, meanwhile, JG-26's Adolf Galland was on the hunt once again. He had only a few minutes of fuel left before he would have to turn back for France. Suddenly, he spotted 310 Hurricane Squadron, tightly bunched below, cockpits glinting in the sun. I dove from about 2,500 feet above them, approached at high speed, recalled Galland, and fired at the far-left aircraft in the rear flight, continuing fire until point-blank range. Finally, large pieces of metal flew off the hurricane. As I shot past this aircraft, I found myself in the middle of the enemy squadron, which was flying in stepped formation. I immediately attacked the right-hand aircraft of the leading flight of three. Again, metal panels broke off. The aircraft nosed over and dove earthward, ablaze. The remaining English pilots were so startled that none as much as attempted to get on my tail. Rather, the entire formation scattered and dove away. Two parachutes appeared about sixteen hundred feet below our formation. In just ten seconds, Adolf Galland had added another two stripes to his tail fin. Now, if Mulders had not scored, he was only three behind. At this rate, with a little luck, he could make up the difference in just a few days. Never one to linger after a kill, Galan then dived away from the melee, ordering his squadron to follow him back to Caffier before their red lights started to flicker. There was no need to remind them of what might happen if they dawdled for even a minute. Not long back, JG-26 had lost twelve planes on one sortie alone when their fuel ran out. It was now 2.35 p.m. in the bunker in Uxbridge. Winston Churchill noticed that Park was standing stock still, unusually tense. The reason became clear when Churchill looked at the wall of bulbs. Every one was glowing red, indicating that all of Fighter Command was now engaged. What other reserves have we? Churchill asked. Park turned around. We have none. Churchill looked grave, and for good reason. The odds were great, he recalled. Our margins small, the stakes infinite. But for 609 at least, the odds were for once very much on their side. To intercept the fleeing bombers, squadron leader Darley had led both A and B flights away from London to the southeast. Suddenly, as 609 neared the coast, two battered formations of Dorniers were spotted. The bombers were a long way off and diving at maximum speed, hoping to get as low as possible and then skim unnoticed across the choppy waves back to France. Andy Mamadoff scoured the skies. Only a few German fighters were flying escort. Then he heard Darley order 609 to give chase. Throttle is open, the wing-riding squadron gladly obliged, soon fixing onto two stragglers. Shorty was seated on his two pillows, flying as wingman to Green Section's leader, pilot officer Michael Appleby, one of 609's pre-war weekend flyers. Green Section, number one attack! Go! shouted Appleby. Shorty latched onto a Dornier from KG-2. I followed Green 1, Appleby, into attack on the Dornier, he reported, and attacked from quarter and then astern. Satisfied that the bomber was done for, Keo broke away and dived through the clouds. Emerging from them, he could not find Green Section and decided to return to Middle Wallop. The Dornier pilot somehow kept his plane in the air and turned back for England, where he crash-landed ten minutes later in a field at 18-pounder farm, near the historic town of Hastings, at 3.15 p.m. Hastings had been the scene of Britain's last defeat at the hands of an invader almost a thousand years before, in 1066. Meanwhile, Andy Mamadoff and several other 609 pilots tore chunks out of the other straggler like a pack of ravenous wolves.
Everybody in B-Flight was absolutely determined to have a squirt at the Hun, recalled 609's David Crook. And as a result, there was a mad scramble in which people cut across in front of each other and fired wildly, regardless of the fact that the air was full of spitfires. Mamadov's flight leader, Frank Howell, saw two German crew members throw packets of marker dye into the channel and then bail out. Mamadov and another pilot had finished off the plane with the concentrated fire of their sixteen machine guns. They actually sawed one of the Dornier's wings off before she crashed. Andy was particularly pleased about this because it meant that for a change he was giving something instead of taking it. His back was still sore from the cannon shell. The Canadian Keith Ogilvie had earlier that day shot a Henkel in half, the tail end landing near a pub in Pimlico in London, to the great comfort and joy of the patrons. Now he followed one of the Dornier's crew as he drifted down in his parachute to the waters below. The Germans splashed down and waved wildly, Ogilvie later reported, figuring I was going to machine gun him. Ogilvie did not. Instead, Johnny, Dogs, Dundas, and Frank Howell took different bearings with their compasses to enable the German to be rescued. It was now 3.25 p.m. in Park's bunker at Uxbridge. The bulbs on the wall facing Churchill began to change. Some now indicated that squadrons had landed and were refueling. One bulb showed that 213 at Tangmir, Billy Fisk's old base, was ready to be scrambled again. There was a reserve once more. The crisis had passed. Park and Churchill were visibly relieved. I am very glad, sir, you have seen this, Park told Churchill. Of course, during the last twenty minutes we were so choked with information that we couldn't handle it. This shows you the limitation of our present resources. They have been strained far beyond their limits today. Churchill and his party thanked Park and left the bunker, bound once more at high speed for checkers, where Churchill was soon taking an afternoon nap. But it was not over yet. At Middle Wallop, 609 was scrambled yet again at around 5.40 p.m. It was Vernon Keogh's fourth sprint to his Spitfire that day. They joined six other squadrons above Southampton, but neither Fighter Command nor the Luftwaffe had any luck. Thirteen ME-110s, skimming above the channel, missed their target, and Keogh and 609 were sent too high to intercept. Finally, September 15, 1940, drew to a close. At Middle Wallop, the shadows cast by 609 Spitfires stretched long across the grass. Dusk settled, and then, at eight o'clock, darkness. The cue for the pilots to be released at last and head to the officer's mess for a bite to eat. At Checkers, Churchill woke from his nap. John Martin, his private secretary, had allowed him to sleep through the afternoon, knowing how emotionally drained he had been by the bunker experience. Now Martin quickly brought Churchill up to date on the day's developments. This had gone wrong here, recalled Churchill. That had been delayed there. An unsatisfactory answer had been received from so-and-so. There had been bad sinkings in the Atlantic. Martin paused. However, he then said, all is redeemed by the air. We have shot down 183 for the loss of under 40. It was the best news Churchill had received all year. Across the channel, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring picked up the telephone in his headquarters and put a call through to the Reich Marshal aboard the sumptuous Asia. Goering was not in the mood for bad news, having been served sedatives by his nurse, Christa Gormans. "'We cannot keep it up like this,' said Kesselring. "'We are falling below the standard of safety.' The Luftwaffe was, in fact, bleeding to death, having now lost so many bombers that if Goering kept throwing them at fighter command in daylight attacks, there would soon be none left. Kesselring's two attacks that day had failed spectacularly— Fighter Command had not been wiped out. Instead, Park had brilliantly stripped away the bomber's protection and then decimated the best of the Luftwaffe's bomber force. As the sirens began to wail in London, signaling the onset of yet another night of air raids, the presses on Fleet Street began to roll. Within 24 hours, the RAF's thrilling success on September 15th would be front-page news throughout the free world.
In America, newspapers and radio would repeat the RAF's inflated claim of 183 downed German planes, prompting an outpouring of support and sympathy across the nation for the plucky British. A full-page advertisement in the New York Times would even call for immediate union with Britain, the first round in the propaganda campaign aimed at drawing America into the war had been won. For 609 Squadron, the night was still young. There was time to sink several pints before closing time at the Mucky Duck pub in nearby Monkston. The squadron had shot down seven confirmed and five probables, which isn't bad for a couple of hours' work, recalled Tobin. My friend Jeff Gaunt was the only one not there to share in the victory. The pilots of 609 drank long and hard. On the surface, Tobin was his old red self, joking about taking down yellow-nosed boys and tapping his wings with a grin and then saying ruefully, I guess these are a one-way ticket, pal. But inside, he was full of concern. Gaunt was not at the brass rail with him, not asking about the film stars he knew, not creasing up at his wisecracks, not singing along to Tobin's favorite Bing Crosby records. Then, after a few more drinks, he started to feel better. Hell, Tobin, why don't you quit your beefing? You'll live through it. David Crook was also deeply troubled by Gaunt's disappearance. We had known each other all our lives and been at school together for about twelve years, he recalled. Only a week or two before, I had said to him one evening that if anything were to happen to him, I should feel rather responsible because he was an only son, and I had persuaded him to join the RAF with me. Late that night, Tobin opened his diary. Today was the toughest day. We were in a terrific battle over London, he jotted. Geoffrey Gaunt, one of my best friends, is missing. I saw a spitfire during the fight spinning down on fire. I sure hope it wasn't Jeff. If it was, well, from now on he'll be flying in clearer skies. The following day, Goering raged at a conference of his senior commanders about the Jagdwaffe's abysmal failure yet again to protect his bombers. The fighters have failed. This time, Goering's rant fell on deaf ears. The Jagdwaffe's many brave pilots, prime among them JG-26's Adolf Galland, now deeply resented his insinuation that they lacked guts. Goering was delusional, basing his assertions on hopelessly inaccurate intelligence. For the first time, there were mumblings on some airfields about the impossibility of winning not just the battle, but the war. On September 17th, Grand Admiral Erich Raeder recorded in the official German war diary, The enemy air force is by no means defeated. On the contrary, it shows increasing activity— and then the all-important words, The Führer therefore decides to postpone Operation Sea Lion indefinitely. Britain would not be invaded. Instead, she would be brought to her knees through terror bombing at night and slow starvation by day. What was left of the Luftwaffe's bomber fleet and the Atlantic U-boat packs would sooner or later surely see to that. Besides, Hitler now nursed a greater design than the humiliation of Winston Churchill, the conquest of Soviet Russia. I want colonies I can walk to without getting my feet wet, he would soon tell one of his confidants. Churchill's fighter boys did not yet know that they had fought off the greatest threat to Britain's survival in a millennium, and that they had done so by the narrowest of margins— only with the passage of time would it become clear that on September 15, 1940, the hardest day, they had made possible a far greater victory. As an official RAF historian would write, when the details of the fighting grow dim and the names of its heroes are forgotten, men will still remember that civilization was saved by a thousand British boys and a few Americans. Part 4. Last Flights Sooner or later came the moment when we, the surviving witnesses of this gay, sporting carnage, had had our fill, and fatigue, 
with its byproducts, fear and revolt, blunted or destroyed our natural, or should we say professional, impulses, and we became infected instead with a morbid terror of dying, filled with the same of killing, saddened with the endless departure of friends to their lone home, repulsed by the futile, boasting claims of the wiping out, the annihilation of the enemy. Lauded as heroes, hung with medals, we only longed to withdraw into the mountains or the marshes, there to forget yesterday and tomorrow. Peter Townsend, 85 Squadron Chapter 14 Orido One is not in London forty-eight hours before being extremely conscious of the fact that one is living with a people who are fighting for their lives. Whether they fight by sleeping uncomfortably in a shelter so that they can work again tomorrow, or fight by putting out fires or by sucking oxygen out of a mask so that they do not lose their depth perception when aiming a machine gun at high altitudes. And one feels there is a quality of indecency in the eagerness of one's curiosity, an intrusion on something personal and intimate of which one is not really a part. Ralph Ingersoll, American Visitor to London in September 1940 the Germans had taken a good licking on September 15th, but they were far from down for the count. There was still a great deal of hard pounding left to do, as 609's David Crook put it. But not for his American friends. Just four days later, on September 19th, 1940, they were posted to 71 Eagle Squadron, the first men to join the first American unit in the RAF's history. Mamadoff, Tobin and Keogh would be much missed by their fellow 609 pilots. The entry in 609's operational record book for September 19th reads, The three American pilots left us with evident reluctance and to our great regret. Both in the air and on the ground they had contributed color, variety, and vocabulary to the squadron, and their wisecracking will be missed. David Crook was particularly sad to see his American friends go. Just as they were becoming really good, they were posted away, he recalled. We were very sorry to lose them, because they were grand fellows. The Americans' new outfit, 71 Squadron, would not have existed had it not been for Colonel Charles Sweeney's nephew, confusingly also called Charles, who in April 1940 had contacted Lord Beaverbrook the Minister of Aircraft Production, with the idea of an all-American squadron, whose shoulder patch would resemble the insignia of the eagle on his American passport. Beaverbrook, whose own son Max Aitken had at the time been 601's squadron leader, had liked the idea of such an eagle squadron and had recommended that Sweeney contact Brendan Bracken, personal assistant to Winston Churchill. Bracken was an old friend of the Sweeney family and had quickly forwarded the idea to Churchill, who was also immediately enthusiastic. The potential for positive propaganda was unrivaled. Here were America's finest young airmen, ready to lay their lives on the line for democracy while their own country slept. An all-American squadron flying in the RAF would powerfully and symbolically undermine the notion of American neutrality. Over the summer, other Americans had arrived in Britain, having made the dangerous crossing from America, and some were now posted to other squadrons in the RAF because the newly formed Eagle Squadron could not take them all. One of these intrepid volunteers was 19-year-old John Kenneth Haviland, who was sent to RAF Digby, home to 151 Squadron, in time to fly in the Battle of Britain. Haviland had been born in Mount Kisco, New York, the son of an American Navy officer and an English mother. Unlike his fellow Americans now forming the Eagle Squadron, Havland had been largely educated in England, having attended Nottingham University, where he had learned to fly. He had joined the RAF Volunteer Reserve in July 1939, only weeks before the Germans had invaded Poland. Havland was just one of far too many woefully inexperienced flyers brought into decimated squadrons that September. Pilots who had not even practiced deflection shooting and had less than twenty hours flying fighters. Raw and scared, many crashed their planes and died or were wounded in accidents rather than combat. 
This was the case with Havland, who collided with another hurricane during formation practice the day after he joined 151 Squadron. Thankfully, he was able to bring his hurricane down in a paddock. He would see no further significant action in the Battle of Britain. Another American pilot who joined the fray at this time was 28-year-old pilot officer Philip Howard Zeke LeCrone, who had grown up dirt poor on a farm outside Salem, Illinois. His marriage had fallen apart because of his decision to risk his life at a time when America was strictly neutral. In his wife's eyes, he had abandoned her and their two children back in Salem to join the RAF. From boyhood, LeCrone had been attracted to danger, driving motorcycles and cars too fast, as Andy Mamadoff had also done before learning to fly. He had arrived in Britain via Canada in July 1940, just as the Battle of Britain was starting in earnest, and in early September had been posted to 616 Squadron, which had lost six pilots in just a few hours on August 26, 1940. The RAF's need for new blood was now so great that Lacrone was rushed into operational duties only a few days after joining 616. On September 16th, radar detected a German bomber heading to attack a convoy, codenamed Pilot in the North Sea. Scrambled early, Lacrone and his flight leader, Colin McPhee, were able to close fast, despite the thick cloud cover over the North Sea, and destroy the German JU-88A. The bomber ditched several minutes later. It was Lacrone's sole combat during the Battle of Britain. On October 12th, he would leave 616 Squadron to join Mamadoff, Tobin, and Keo in the newly formed 71 Eagle Squadron. The last of the Americans who flew in the Battle of Britain was pilot officer Hugh William Riley, who had been born in Detroit, Michigan, but had spent most of his life in Canada. Like Eugene Tobin, Riley had lost his mother at an early age. But unlike Tobin, he had not recovered so well from her death and had none of Tobin's infectious wit and optimism. He had made his way to England in May 1939, convinced that war was imminent. It was assumed that he was Canadian because he had traveled on a Canadian passport and kept his true nationality secret from even his fellow pilots in 66 Squadron, a truly motley throng, according to one veteran, consisting of young men from every walk of life. Regular Air Force officers, sergeant pilots who had been in peacetime dockhands, clerks, motor mechanics. There was even an ex-dirt track motorcycle expert with us. On September 17, 1940, Riley took his first operational flight. The following day, he was paired with the 21-year-old flight leader Bobby Oxpring, the son of a decorated 1914-1918 fighter ace. A tallish, good-looking, fair-headed bloke, noted one contemporary. Oxpring had a typical schoolboy complexion, liable to blush every now and then. He can take his beer like a man, comes from the north and has a typical Yorkshire outlook. For 66 Squadron and others brought into the front line that late September, there was no respite from fatigue and fear, just as there had been none the previous month for the RAF's frontline pilots. The fight between the RAF and the Luftwaffe to control airspace over the English Channel would last many more weeks, and now, as temperatures dropped and the leaves began to fall, they had a new enemy to contend with. The weather. Although increased cloud cover provided some protection, colder temperatures made flying several scrambles each day even more taxing. The Hurricane and Spitfire's cockpits were unheated, and now vapor trails formed at lower altitudes, making it easier for the higher-flying Messerschmitts to spot their prey. Above 25,000 feet, neophytes such as Riley, who jumped into their planes with dew-sodden boots, could suddenly find their feet frozen stiff to the pedals. On September 24th, Hugh Riley and Oxpring were on standby at dawn, huddled in front of the stove in the dispersal hut in their flying jackets. Part of an ME-109's tail fin, showing the swastika, hung over a mantelpiece as a trophy. Outside the cozy hut with its leather armchairs, RAF Kenley lay shrouded in wraiths of mist. There was a fruitless patrol just before midday. Then at 4.35 p.m., Riley again heard the calm voice of Bobby Oxpring as he led B-Flight up on yet another scramble. Around 5 p.m., Oxpring spotted a German bomber, 
a henkel from KG-126, a few miles off the coast of Gravesend. As I closed in to range with my number two, pilot officer Hugh Riley, the henkel made off in a shallow dive, recalled Oxpring. We fired in turn at the engines which both emitted smoke. Shortly afterwards it disappeared into the haze and we claimed it as a probable. Something disastrous must have occurred aboard because later we heard it had been confirmed as having crashed between Maidstone and Gravesend. All the crew was killed. Oxpring was now an ace with five confirmed victories. That night, Riley and Oxpring celebrated in a local pub. The squadron's two favorite watering holes were the leather bottle at Cobham, which had good food despite rationing, and the ship, a short walk from the docks in Gravesend, and more often than not crowded with cockney stevedores and riggers. We could never return a drink except by devious and surreptitious means, recalled Oxpring. Sixty-six was regarded as their fighter squadron and their exclusive defenders. Across the channel, at JG-26's base in Odenbear, a jubilant Adolf Galland and his fellow pilots polished off several cases of champagne. That morning, Galland had bounced a 17-squadron hurricane and thirty seconds later had watched his fortieth victim turn upside down and then bail out. He was now neck and neck with his rival, Werner Mulders. There was indeed much to celebrate. His name was back in the headlines, and he had earned the highly coveted oak leaves to the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Tomorrow he would fly to Berlin to meet with none less than the Führer himself. It was late the following afternoon when Galland entered the Chancellery in Berlin, proudly wearing his polished oak leaves. He was soon seated alone with the Führer for the first time and being asked what he thought of the RAF's pilots. I expressed my great admiration for our enemy across the water, recalled Galland. I was embittered by several insidious and false representations and commentaries by the press and on the radio, which had referred to the RAF in a condescending and presumptuous tone. To Galland's surprise, the Führer did not interrupt him. Instead, he nodded his agreement. He, too, had the greatest respect for the Anglo-Saxon race. He called the Battle of Britain a world historical tragedy. If we won the war, a vacuum would be created by the destruction of Great Britain, which it would be impossible to fill. Like so many others, Galland had been quickly charmed by Hitler and left the Chancellery no longer feeling bitter about the Luftwaffe's inept leadership. The Third Reich's most glamorous ace, fetid throughout Berlin, was then whisked away to see Goering at the Reich Hunting Lodge in East Prussia, a far less ostentatious retreat than Karenhall, but just as renowned for its fine hunting. At the entrance, Galland met an irritated and impatient Werner Mulders. Goering and Hitler had kept him away from JG-51 for three days, and he was eager to get back into the air and increase his score. The oak leaves had not cured his throat ache. Quite the opposite. The obligation to defend your title as the most successful fighter pilot in the world was taken very seriously, recalled Galland. Mulders hurried towards a waiting car and then called back to Galland. The fat one promised me he would detain you as long as he did me. And by the way, good luck with the stag I missed. Galland walked on towards the Reich hunting lodge, and then Goering strode out of the building to greet him, dressed in a green suede hunting jacket over a silk blouse with long puffed sleeves, high hunting boots, and in his belt a hunting knife in the shape of an old Germanic sword. Goering was in high spirits. The dismal failures of Eagle Day and September 15th appeared to be forgotten, as well as cutting remarks from Hitler about Goering's failure to wipe out the RAF, as he had promised during the summer. Galland could hear huge stags rutting in the distance as Goering congratulated him on his forty kills and said he had a suitably special gift for his outspoken ace with the expensive cigars, film star friends, and brand new silver Mercedes. Galland would be given the high honor of hunting one of the stags reserved for Goering, a Reichsjagermeister stag, a royal stag.
I promised Molders to keep you here at least three days, so you've got plenty of time. The next morning, September 27th, Galan soon had the stag of a lifetime in his sight. He squeezed the trigger. The stag fell. Now he could leave and get back to the real hunt above England. But Gehring was having none of it and made Galan stay on at the lodge. He had promised Molders, and he was a man of his word. Back in England that morning, 66 Squadron and the RAF's other frontline units braced themselves for yet another hard day's fighting. It was now so cold at higher altitudes that some of Hugh Riley's fellow 66 Squadron cut up potatoes and smeared the juice over their cockpits to prevent them from icing up. Others wore their cricket sweaters under their flying jackets to add a layer of warmth. Meanwhile, On the other side of the channel, the exhausted pilots of JG-53, the Ace of Spades, attended briefings at their bases in Normandy. Today, they were to escort JU-88 and ME-110 attacks on aircraft factories. The Ace of Spades was now led by Captain Hans Karl Mayer, the burly pilot who had nearly killed Andy Mamadoff on August 24th. Mayer was at his zenith. On September 5th, he had been awarded the Knight's Cross for 20 kills, and soon after, he had been promoted to group commander. As JG-53's new leader, he had rapidly increased his tally. Below the swastika on his tail fin, there were now 29 white stripes. It was around 5 p.m., with the light fading, when Fighter Command scrambled 66 Squadron and several others to meet the incoming bombers escorted by JG-53. Twenty minutes later, 66 Squadron's pilots spotted a formation of JU-88s near Ashford in Kent. Far above was an escorting cloud of ME-109s. One was flown by Lieutenant Eric Bodendick of Two Group from JG-53. We had received orders for the entire group to once again carry out a fighter sweep over England, he recalled. A total of 18 machines were still serviceable, The rest had bullet holes and other damage that needed repair. We had crossed the English coast when Spitfires, obviously under radar control, suddenly emerged from a cloud bank below us and to the right. The Spitfires were in fact 66 Squadron. Bodendick and the Ace of Spades attacked, cannon and machine guns blazing, and then scattered towards the clouds. After taking evasive action by pulling into steep turns, 66 Squadron gave chase, but the Messerschmitts were faster. Only one of the Germans failed to escape back across the channel, Lieutenant Bodendick. My aircraft plodded forward, he recalled, gaining scarcely any height and even less speed. I felt totally helpless, for I could only hope to slowly reach the cloud deck, knowing the Spitfire was not as good as the Messerschmitt in a shallow climb. Unfortunately for Bodendick, he had been spotted by Hugh Riley and Bobby Oxpring, who were soon on his tail and then opened fire. Oxpring was on target with a beautiful deflection shot. Bodendick flew straight into a hail of bullets. Oxpring's chance was one in a thousand, but it worked, recalled Bodendick. He hit my tank, which was unprotected from below, and my aircraft caught fire. I had to get out, and I did. Meanwhile, back at the Reich hunting lodge in East Prussia, Adolf Galland had been enjoying the peace and quiet of the wilderness, its heather-scented air and autumn colors. Late that afternoon, he joined Gehring as reports from Luftwaffe commanders on the day's actions were delivered. There had been very high losses— Fifty-four aircraft destroyed and thirteen damaged. Gehring was shattered, recalled Galland. He simply could not explain how the increasingly painful losses of bombers came about. Galland asked whether he could return to his base on the Channel Coast. A morose Gehring agreed. On the way back to France, mechanical failure forced Galland to land at the nearest airfield, and he had to continue his journey by train. His fellow passengers were nauseated and astonished. Galland had brought his royal stag with him, eager to show his men the bounty he had collected. Oak leaves and a truly massive set of antlers. September drew to a close. 
For the Luftwaffe's bomber units, it had been a disastrous month, with a quarter of the force destroyed. For the fighter wings, it ended just as badly. On the final day of that month, they lost 28 ME-109s, the highest number in one day so far. It was clearly time for a change of strategy, and in early October, Goering ordered that a third of the Jagdwaffe be adapted to carry bombs so that they could perform hit-and-run sorties while the remainder of the fighter units carried out Jagdfreie, or free hunts. No longer would he send over massive daylight raids escorted by every fighter Kesselring could muster. The losses involved were unsustainable. Instead, the British would be bombed into submission at night. Goering's new plan of attack delighted his finest pilots. Free hunts were what the Jagdwaffe's highest-scoring pilots had wanted all along, and JG-2's Helmut Vick, JG-26's Adolf Galland, JG-51's Werner Mulders, and JG-53's Hans Karl Mayer were now all competing to end the year as the Luftwaffe's leading ace. On October 5th, Vic had shot down no fewer than five RAF fighters in two sorties, ripping apart three Hurricanes from 607 Squadron in just a few ferocious seconds and bringing his total to 42. Now, the handsome J.G. Richthofen's young star also had the oak leaves, and Mulders and Galland were in danger of being quickly overtaken. By the second week in October 1940, the skies above the Channel and southern England were more dangerous than ever for Hugh Riley and the RAF's hundreds of other newly minted fighter pilots. The Luftwaffe's leading aces had free reign, no longer shackled to fleets of slow-moving bombers. The marauding German fighter squadrons were soon operating as hunting packs, recalled 66 Squadron's Bobby Oxpring and their numbers varied from half a dozen or so to formations of two hundred plus. Freed from our backs-to-the-wall roll against the bomber menace, we were hunting too. We were living under considerable tension. Each of us wondered when it would be our turn to stop a pack of lead. On October 17th, around 2.30 p.m., 66 Squadron was vectored to intercept ME-109s flying as Yabos fighter bombers, each carrying a single 250-kilogram bomb. Bobby Oxspring ordered his pilots to follow him up as high as possible. The temperature plunged as they groped higher and higher, throttles wide open and their Merlin engines struggling above 25,000 feet, windscreens starting to ice over, vapor trails stretching ominously for miles behind them. Riley flew in his usual position, out to the starboard of Oxpring and slightly behind, so that he could protect his flight leader and also quickly follow him into the attack. He had to concentrate. One mistake at high altitude could cause a pilot to fall dangerously behind. Even higher than Riley, Wing Commander Werner Mulders cruised at the head of his squadron, his latest model Messerschmitt 109 FO easily coping with the thin air because of its powerful fuel injection engine. Mulders may have had the sun on his side, flying out of the south, when suddenly he spotted Bobby Oxpring's flight and pounced on Hugh Riley at 30,000 feet, opening up with his cannon and machine guns. Riley was at a grave disadvantage, taken by surprise and flying in a far less responsive plane above its optimum height. At 3.25 p.m., the 22-year-old became the second American to die in the Battle of Britain. His body was later discovered in his Spitfire, which crashed and burned at Crockham Hill, west of Seven Oaks in Kent. JG-53, with whom Werner Mulders had first flown in the Battle of Britain, was also involved in fierce fighting that afternoon. Back at the German unit's base, its leader, Hans Karl Mayer, listened to the radio in alarm as his two most senior pilots were shot up. Five days before, on October 12th, he had scored his 31st kill, the 500th for JG-53. Determined to help his surviving pilots get back across the channel safely, Mayer now jumped into the nearest available plane, a new ME-109E7, and was soon heading towards England. Unfortunately, the Messerschmitt had not been fitted with a working radio or a life raft, and its gun breaches were empty. Mayer did not meet up with his hard-pressed pilots. Ten days later, his bloated body washed up on the beach at Littlestone in Kent.
Mayors, ace of spades, pilots were deeply shocked at the loss of their leader, a father figure and inspiration to so many of them. Mayer had come to personify the now legendary JG-53, and after his death, the unit would never be quite as successful or as confident again. Back at RAF Kenley, flight leader Bobby Oxpring and 66 Squadron were also deeply affected by Hugh Riley's death. He had been a popular, unassuming man whose single but great misfortune had been to be surprised by the greatest German fighter pilot of his generation, Werner Mulders. Oxpring recalled that when Riley was buried, the families of dockers in Gravesend lined the streets and the town's graveyard in large numbers to pay their respects as the cortege went by. Only now was it revealed that Riley had been an American, and his name was eventually added to the RAF's list of U.S. citizens who fought for England in the greatest aerial conflict in history. On October 31, 1940, just two weeks after Mulders had killed Riley, the Battle of Britain finally ended. Its highest-scoring pilots were both German, Adolf Galland and Mulders, tied with 50 kills each. Chapter 15 The Eagles Somehow I nursed her across the channel, past the golf courses of Sandwich Bay and down to the longest runway in England at Manston. There wasn't much left of the fabric or the tailplane. Before they took me off to the hospital, I hobbled over and patted what was left of the fuselage. Thanks, old girl. You were a real lady. James A. Goodson, Eagle Pilot The Battle of Britain was over. Now began the hard slog of taking the war to the enemy by hitting targets across the channel in northern France. But doing so posed an ever greater challenge as winter set in, even for the pilots who could fly blind in bad weather. Not surprisingly, only the very best of the few were now able to increase their scores, and even they rarely got to France and back without skipping a heartbeat or two. Meanwhile, the newly formed American Eagle Squadron, arguably the least experienced and most ill-disciplined unit in the RAF, struggled to get airborne, let alone launch hit-and-run raids on German defenses. It was clear early on that the first Eagles badly needed skillful leadership, so a decorated Battle of Britain veteran, 33-year-old Walter Churchill, was quickly posted to RAF Church Fenton to command the fledgling unit. They're a mad bunch of wild westerners, Colonel Charles Sweeney warned him. They need licking into shape, and it's no use being easy with them just because they are Americans. You must be tough from the word go, but you can justify your toughness by your record. Remember, you've fought in the Battle of Britain. You've seen action. Just let that message sink in. Churchill had his work cut out for him. The Eagles did not lack the courage and moral fiber to get the job done, recalled Royce Wilkinson, a British flight commander posted to Church Fenton with Churchill. But they were indeed a wild bunch. In the eyes of the old RAF hands at the base, they acted like saboteurs of military tradition. Most had no idea about discipline or RAF customs, and it showed. They drank heavily, shocked mess sergeants with their table manners, played intense games of craps on the wool carpet in the officer's mess, and were described even by other Americans as a bunch of renegades. Churchill did his best to rein in the more undisciplined among the first eagles, but he knew full well that only when they were back in the air and undergoing difficult and dangerous combat training would they start to truly gel as a squadron. Fortunately, the challenge of turning the Americans into a first-class unit became a little easier with the arrival at Church Fenton of a new intelligence officer, 26-year-old J. Roland Robbie Robinson, who would later become Lord Martin Mayer, Governor and Commander-in-Chief of Bermuda. It was none other than Robinson who had helped Tobin, Keogh, and Mamadoff gain acceptance into the RAF earlier that year. Now he rapidly set about smoothing away some of the eagle's rough edges and soon became an avuncular figure who invited his American pals to his country home and even lent them money when they ran short. The eagle pilots settled down quickly, he recalled. Their only real difficulty was probably that they were always broke, owing to the inadequacies of the Royal Air Force pay, which was at a lower standard than American pay. 
Another frustration was dealing with an endless stream of reporters who now beat a path to Church Fenton intent on glorifying the Eagles before they had even become operational. Fawning portraits began to appear in Britain and America, where isolationist sentiment had weakened in large part because of the RAF's success in fending off invasion, contrary to the dire predictions of aviation legend Charles Lindbergh and Ambassador Joseph Kennedy. A few weeks after his arrival at Church Fenton, Eugene Tobin was interviewed by a British radio journalist who described him in language typical of most of the propagandist material churned out about the young American pioneers of 71 Squadron. He has hair like a torch, so his friends call him red. His walk is loose-limbed. He is tall and absolutely without fear. Talking to him is rather like watching one of those old-time jugglers of the music halls, keeping six dazzling jeweled Indian clubs in the air at the same time. Red Tobin talks like that. He couldn't be dull if he tried. His slang sets fire to everything. It is amusing to hear him talk of his parachute as his jump sack, to hear him ask for bang water when he wants petrol. Most amusing to hear him ask for the bandstand when he wants the cruet on the mess table. Why was Tobin fighting for Britain? Well, replied Tobin, at first I just felt I wanted to fly some of these powerful machines, so I just came over. I guess one's views change a little once one is over here. The British are a swell people. This is a nice little country, and I don't mind fighting for it a bit. But Tobin wasn't fighting for it. And this soon began to grate on him and others who had tasted combat that summer. Indeed, 71 Squadron's first recruits were not a happy crowd. In his diary, Tobin complained day after day about being bored, sitting on his ass in dreary Yorkshire. Church Fenton was a far cry from Middle Wallop and the intensity of late August. News of his friends in 609 Squadron only made Tobin more frustrated and impatient to return to combat. Sergeant Alan Feary had been shot down and killed on October 7th, but the rest of 609 were still battling with exceptional results, Johnny Dogs Dundas adding another five kills and David Crook at least three confirmed since the Americans had left Middle Wallop with heavy hearts. It took another of the squadron's first recruits, pilot officer Art Donahue, only a few days to get fed up with Church Fenton. After taking one look at his fellow eagles and discovering that they had yet to be provided with planes, he demanded a transfer back to 64 Squadron. Colonel Charles Sweeney, now appointed the honorary commander of the eagles, tried to prevent Donahue's departure. I hated to see him go, he recalled. He was a mean little guy, with more poetry than meanness in his makeup. I saw in him the makings of an excellent squadron leader. I tried to stop his transfer— kicked like a base steer, but it did me no good. Donahue packed his bags and on October 26, 1940, returned to RAF Kenley, where a delighted Aeneas MacDonald welcomed him back to the fold. I hope you won't think I'm foolish because I didn't want to be in the Eagle Squadron, Donahue wrote his parents a few days later. I am considerably ahead by being in my old squadron. This in spite of the fact that the Eagles will no doubt soon be covered in glory, while the newspapers are not liable to get any more news concerning me unless I really earn it by accomplishing something. Donahue certainly wasn't missing anything. Six weeks after arriving at Church Fenton, the Eagles were still without planes. Finally, on November 7th, 85 Squadron's Peter Townsend and eight of his pilots landed at Church Fenton in nine battered hurricanes that had seen extensive action in the Battle of Britain. Here, at last, were the Eagles' first mounts. Everything good happened today, it was noted in the Squadron's official diary. Nine hurricanes arrived, delivered by 85 Squadron. The commanding officer, squadron leader Townsend, most attractive fellow, stationed at Gravesend, was leading his squadron into battle daily despite one foot in a plaster cast, having had several toes taken off by a cannon shell. A few days after 71 Squadron finally received their banged-up kites, Eugene Tobin suddenly collapsed and was admitted to the hospital. At first, doctors thought he was probably suffering from delayed shock and exhaustion after such a strenuous year. But then Tobin was found to have lupus, an often fatal affliction resulting from a failure of the immune system. For the rest of his time in the RAF, it would wear down his stamina 
and sap his spirits. He would eventually be so tired that as soon as he was released from duties each evening, he would go to bed and fall into a deep sleep. He kept the illness a secret, rightly fearing that if discovered, it would quickly put an end to his flying career. It was after two o'clock on November 28th, Thanksgiving Day in America, when a grinning 25-year-old Helmut Vick lifted himself from the cockpit of his Messerschmitt. His ground crew quickly gathered around and Vick beamed with pride. Near the Isle of Wight, he had just seen his 55th victim fall to the waters below. The competition to be the Luftwaffe's highest scoring pilot of 1940 was reaching its climax. On October 29th, Werner Mulders had downed his 54th plane. Incredibly, on November 5th and 6th, Vic had then shot down eight RAF pilots and drawn level with Mulders. Never one to be outdone for long, on November 17th, Adolf Galland had surpassed both aces, destroying three RAF fighters to take his total to 55, which had put him ahead of his two rivals by just one kill. Now, Vic had drawn level again. With the onset of winter and rumors that the entire Jagdwaffe would soon be pulled back to Germany to be refitted, the pressure was more intense than ever. Only a few hours of hunting remained. Vic was ruthlessly committed to flying as many missions as he could squeeze into the shortening days, ever more obsessed with becoming the Second World War's Red Baron, the unrivaled heir to his unit's namesake, Richthofen. To his men, he appeared to be as dynamic as ever, but in fact, he was dog-tired, operating on his last reserves of nervous energy. Still, it was worth it. That morning, he had not only added another white stripe to his tail fin, but also seen his grinning face on the cover of the latest issue of the Berliner Illustrierter, surely a good omen. If he could only keep killing at his current rate, he would end the year as the Luftwaffe's unchallenged star. It was around 3.20 p.m. when the phone rang in JG-2 headquarters. An officer from JG-26 was on the line. He had bad news. Major Adolf Galland had just bagged a hurricane and again pulled ahead. Vic turned to his ground crews and ordered them to refuel and rearm his squadron, there was still time for a last prowl over the white cliffs of the Isle of Wight's jagged southern coastline, called the Needles. Around half an hour later, J.G. Richthofen's commander went through his checks and then led his flight into the air, headed for his second free hunt of the day, hell-bent on catching up with Galland. It was a clear afternoon. Vic and his wingmen scanned the horizon. Meanwhile, Back at base, an order came through from headquarters. Vic was not to fly again. He was now too important a Nazi propaganda figure to be allowed to die in combat. Across the channel, Fighter Command's radar stations detected Vic and his squadron as they flew towards the Isle of Wight. Not long after, the black Bakelite telephone shrilled in 609 Squadron's dispersal hut at Middle Wallop. Squadron leader Michael Robinson and 609 were soon airborne and then vectored towards the Isle of Wight. It was 4.10 p.m. when Helmut Vick and one of his most trusted wingmen, Rudy Plantz, suddenly spotted Spitfires climbing fast southwest of the Needles. Vick quickly picked out 609's Paul Bayon and ordered Plantz to follow him in a diving attack. Bayon was soon in his sights and Vick opened fire. Smoke streamed from Bayon's Spitfire. Vic pressed on with his attack, sending another volley into Bayon's stricken plane. To his delight, his 56th victim bailed out and parachuted down into the Solent. He had done it. He had drawn level with Galland once more. It must have been a glorious moment for the young pilot. Vic then pulled out of his dive and banked steeply, passing through the reflector gun sight of Johnny Dogs Dundas, now 609's highest scoring ace with 16 kills. Dundas pressed the tit instinctively and bullets ripped into Vic's plane, disabling it. Then Dundas saw Vic's canopy fly away. I've finished a 109! Whoopee! Good show, John, replied Squadron Leader Robinson. 
Helmut Vick pulled himself up from his cockpit and bailed out. Meanwhile, his wingman, Rudy Plantz, had latched on to Dundas and opened fire. A few seconds later, Dundas's spitfire went screaming down into the Solent. Helmut Vick and his nemesis, Johnny Dogs Dundas, two of the most talented fighter pilots of the Battle of Britain, would never be seen again. A week later, on December 5th, 1940, the race to be number one was finally decided. During an early afternoon encounter with three RAF squadrons, Adolf Galland shot down his 57th victim and became the highest-scoring German fighter pilot of the war so far. Mulders lagged three behind as JG-51, JG-26, and many other frontline units were then pulled back to Germany from their bases in Normandy, and the fierce fighting over the English Channel and southern England came to an end. It seemed that the Eagles would never go operational. By the time Galland and his fellow aces were withdrawn from France, the first recruits to the Eagle Squadron, Eugene Tobin, Andy Mamadoff, and Vernon Keogh, had been out of action for almost three months. And to their utter frustration, there was little prospect of returning to combat before the new year. Their fellow Americans in 71 Squadron needed a lot more time in the air if they were going to stand a chance in a dogfight. After moving the squadron to RAF Curtin Lindsay, ten miles from Scunthorpe on a windswept Lincolnshire plain, squadron leader Churchill began a grueling schedule of formation flying and gunnery exercises. Cameras mounted on their hurricanes recorded a pilot's first efforts at deflection shots. The results were not impressive. Most of the Americans had never used a reflector gun sight, let alone fired at a moving target while flying at more than 300 miles per hour. Even the most gifted found the training tough going. The simplest mistake could be fatal. On October 28th, after losing control in a power dive from 10,000 feet, Philip Zeke Lacrone, the Illinois pilot who had fought in the Battle of Britain, blacked out, but then came to in time to crash land, sustaining minor back injuries and severe shock. Zeke and I were flying in formation, Eugene Tobin recorded in his diary. We came in for a landing and Zeke overshot and dumped the thing on its back. I jumped out of my plane and ran over and helped him get out. He was out colder than a clam, and when he came to, he didn't remember anything. As Christmas approached, the eagles were full of thoughts of home. Eugene Tobin wondered what his little honey, Anne Herring, was doing back in Los Angeles. It was his first Christmas away from his family, and he vowed he would be with Pa and sisters and all his friends in America for the next. His fellow eagles were happy despite the foggy and damp weather. Merry Christmas, everybody, Tobin wrote in his diary on Christmas Eve. Except for Hitler, the bastard. At the end of his diary for 1940, Tobin listed all the places he had visited, and in its cash ledger he entered the names of six friends who had been killed in as many months. On New Year's Eve, Tobin danced the night away until six the following morning at the Trocadero Club in London. I hope this goddamn war is over this time next year, he wrote in the first entry to a new diary for 1941. I have made a lot of friends, but some of my pals are here no more. They're flying in clearer skies. Great guys, every damn one of them. So, boys, till we meet again. Finally, on January 4th, 1941, the Eagles officially became operational. The following day they took off from Curtin Lindsay, flying together for the first time as a fully-fledged RAF squadron. Morale was high. At 20,000 feet they split into four sections to practice tight formation flying. One of the sections comprised Shorty Keogh, pilot officer Edwin Bud Orbison, and Philip Lacrone. Seated on his two customary cushions, Shorty watched, aghast, as the wingtip of Bud Orbison's hurricane suddenly collided with Lacrone's plane, chopping off its tail. Orbison was able to return to Curtin Lindsay and land without injury, but Lacrone went into a tailspin and plunged towards the ground. Keogh followed Lacrone down, shouting at him over the radio transmitter. Bail out! Bail out! Lacrone did not reply and made no attempt to bail out. He died instantly on impact, the first eagle to lose his life, and the third fatality among the Americans who had flown in the Battle of Britain. He had received his private pilot's license less than a year before in Salem, Illinois, where the local airport today bears his name.
The operations book for 71 reported Zeke Lacrone was quiet and reserved. His death will help this unit, for if nothing else, it will tend to impress on the other pilots the attention they must pay to detail in these practice flights. It is true of this squadron, as of most others in the RAF, that they are inclined to treat all this practice flying as a bit of a bore. Lacrone had joined the RAF for the highest of motives, not for the glamour, if any, or the thrills, but to defend our way of life. Eager to escape the dreary confines of Curtin Lindsay, especially after Lacrone's death, the Eagles were soon seizing every opportunity to visit London. In the capital, they now enjoyed celebrity status among their fellow expatriates and were often the star guests of boisterous parties hosted by journalists such as Quentin Reynolds of Colliers and Robert Casey of the New York Herald Tribune, who both got on particularly well with Eugene Tobin. When the Eagles ventured into villages near their airfield, they were made to feel just as welcome. Most British people had only seen Americans in a movie. Meeting a Yank in real life was a rare occurrence. The sight of Tobin and his pals in RAF blue, with eagle patches on their shoulders, was at the very least intriguing and more often than not worth toasting. It was common knowledge that they had broken their country's strict neutrality laws to come to Britain's aid. Very often, recalled 21-year-old Eagle pilot Bill Geiger, a bartender would say, you don't pay for drinks here, Yank. While other fighter pilots often got the same kind of treatment, the Americans got it more often. They also didn't lack for girlfriends, and it wasn't long before several had fallen hard for numerous English roses. One night, Andy Mamadoff met a young aristocrat named Penny Craven, who had a cut-glass accent and an infectious laugh. One of the most eligible young women in England, she was due to inherit millions from her family, which had made a fortune in the cigarette business. Quite a catch for the swashbuckling but penniless white Russian emigre. So began a whirlwind romance. Within weeks, Mamadoff and Craven were planning to get married and to visit his parents back in Connecticut as soon as he was granted some extended leave. Penny would then get to enjoy true Cossack hospitality, dance with Andy to gypsy music at the Russian Bear restaurant his parents owned, and taste his mother's home cooking. Beef stroganoff, mocha rum cake, and borscht fit for a czar. In late January, the Eagles began patrolling over the treacherous North Sea as convoy escorts. There was little danger of being bounced by Messerschmitts. Most of the time they were beyond the German fighter's range. The thick blanket of cloud just above the swells worried most of the Americans far more. In such conditions, even the best pilots were prone to vertigo, losing track of altitude and direction, with often deadly results. The first to fall victim was 22-year-old Californian Bud Orbison, who had been involved in the fatal accident with Philip Lacrone. On February 9, 1941, he crashed as he tried to orientate himself at 4,000 feet. Yet again, Eugene Tobin and his fellow Americans mourned the loss of a popular pilot, killed like Lacrone on a Sunday. I don't know of a better day to go, jotted Tobin in his diary that night. So to my great pals Phil and Bud, happy landings in your new hunting grounds. The next eagle fell just a week later on February 15, 1941. A section of Hurricanes was scrambled to fly protection over a convoy just off the East Coast, recalled Jim Goodson, a 22-year-old New Yorker who had been trained in Canada before joining the Eagles. Pilot officer Nat Morans and Shorty dove into cloud. For some reason, Shorty stayed in the dive and must have come out of the cloud too low to recover and went into the sea. Coast guards heard the sound of a crash. Some of the eagles thought vertigo had also caused Shorty to hit the waves at over 500 miles per hour. According to 21-year-old Chesley Peterson, however, there was a far more mundane reason. Shorty forgot to turn on his oxygen and blacked out during the dive simply for lack of air. Apparently, Keo's mother back in Brooklyn refused to accept either theory. Her son was not dead. He must have bailed out. He would turn up any day with a rueful grin on his face, as he had in the thirties as a skydiver when he had drifted miles away from his intended landing spot. But even she had to accept the bitter truth when she learned that a Coast Guard unit had found a pair of size five flying boots 
floating amid wreckage. Nobody but Little Shorty could wear such small boots. It was noted in 71 Squadron's operations record book. There can be little doubt that Shorty's plane dived into the sea at great speed and that he was killed instantly. The women in the local pub Shorty had frequented were heartbroken at the news of his death. They had told a visiting journalist only weeks before that they'd like to keep him on their mantel shelf forever. Eugene Tobin was so upset that he stopped writing in his diary. Shorty had become as close as a brother, and both Tobin and Andy Mamadoff struggled hard to accept that he would never again sprint at their side during a scramble, his two cushions tucked under one arm. The fates are being most unkind, noted Robbie Robinson in the squadron diary. A much-needed visit from Charles Sweeney lifted the Eagles' spirits for a few days, but soon they were even more downcast. It was rumored that because of the flying accidents, the squadron was to be disbanded and the Eagles sent back to America. No less than the head of fighter command, Sholto Douglas, had called them a bunch of prima donnas. Immediately, the Eagles chose Chesley Peterson, one of the most able of the squadron's pilots, to make their case before Air Marshal Hugh Sanders, the commander of 12 Group. Peterson asked that the Eagles be moved south to 11 Group, where there was a much greater likelihood of engaging the enemy. If we were to be prima donnas, the squadron resolved to be the best prima donnas in the entire RAF, recalled Peterson. Before Peterson's request was passed on to Sholto Douglas, however, it was decided in any case to move the Eagles into the front line in 11 Group. Finally, 71 Squadron would see combat. After all the setbacks, the Eagles finally had something to celebrate. Also based at Curtin Lindsay that spring was 616 Squadron's Johnny Johnson, destined to become World War II's highest-scoring British fighter pilot. He recalled a particularly raucous party, even by the RAF's standards, before the Eagles moved south. The champagne corks were popping, and along the length of one corridor, the defeat of Cornwallis at Yorktown was being reenacted with some spirit. Numerous fire extinguishers were deployed by the Americans, whilst the inferior British fire was restricted to soda siphons from behind a defensive screen of potted palms. Once again, as in 1776, the Americans had the upper hand, and both the Palms and the British were decidedly the worse for wear. On April 9, 1941, the Eagles arrived at Mardlesham Heath in Suffolk. They did not have to wait long to sight the enemy, chasing a JU-88 on April 13th, shooting at a Dornier 17 a few days later, and finally getting into their first real dogfight with ME-109s on May 15th without loss. By July, they were being scrambled almost daily and claiming their fair share of kills. A congratulatory telegram from 11 Group headquarters came towards the end of the month. The American prima donnas were finally earning the RAF top brass's admiration and respect. Soon, the high and mighty were turning up in person to shake their hands. Air Minister Sir Archibald Sinclair, the actor Noel Coward, Air Marshal Sir Sholto Douglas, head of fighter command, and even the American ambassador John Winant, who had replaced Joe Kennedy earlier that year. Kennedy had not been missed. Badly shaken by the Blitz, he had fled London the previous October, but not before telling his mistress, Claire Booth Luce, there is a popular song called There'll Always Be an England. There always will be, but you'll hardly recognize it and I know damn well I'll not be around to be in it. Not long after Kennedy's arrival back in America, on November 5th, President Roosevelt had been re-elected to an unprecedented third term. The next day, Kennedy had met with Roosevelt for five minutes at the White House. According to Kennedy, Roosevelt had said he would not accept his resignation until he had found a replacement. Roosevelt's second son, Elliot, later claimed just the opposite. His father had asked Kennedy to resign. Roosevelt had finally had enough of his anti-Semitic and defeatist ambassador. He would soon introduce several wide-ranging measures, most famously Lend-Lease, to provide Britain with all possible support short of declaring war on Germany. They formed a solemn line as they entered the cathedral in their dark blue uniforms and then took their seats to pay respects to the first of them to fall.
Eugene Tobin and Andy Mamadoff were both among the dozens of pilots soon sitting in pews that Independence Day afternoon of 1941. Indeed, most of 71 Squadron's pilots had been given leave to attend the memorial service for Billy Fisk at St. Paul's in London. The service was a propaganda coup, the perfect opportunity on the perfect date to remind Americans that some of its citizens were already dying for freedom that the isolationist course was inevitably doomed. The new American ambassador, John Winnant, attended, as did Air Minister Sir Archibald Sinclair, who had met with Fisk the previous summer and asked him to go to America to recruit pilots. As cameras from NBC rolled, Sinclair eulogized Fisk as the first American airman to die in the Second World War. Here was a young man for whom life held much. Under no kind of compulsion, he came to fight for Britain. He came, and he fought, and he died. Many more Americans in the RAF would soon follow Fisk to the grave. But none would have a plaque bearing their name placed in St. Paul's crypt only a few yards from a statue of America's first president, George Washington. The following month, August 1941 brought big changes to 71 Eagle Squadron. So many American volunteers were now in Britain that several stalwarts were posted away to form the nucleus of a new Eagle Squadron, 133 Squadron. Andy Mamadoff was selected to lead one of its flights, thereby becoming the first American to be so honored by the RAF. The promotion surprised some of his fellow Eagles. 21-year-old Californian Bill Geiger would later vividly recall Mamadoff during this period. He was a damn good pilot. But you couldn't have said to Andy Mamadoff, look, you're supposed to address the squadron leader as sir and salute him the first time you see him in the morning. Mamadoff would have said, ha ha ha, and forget that. Shortly before leaving 71 Squadron in late August 1941 for his new assignment with 133, 24-year-old Mamadoff also became the first of the American few to take a war bride. Penny Craven, the fun-loving aristocrat who stood to inherit a vast fortune. The lavish wedding reception was too tempting a target for some of his fellow eagles to pass up. The day Mamadoff got married, we were due to have gunnery training, recalled Bill Geiger. But just as the rest of the squadron was due to head off for training— Another Eagle pilot called Ed Bateman and I were ordered to make a convoy patrol. The patrol was uneventful. As we returned, Bateman said, let's see what's going on at Mamadoff's wedding. So we flew towards Epping. We knew where the reception was. Sure enough, when we came in low, we saw the wedding party in a back garden. So we buzzed it. I'm pretty sure we actually went in so low that Andy ducked down. To make matters worse, when the rest of the squadron returned from gunnery practice, they buzzed the town itself. There was all hell to pay because of all the complaints. The mayor of Epping finally said, Look, these people are risking their lives for us. If they want to celebrate a comrade's wedding, then so they should. On September 7th, not long after Mamadoff's wedding, Eugene Tobin joined eight other pilots for 71 Squadron's first mission over enemy territory. The idea was to fly over in poor weather in sections of two or perhaps four and shoot up anything that looked German, we called Eagle Pilot Jim Goodson. If they got into trouble, they could nip into cloud and head for home. That was the theory, anyway. The main problem, however, was that one generally had to fly low, and if caught by ground fire, one was often too low to do much but hit the deck. Setting out for northern France, three planes in 71 Squadron soon had mechanical problems and were forced to return home. Tobin and others flew on. Around 75 miles inland, radar announced bandits to their rear, between them and the channel. The bandits turned out to be a hundred ME-109s. Squadron leader Stanley Mears, who had joined the Eagles only a few weeks before, suddenly called out over the radio, Every man for himself now, chaps. From 29,000 feet, the Messerschmitts screamed down at more than 400 miles per hour, suddenly bouncing several eagles, flashing past others, spitting tracer and cannon. One of the bandits was soon tumbling down in flames. Pieces flew off another. Bill Geiger then watched as Tobin's Spitfire broke formation and went after yet another.
In ensuing dogfights, a recently married young pilot called Hillard Fenlaw was killed, and pilot officer Bill Nichols was shot up badly, forced to crash land, and soon captured. Eugene Tobin was last seen losing height near Bologna. There were unconfirmed reports that he gave the thumbs up, indicating that he was unharmed as he took his plane in for a forced landing. Late into that evening, ground crew stood waiting for him to return, scanning the skies. In recent weeks, they had heard Tobin call out time and again, Saddle her up! The great lover and adventurer is gonna ride high again today! It is not known how Andy Mamadoff reacted to the disappearance of the friend with whom he had gambled so often through the high cirrus above California's Sierra Nevada. But he must have felt terribly vulnerable and alone, now that his two closest friends were dead. Over sixty years later, Eugene Tobin's sister, Helen Mayer, vividly recalled hearing that her brother had gone missing. She was visiting her in-laws in Denver when she received a call from her uncle, who owned a local radio station. He had seen a wire report stating that Tobin had been shot down over enemy territory. Helen, have you heard from your father? No. Why? Well, evidently you haven't heard the news. I hate to be the first to tell you, but I don't want you to hear it on the news. Jean is reported missing. Twenty-five-year-old Mayor broke into tears and fled to her bedroom. The next day she drove around Denver alone for hour after hour, full of memories of a lanky, wise-cracking teenager at Hollywood High, the first latchkey kid in Los Angeles who had once stolen a neighbor's flowers so that he could give them to his dying mother. Damn it, she sobbed. He never got a break. Not one. Tobin was soon confirmed as missing. But had he been killed? A telegram sent by the journalist Quentin Reynolds left the Tobin family hoping that he had survived the German bounce and been taken prisoner. Tobin listed as killed, but I talked with two pilots with him on sweep, and both sure he landed safely, not losing control of airplane. You know how I like that kid. He stayed with me night before he got it. If I get definite word he is alive, taken prisoner, we'll get location prison camp. Tobin's father told a Los Angeles newspaper the following day that he was sure Eugene was all right. Meanwhile, 24-year-old Anne Herring, Tobin's girlfriend in Los Angeles, contacted the International Red Cross, writing to the agency the day she learned the love of her life had gone missing. For the Eagles, September 7, 1941, was the blackest day in their history. Three pilots lost in a matter of minutes. Tobin's disappearance was particularly hard to accept. He had been the most experienced fighter pilot with the unit and immensely popular, lifting the young American spirits through the dark days the previous winter, just as he had done with the British pilots in 609 Squadron during the Battle of Britain. He would be dearly missed by fellow Eagle pilots such as Jim Goodson, who had befriended Tobin that summer. Goodson would later recall how his grief over the loss of Tobin and other friends finally overwhelmed him one night. I was eating dinner and I looked down at my plate and saw water on it. I looked up at the ceiling to see where the leak was but didn't see one. Then suddenly I realized that I was crying. I guess it was just the desire to release my feelings because I don't recall crying another time during the war. You were just so busy and you identified with the guy who got shot down and realized it could have been you. It was late October 1941 when Tobin's girlfriend, Anne Herring, received a reply from the International Red Cross. It is with the deepest regret that we have to inform you that F.O. Tobin was killed in action. We have received the following information from the Official Bureau for Prisoners of War, Berlin. F.O. Tobin, 81622, killed 7 9 1941, buried 9 9 1941 at Bologna East Cemetery. When RAF personnel went through Tobin's belongings in his quarters, they found just one shilling and three pence, worth 28 cents. The fortune of a hero, reported an American newspaper, who died in a foreign plane, riding foreign skies above a foreign land. 
Andy Mamadoff had joined 133 Eagle Squadron at RAF Duxford by the time Tobin flew his last mission. The newly formed unit's emblem was an American eagle at the center of a circle filled with stars. Its motto was, Let us to the battle. The mood of the squadron itself, however, was far from gung-ho. At its first meeting, 133's squadron leader, George A. Brown, a Battle of Britain veteran, quickly dispelled any illusions about surviving the war. Gentlemen, no Englishman is more appreciative than I to see you American volunteers over here to assist us in our fight. It is going to get a lot tougher as time goes by. So, take a good look around this room, because a year from now most of you will be dead. There was a long silence. Mamadoff watched as the pilots in his flight glanced around at one another, all with the same thought in mind. You poor, ignorant bastards. You've had it. There followed intensive practice in formation flying at Duxford, with Mamadoff putting his flight of eight pilots through their paces. The youngest included William White, Hugh McCall, and Roy Stout, who had just arrived from an operational training unit and needed all the guidance they could get. By late September, Mamadoff was leading them on their first mission, a low-level sweep of the Dutch coastline in search of German torpedo boats. It was then decided to transfer 133 to RAF Eglinton in Northern Ireland, from where it would fly vital convoy patrols over the North Atlantic. On October 8, 1941, Andy Mamadoff and 15 of 133's pilots left RAF Faumere in Cambridgeshire for their new posting. They were scheduled to refuel twice on their way to Northern Ireland. All went well on the first leg of the journey. Mamadov led 133's Hurricane MK-11Bs to the first refueling stop at RAF Sealand, near Chester, in less than an hour. But as Mamadov and his pilots prepared to take off for the next leg, they saw the sky starting to darken as bad weather drifted in from the Irish Sea to the west. Undeterred, Mamadoff led B flight into the air and then into storm laden skies towards the next refueling stop, RAF Andreas on the Isle of Man. The weather got worse, forcing Mamadoff and his flight to rely on their instruments. Soon, visibility was almost zero degrees. Vertigo began to affect several pilots. Two wisely decided to return to Sealand. Three others soon put down at other airfields. Six more were lucky enough to find a break in the cloud cover and were able to land, much relieved on the Isle of Man at Andreas, having missed several hilltops by only a few feet. Mamadoff and his three youngest pilots found no break in the clouds. Knowing that they were approaching land, Mamadoff decided there was no option but to try to get beneath the cloud cover to make a visual fix. A few minutes later, not far from the village of Moghold, southeast of Ramsey, local farmers heard the roar of four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. The sound was louder than usual, indicating that the planes were flying dangerously low. Suddenly, there was a massive explosion followed by the crackle of machine gun bullets spitting in several directions. The farmers sprinted into a nearby field where they discovered Hurricane Z-3781 ablaze. 28-year-old Flight Commander Andy Mamadoff, the first Jewish-American pilot to fight against the Nazis in World War II, had been killed instantly on impact, his plane falling suddenly from the air. On October 14, 1941, Mamadoff's parents, Lev and Natasha, were busy as usual managing their Russian bear restaurant, filled with vacationers touring Connecticut to peek at the fall leaves, when they learned that their only son had died. He would soon be buried in Brookwood Military Cemetery in Woking, England, in a special plot reserved for American volunteers in the RAF. Devastated by his nephew's loss, the Nazi supporter Count Anastasi told a Norwich Bulletin reporter the following day that Mamadoff's death was unnecessary. The thoughtless remark would never be forgotten nor forgiven in Thompson, and from that moment on he was quickly isolated within the community. Mamadoff's parents were permanently heartbroken and would soon leave Connecticut and try to start over in St. Petersburg, Florida. In time, all three Eagle Squadrons, 71, 121, and the luckless 133, would be folded into the U.S. Army Air Force, becoming the 4th Fighter Group. 
This group would eventually destroy more than 1,000 enemy aircraft by war's end, a phenomenal success based on tactics first learned by Mamadov and his friends, the few who had fought so valiantly during the Battle of Britain. Chapter 16 Dawn Patrol I had a rather bad night of it, as I usually do when I have a particular operation planned for the morning, because I can't keep it out of the back of my mind, and so I got to sleep thinking about it. Then after I'd been asleep a while, at the time when one's normal defenses are way down and nerves and feelings all bared and sensitive, the dread sets in, and all the dangers seem vivid and terrifying. Art Donahue, 258 Squadron Banking towards the low-lying mist, the Spitfire throttled back, its engine quieting to a steady roam, roam, roam. In a split second, the fog was gone, and there, bright and welcoming, was the early morning sun. Looking down from his cockpit, pilot officer Art Donahue saw the sun's shimmering reflection on the cold waves. Opening his throttle, he set course for England. After recuperating from his burns, Donahue had spent the winter of 1940-41 to 41 flying channel patrols with 64 Squadron, skimming only a few feet above swells before landing out of the setting sun and then looking up to see his vapor trail still etched in the sky. Please, don't ever waste any sympathy on me, he wrote to his family back in St. Charles, Minnesota. I'm having the time of my life, happier than I've ever been. You can't imagine the joy I've got out of the few meetings I've had with those barbarians and the joy I get out of patrolling and hunting for them. I have yet to meet up with one of them whom I couldn't easily outfly. As spring beckoned and the days grew longer, Art Donahue was posted to 91 Squadron on the south coast. In late March 1941, he took a much-deserved break from the war, making a brief visit to Minnesota, where he was greeted as a returning hero at St. Paul's train station by his weeping mother and hundreds of proud Minnesotans. Thankfully, the FBI was not waiting to arrest him for breaking neutrality laws. The U.S. State Department had decided not to prosecute Americans who now fought with the RAF. Donahue barely had a moment to relax in St. Charles. Such was his newfound celebrity. I had more invitations than I could possibly accept to speak at various gatherings and over the radio, he recalled. The Commercial Club of St. Charles gave a banquet in my honor and presented me with a wonderful gold wristwatch and my mother with a bouquet of flowers. Most of the week I was in a daze. Everyone was so good to me. It was bizarre and unnerving to be in a country so far removed from the war. He had been away for just eight months, but had changed so much in that time that he felt as if he had been absent for far longer. Donahue was bewildered by the bright lights. There was no blackout. Upset that he could not wear his uniform because of America's official position as a neutral country. Disgusted by the isolationist stance of his fellow Minnesotan, Charles Lindbergh, and outraged by striking aircraft workers, earning more than the finest RAF fighter pilots, and now jeopardizing England's chances. Donahue arrived back in London on a bright April morning. The paper boy's cries outside the train station were depressing. The headlines were again all about the Blitz. The previous night, the Luftwaffe had launched the greatest bombardment the city had yet suffered. The sun was a red ball glowing feebly through the haze of brown smoke that covered the city, he recalled. It was a painful, though dramatic, contrast with America. When he got back to his base at Hawking on the south coast, even worse news awaited. Two pilots he had flown with the previous summer had been killed, and his former squadron leader, Aeneas MacDonald, whom Donahue idolized and who had made his trip home possible, was now a prisoner of war. On March 13th, he had been shot down by no less than Werner Molders, becoming the German ace's 62nd victim. MacDonald had bailed out above the channel and had eventually been picked up by a German motorboat. For the next six months, Donahue flew sweeps across the channel as the RAF stepped up its offensive over northern France. Then, in October 1941, at the invitation of squadron leader Jock Thompson, Donahue joined 258 Squadron, which was being posted abroad. He could not tell his family where he was going, even if he had known, because of censorship. But he did explain why he wanted to leave England. 
While I may be a little farther away from you in miles, I expect to be closer to home in time, because one of the attractions of this posting is that I'll have a better chance to work a trip back to the States. Another reason for going abroad is the thought of getting away from the lousy English winter fogs and other flying hazards. Jock Thompson would later write, Perhaps one of the surest measures of Donahue's character is that he came to us at my invitation, the only person to do so, and as such was branded by all as the commanding officer's friend, and not unnaturally was resented. Suffice it to say that before he left the squadron he was by far its most popular member. To achieve this in the face of Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians, South Africans, and Americans is quite a feat. Because he always wore a toppy, pith helmet, rather too large for him of an old-fashioned design, he was known as Dr. Livingston by his fellow officers. This, of course, was abbreviated into Doc. Unfortunately, Donahue was forced to wait in Gibraltar en route to his foreign posting because of the sinking of the British aircraft carrier Ark Royal, which had been scheduled to transport 258 Squadron to warmer climes. Twenty-year-old John A. Red Campbell, a fellow American, recalled one evening in Gibraltar when Donahue joined him and other pilots in a bar popular with British servicemen. I remember Donahue standing at the bar with one hand tucked into his tunic. Some people thought it was a war hero pose, but it wasn't. He had to hold his hand that way because of his Battle of Britain injuries. Art was an idealist, one of the few real ones in the squadron. It was the first chance he had for a lot of time to think about what the war meant to the parents of fighter pilots on both sides. He said he felt like weeping for the mothers of the German airmen he had killed. Art wrote a series of articles about air combat for a magazine. I think it was the Saturday Evening Post. Someone suggested he do a book. I was with him when he bought a typewriter. Donahue turned out to be as talented a writer as he was an aviator, one of that rare breed who can elegantly evoke in pristine prose the high-octane mix of emotions that pilots experience in combat. According to the highly literate British fighter pilot Peter Townsend, the best airmen are mostly simple people who have been so overwhelmed by their love for flying that it has driven some of them to drink, others to silence, as great love often does but occasionally there arises one, a poet, a philosopher, who succeeds in lending coherent reason to their love. Such was Arthur Gerald Donahue. His book, titled Tally Ho, Yankee in a Spitfire, would be published in the spring of 1942 to favorable reviews and brisk sales. It described his experiences with 64 Squadron during the Battle of Britain, but made no reference to his brief stay with the by now famous 71 Eagle Squadron. According to Red Campbell, Donahue had been far from impressed by the first Eagles, describing the unit to Campbell as a motley crew that would never amount to anything. For once, Donahue had been wrong. That October and November of 1941, 71 Squadron downed more aircraft than any other in fighter command. The youngest inspector of fighters in the Luftwaffe's history took his seat in a Henkel 111 of KG-27 and waited for Lieutenant Georg Kolbe, a fellow Condor Legion veteran, to taxi along the rough landing strip. It was early on November 22, 1941, and 28-year-old Werner Molders was on his way back to Berlin to attend the funeral of General Ernst Uday the man many obituaries were now describing as the father of the Luftwaffe. The Henkel lumbered into the air. In Berlin, Molders would get to see his wife, Louise, the widow of one of his many fallen comrades. They had married on September 13th, shortly after Goering had grounded him. Like Helmut Vick before his death, Molders was now far too important a figure in Nazi Germany to be risked in combat. He had won every laurel, beating Adolf Galland to the ultimate cure to throat ache, the diamonds to the Knight's Cross. By the time Goering had forbidden him to fly in combat, the tail fin on his Messerschmitt had been covered from one end to the other with 101 white stripes. Through the cockpit of the Henkel, Mulders could see that the weather was starting to deteriorate. He watched intently as Kolbe put down at Lemberg to refuel. Before long, the Henkel's two 1,100-horsepower Daimler-Benz engines were roaring to life once more, and they were lifting off the ground again. 
the weather got worse. Near Breslau, Kolbe told Mulders that the port engine had failed. He was going to try to land at the closest airfield, Schmiedefeld. Kolb brought the Henkel down through the thick cloud cover, glancing at his clock every few seconds. Then disaster struck. It was 11.30 a.m. when the second engine failed, and the Henkel fell to the ground like a stone, killing all aboard. News of Werner Vati Mulder's death plunged the entire Third Reich, it seemed, into mourning. JG-51 was quickly named Jagdeschwader Mulders in his honor. His funeral brought Berlin to a standstill as countless admirers pressed against barriers to watch a gun carriage bearing Mulder's coffin pass on its way to the Invalidenfriedhof, the last resting place of Baron Manfred von Richthofen, the greatest ace of the last war. Among the mourners was Mulder's great rival Adolf Galland, now his replacement as inspector of fighters. Although he had not achieved Mulder's mythical status, fate would deal him a far kinder hand. He would go on to fly the Luftwaffe's first jet fighter, bring down his last bandits only days before the end of the war, and die an old man. Finally, the gun carriage drew to a halt before the cemetery. The massive crowds fell silent, arms outstretched in the Nazi salute. A few yards from the swastika-draped coffin stood Hermann Goering. He too had come to pay his final respects to the finest fighter pilot he and Germany had ever known. The Mediterranean flashed below the hurricanes, white caps sparkling in the winter light. It was a relief to be back in a cockpit rather than in some dingy Gibraltar bar trying to kill time playing darts. The smell of oil, burnished metal and leather always made Art Donahue feel better. It had been his balm since his first solo flight above the Minnesota town of Winona, nestled on the banks of the Mississippi River. From the air, an endless, shining artery through the Midwest's rolling hills, bluffs, and patchwork of cornfields and dairy farms. Although he was still waiting to ship out to the Far East, Donahue was able that December to keep his flying skills honed through low-level patrols along the Spanish coast and there was always the off chance that he might run into easy prey. German Fock wolf condors flying out of Cadiz to attack Allied convoys in the Atlantic. On December 7, 1941, Donahue returned to his billet after watching a movie. Before turning in for the night, he switched on his radio. At 11 p.m., he heard his first news report on the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Many of his fellow Americans serving in the RAF were deeply shocked, but they also celebrated the news of the Japanese attack until the early hours, because it signaled the end of American neutrality. Donahue described his reaction in a letter to his parents. For the first few hours after I heard the news of the attack on Hawaii, I seemed to take it quite casually. Then when it really began to sink home, I found myself more really and truly mad at the Japs than I have ever been able to be towards the Germans, with all their crimes. Somehow, the fact that it's your own people who have been attacked seems to make a tremendous difference. Donahue was, in fact, so enraged that he decided to apply for a posting to the Far East. But before he could do so, he and 258 Squadron received orders to fly part of the way to their new posting which was still a secret. Just before Christmas, they set out on a long journey across North Africa. In Nigeria, early in the new year, Donahue finally learned of his final destination, Singapore, then under attack by the Japanese. Donahue could not have been more pleased. Now he would have a chance to strike back at the Japanese. On January 29, 1942, 258 Squadron finally arrived in the British colonial outpost, finishing its marathon journey aboard a transport ship. There was no time for rest. Within 48 hours, 258 Squadron was in action, defending the island from Japanese dive bombers. The squadron faced overwhelming odds and had to operate in terrible humidity without adequate fuel supplies, spare parts, or reserves of ammunition. By February 16th, barely a fortnight later, 258 Squadron had been reduced to a few bone-tired pilots and battered planes. Early that morning, Donahue led a search for Japanese invasion barges that had been spotted heading towards the mainland of Singapore. 
flying as Donahue's number two. His wingman was British pilot Terence Kelly. You know what I need? Donahue had asked Kelly just a few days before. Just a nick. Just something that'll get me home to an American squadron now we're in the war. Donahue, Kelly, and four other pilots from 258 flew north towards the port of Plagio. Oil wells nearby had been set alight to prevent the Japanese from exploiting them. The smoke rose for several thousand feet before, catching some air current, it spread away like a signpost, a huge black swath across the sky pointing to the target, and we flew under it as cover, recalled Kelly. It was a strange atmosphere. Above the queer black cloud, below the darkened jungle, broken only by the turgid brown swaths of many rivers which made the Moisey Delta. Donahue and Kelly spotted a small group of boats and attacked. But then they learned that their victims were not part of the invasion armada that had been reported. I kept close to Donahue, and he was puzzled too, looking this way and that, recalled Kelly. And then we came upon the barges. Donahue had never seen so many enemy troops so vulnerable to attack. Often I had machine-gunned German soldiers, sailors, or airmen on the ground or in ships, but always where they either had a little shelter or concealment, or at least could scatter and throw themselves flat, he explained. These fellows had no shelter or concealment except the thin sides of their boats, no better than paper for stopping our bullets, and they were jammed in so tight that they couldn't scatter or throw themselves flat or do anything except just sit up and take it. Donahue came in low, around a hundred feet above the water. He made a last check for Japanese fighters, Navy Zeros. The barges loomed larger in the amber glow of his reflector sight. He moved his thumb over to his firing button, wanting to send his first bullets a little high, knowing they would dip a little. Then he opened fire. There was an abrupt, shattering roar from the guns in my wings, and then eighty ghostly white tracers snaking out ahead eagerly toward the boat and its helpless passengers. They would know nothing more. Donahue's wingman, Terence Kelly, had the perfect view of the ensuing slaughter. I probably saw the effect of Donahue's attack much better than any of my own, because I had fallen astern behind him, waiting my turn, and with nothing to do and not much to think about but watch. I really don't believe Donahue missed a barge, his guns raking the convoy from head to stern. The bullets made an unforgettable pattern. There was a pincushion of water ahead of the nearest barge which moved along, so that as the bullets raked through a barge, what one saw was the pinpoints of light in the barge itself. Donahue had lost too much altitude, so he pulled the stick back and corrected, aiming at a barge farther in the distance. His aim was again perfect its effect devastating. Tracers tore into the bodies of twenty tightly packed Japanese soldiers. Donahue kept the barge in his sights and continued to fire until his victims were just a few yards away. He could see their faces as they died. Then he began to bank and turn away to attack another barge. Wham! A twenty-millimeter anti-aircraft shell hit Donahue in the calf of his left leg. Donahue looked down in shock at two holes. One was small and round, he recalled. The other was a gaping sort of thing an inch wide by a couple inches long, with raw red and blue flesh and muscle laid open, before the blood welled up and started streaming out. Donahue now flew instinctively, turning away sharply from the fire towards an endless green carpet of jungle. The shock began to abate and his instinct for survival kicked in. He was almost a hundred miles from his base. He had a tendency to black out when he began to bleed. Could he stay conscious long enough to get home? A few minutes later, Donahue began to feel lightheaded. He grabbed his trouser leg above the wound and tried to twist it to form a tourniquet. But still his ruptured veins spurted and blood collected in a bright red pool in his heel rest, a metal trough underneath his rudder pedal. He looked at his altimeter, spattered with pieces of his flesh, and knew that if he faded away for even a couple of seconds, he would crash. He gritted his teeth, his ears ringing, dots filling his vision. He couldn't even summon the strength to close his jaw. I mustn't faint. I mustn't faint, Donahue said to himself. His vision blurred. Donahue began to panic. 
I am fainting. I mustn't faint. I am fainting. The seconds passed slowly. He realized he was still awake. He could hear the Rolls-Royce engine purring. He wondered whether he should crash land and whether to shut down the engine before he did so. Then he had a very smart idea. He would keep himself awake with extra oxygen. He let go of the stick, reached to his instrument panel, and increased his oxygen supply. Although flying just a few hundred feet above the jungle's canopy, he was soon breathing enough oxygen to stay wide awake at 40,000 feet. Donahue still grabbed his torn trousers with one hand. He opened his throttle, letting go of the stick again for a second or two, and then checked his wound. He was losing blood just as fast. There was only one thing for it. It seemed easy, he later recalled. I let go of the hold I had of my trouser leg above the wound, grabbed up the torn cloth right over it, twisted it, and then jammed my gloved fist, knuckles first, as deep as I could into the large hole, and held it that way. Donahue almost blacked out. He tried to breathe more slowly so he could stay conscious. His oil and temperature gauges showed normal. They had not been hit. His reserve fuel tank was still full. Constantly he turned his head, looking out for Japanese Navy Zeros, flying as low as he could above the trees. Finally, the jungle gave way to rice fields and waterways. He was getting close to his home base in Palembang. He then saw a tall column of smoke and realized it marked the city itself, only a few miles ahead. Donahue looked down. His wound had stopped bleeding. The red rivulets down my leg and shoe seemed to be stationary, and the puddle of blood in the heel rest was no longer bright but dark, which meant that there couldn't be any fresh blood on it, he recalled. The pain, which never had been agonizing, had settled into a heavy ache as from a badly bruised muscle. My hopes of making it really soared. Donahue flew south of Palembang, unable to recognize city landmarks because they were obscured by the smoke from bombings and many fires. If only he could spot a familiar railway line to lead him home. The weather had now closed in, and he had to concentrate hard to avoid several rainstorms. Suddenly, there were the blessed rail tracks. Donahue banked slightly and followed them. Only ten minutes more now, he told himself. The lines shone silver in the reflected sun as they curved lazily through the jungle. And then, there it was, his airfield. Now he would have to land with one hand. He dared not pull his gloved one out of the hole in his leg. Donahue came in low, slowly wagging his wings to show that he was hurt. He let go of the stick for a second to lower his wheels for landing. From instinct, drawing on all his experience in Minnesota with unruly planes and bad weather, he eased off the throttle. Still too much speed. He used his left elbow to throttle back even more. Then the wheels hit the ground and he bounced violently for a hundred yards. The feeling of triumph at having made it safely made the bad landing seem inconsequential. I felt almost boisterous as I taxied up to the watch office. The surviving pilots and ground crew of 258 Squadron ran out to Donahue's plane and helped him out of the cockpit. A fellow officer dressed his wound and he was rushed to the nearest aid station. Donahue suddenly feared that if he was hospitalized, he would inevitably become a prisoner of the Japanese, who in a matter of hours would seize all of Singapore. To his immense relief, after a quick call was put through to his squadron, he was carried to an ambulance and driven back to his base. A Lockheed bomber bound for Java was held up waiting for me at squadron leader Thompson's intercession, recalled Donahue. Two hours later, I was safely in bed, 300 miles from the fighting zone, in the Dutch military hospital of Bandung, a beautiful city in the mountains of west-central Java. I had all that I promised myself, a bed to sleep in, with clean sheets, and the prospect of breakfast in bed in the morning. In addition, I had a very pretty nurse to look after me. From his extraordinary courage in attacking the Japanese invaders and then managing to bring his plane back, Arthur Gerald Donahue was awarded the DFC, the RAF's second highest award for gallantry.
After recuperating for several weeks, Donahue returned to England and resumed combat with 91 Squadron as a flight commander, flying sweeps across the channel once more, the words, Message from Minnesota, now painted on his hurricane's nose. By August 1942, he had become 91's acting commanding officer, the first and only American in the RAF's history to lead an all-British squadron. By all accounts, he was a natural leader in the air. On most sorties, Donahue's number two was Flight Lieutenant A.C. Young, with whom he had flown the previous year before accepting Jock Thompson's invitation to join 258th Squadron. On Saturday, August 29th, Young recorded that day's mission. Went to Dieppe on the dawn reco again and weather foul. Stooged around at 28,000 with Art Donahue and jumped two spits who were returning from France. We attacked them just for the fun of it, and they didn't even see us. On the evening of 10 September, Young wrote, I'm on dawn patrol tomorrow, and Art is going to Ostend and I to Dieppe. He is going to lay in wait for a JU-88 that our listening post service warned us was shadowing me yesterday. Hope he gets it, and if not, he promised me the next crack at it. Young's entry the next day read, Boy, what a tough luck day. Art went to the Ostend Reco as arranged, and I went to Dieppe. Art hadn't returned when I landed, and checking up, I found out he made aid, code word for bailing out, eight miles north of Gravelines. The whole story goes, he found that JU-88 that was shadowing me yesterday morning. He attacked it and set it on fire, and our listening post service picked up the German crew broadcast, saying their rear gunner was dead. The port engine was on fire, and they were trying to make a nearby aerodrome. Then, about two minutes later, they called saying they were abandoning aircraft. Evidently, Art got a bullet from return fire, and it hit his radiator, making the motor cease. I refueled, and Pilot Officer Eddie and I went to search the area. It was a terribly hazy day, one of the worst we've seen, and the sun made it almost impossible to see, let alone fly. We searched for an hour and ten minutes, and all I found was some wreckage. Parts of a whirlwind, as spits parts don't float. The rest of the guys searched in turn until noon when flying was cancelled due to the weather. Donahue had managed to report by radio that he had destroyed the Junkers 88. He had indeed been hit. His last communication had been that his engine was overheating. He was too low to bail out, so he was going to ditch in the channel. Then his radio had gone silent. Art Donahue's body was never found. As with Eugene Tobin's disappearance, for some time Donahue's family and friends held out hope that he might have survived. But by 1943, they had all come to accept the bitter truth. On November 16th that year, a tribute from Donahue's intelligence officer in 64 Squadron, A.W. Fagan, appeared in the London Times. Art had joined the RAF in spite of considerable difficulties, personal and otherwise, not from any wish for adventure or personal advancement, but rather in the spirit of a crusader who had no illusions about what lay before him and had counted the cost. He had vision, and he had courage in abundant measure— Modest and reserved by nature, he came to live among strangers in a strange land whose outlook and habits were in many ways widely different from his own. Nevertheless, he quickly made friends and was at once accepted and, I know, regarded himself as one of us. I hope and believe that his short life among us was happy. He was a good friend and a very gallant gentleman. Epilogue they shall not grow old. Lord, hold them in thy mighty hand, above the ocean and the land, like wings of eagles mounting high, along the pathways of the sky. Anonymous. 244 United States citizens eventually flew with the RAF Eagle Squadrons. By 1945, they were widely recognized as the progenitors of the finest fighter wing in the U.S. Air Force. But according to RAF rosters in 1940, just seven Americans belonged to the few, those who fought for Britain's survival during the greatest air battle in history. More than 60 years later, in July 2002, 
the only one of the American few to survive the war, John Kenneth Haviland, died peacefully at his home in Virginia. After flying mosquito dive bombers and Blenheims, Havland had returned to Spitfires in late 1944 and had been awarded the DFC as a flight lieutenant with 141 Squadron on February 16, 1945. After returning to America at war's end, he had gone to college on the GI Bill and had never left, retiring as a distinguished professor of aeronautics at the University of Virginia in the 1980s. In 2005, there were 12 surviving Eagle pilots, according to 87-year-old Bill Edwards, a former 133 Squadron pilot, the current president of the Eagle Squadron Association, and the only surviving Eagle who still flies. On a bright May afternoon, he banked his Cessna over Colorado Springs, where he has lived since leaving the Air Force, and as we then soared above the Rockies, he reminisced about the happiest and saddest period in his seventy years of flying, his time as an Eagle pilot. He has maintained a profound affection for Britain and the RAF for well over sixty years. Some might call it love. Whenever he gets the chance, he returns to England to look up old chums. Perhaps the most moving of his visits occurred in 1976, when he attended a reunion in London for the Eagle Squadrons. Edwards and his fellow Eagles were given the red carpet treatment wherever they went and were feted as prodigal sons who would return to the country they had helped save. On September 15th that year, they attended a Battle of Britain memorial service at Westminster Abbey, taking their seats beside Winston Churchill's widow. They also sent Queen Elizabeth their best wishes and the following message. We flew with pride under the flag of England in your superb hurricanes and spitfires. We shared in battle the defeats, the victories, and the glory of the Royal Air Force. The Eagle Squadrons were a result of the force that motivates men who believe in freedom to join in the fight for it regardless of when and where it is threatened. Let those who would challenge our way of life be warned that this force is enduring and will characterize the relationship of Great Britain and the United States for all time. One of Edward's friends, 71 Squadron's Bert Stewart, recalled leaving a final gathering of the Eagles in London that year before returning to America. As I was getting on the bus, the escort officer called me over to a little lady standing there. She was in her 80s, he told me. He said, Stu, here is a little lady who has walked twelve miles just to say thank you to an eagle. It grabbed me by the throat and still does. I said, ma'am, you don't have to thank us. We thank you for holding the line. She was so small I could have held out my arm and she could have walked under it. She said, no, we thank you because you came when we needed you. I had her come on the bus and tell everyone what she had told me. She came up and made a few statements, and there was not a dry eye on that bus. Not one. Today, fewer and fewer of the few remain. As a result, perhaps, the significance of the greatest air battle in history has been downplayed. Many Americans do not realize that had it not been for the few, the Second World War would have had a very different outcome. And to this day, even in England, the role played by foreign-born pilots tends to be overlooked. Indeed, it is generally assumed that the British fought alone during the summer of 1940. But in Bologna's East Cemetery, on the RAF's Runnymede Memorial, and in many other corners of England, there are many tragic reminders that this was not the case. A fifth of the few came from foreign shores. Of these 510 pilots, more than a quarter never returned home. On July 4th of most years, in a corner of Box Grove Graveyard in Sussex, fresh flowers lie on the grave of one of these foreigners, Pilot Officer Billy Fisk, the first American to die in the Battle of Britain. The King of Speed lies between two British soldiers, a sapper in the Royal Engineers and a corporal in the East Lancashire Regiment. Depending on the season, a small Stars and Stripes flag sometimes snaps in the wind above his final resting place. On his headstone, the following words are inscribed for all to see. An American citizen who died 
that England might live. America's few in the Battle of Britain. It is impossible to know exactly how many Americans served in the Battle of Britain. It is very likely that several more Americans enlisted in the RAF as Canadians or other nationalities. Pilot Officer Arthur Gerald Donahue, 64 Squadron, killed September 11th, 1942. Pilot Officer John Kenneth Havlin, 151 Squadron, survived the war. Pilot Officer Vernon Charles Keough, 609 Squadron, killed February 15, 1941. Pilot Officer Philip Howard Lacrone, 616 Squadron, killed January 5, 1941. Pilot Officer William Meade Lindsley Fisk, 601 Squadron, died August 17, 1940. Pilot Officer Andrew Mamadoff, 609 Squadron, killed October 8, 1941. Pilot Officer Hugh William Riley, 66 Squadron, killed October 17, 1940, listed as Canadian in the 1940 RAF roster. Pilot Officer Eugene Quimby Tobin, 609 Squadron, killed September 7, 1941. Acknowledgements. Over several years, many people helped enormously with the research for this book. I would like to thank the following relatives, pilots, experts, and institutions for their time and generosity. Frank Brinkerhoff provided clippings, letters, and other information on Philip Lacrone. Simon Lillywhite, an expert on Billy Fisk, kindly gave me a tour of RAF Tangmir and the surrounding area introduced me to several people who knew Billy Fisk and spent many days in the National Archives in England tracking down flight logs, squadron records, combat reports, and many other invaluable documents that allowed me to pinpoint where and when the few were in action. His advice and help were invaluable, and the hospitality he and his wife provided went far beyond the call of duty. On the other side of the Atlantic, researcher Alex Blanton kindly sent me many years of careful research on Fisk and his wife Rose. I also cannot thank him enough. I should mention two names among many people in Britain who have devoted themselves to preserving the memory of the few. The indefatigable Bill Bond and Ed Sergison of the Battle of Britain Historical Society, whose magazine, Scramble, was also most useful. Philip Kane, the leading authority on the American Eagles squadrons, spent an afternoon with me in the archive at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, locating records and files and answering many questions. Former Eagle pilot Bill Edwards and his wife generously hosted me in Colorado Springs and provided great encouragement. Eagle pilots Steve Pisanos, Bill Geiger, Luke Allen, and Dusty Miller also gave me an insight into what it was like to be an American in the Royal Air Force, RAF, in the early years of the war. The following people also provided wonderful information about Billy Fisk. Battle of Britain pilot Jack Riddle, Dr. Courtney Wiley, Ben Clinch, Melanie Carver, Ken Bailey, Jeffrey Faulkner, and Pat Zabalaga, who sent many letters and diary extracts. I was extremely fortunate to find Helen Mayer, who gave me everything she could find about her brother, Eugene Tobin. I spent wonderful days in Olympia and in England with her and will always remember her wonderful humor, the example she sets through her love of life and her deep devotion to an incredible American, her brother. Tobin belonged to 609 Squadron during the Battle of Britain. I would like to thank the following for providing details about Tobin, 609, and other pilots who flew in one of the RAF's greatest squadrons. Jeff Nutkins, Chris Goss, David Darley, son of squadron leader Horace Darley, and Mark Crane, a true English gentleman who read the manuscript, provided endless advice and encouragement, sent many photographs, and tracked down many leads. Thanks to a new generation of memorialists and enthusiasts like Mark, the few will continue to be remembered long after they have gone. I was fortunate to have the Donahue family's full support. They provided a treasure trove of material and many hours of enjoyable anecdotes during my visits to Springfield, Massachusetts. Minnesotan Lyle Harrison has done more than anyone to celebrate and commemorate Art Donahue, and I am deeply grateful to him for reading the manuscript, spending days showing me around St. Charles, and putting me in touch with several people who provided wonderful information and memories. 
The following people were also helpful. Scott and Judy Smith. John Red Campbell, Donahue's fellow 258 Squadron pilot. Alfie Butts. Dwayne Reed of the National Air Force Academy Archives. And Jim Donahue. Trevor Gray and Richard Jones both flew with Donahue and were generous with their time. They are just two of the few who are still going strong. Harold Crow, Bud Vogel, and Ron and Lloyd Hemming had vivid recollections of Donahue as a boy. Joe Iamartino of the Thompson Historical Society helped me unearth the background of the remarkable Andrew Mamadoff, and Steve Poole on the Isle of Man gave me wonderful insight into Mamadoff's last flight. Dave Cassells also provided some insight into Mamadoff's teenage years. I am indebted to the following institutions for a great deal of research. The RAF Museum in Hendon, the National Archives in London, the British Library, the Imperial War Museum, the New York Public Library, Williams College, and the National Air Force Academy. I am also grateful to the following leading experts, who kindly replied to my inquiries and helped point me in the right direction. Tony Holmes, Paul Ludwig, and Chris Goss, who also provided wonderful photographs. Deborah Sullivan was a great help in compiling the bibliography. My wife Robin transcribed countless hours of interviews and found most of the photographs in the book. Lindsay Sterling was as professional as ever in reviewing the earliest stages of the manuscript. John Snowden kindly accompanied me to Middle Wallop with Helen Mayer and took wonderful photographs. I will never forget visiting Runnymede Memorial with his parents late one summer afternoon. John's father was an armorer for many years in the RAF and served during 1941 at Middle Wallop. Again, the wonderful team at De Capo could not have been more helpful and supportive. It has been a delight to work on a third book with my editor, Robert Pigeon, a good friend and invaluable ally. I am also deeply grateful as ever to my agent, Derek Johns, and his colleagues at A.P. Watt, particularly Rob Crate the most tolerable Arsenal fan I have ever met. In Los Angeles, the inimitable and beautiful Lisa Wachter and wonderfully cool-headed Keith Fleer were also helpful beyond words. I spent the first 28 years of my life in England before moving to America. Time apart has only made the heart grow fonder. I miss my oldest and dearest friends and family more than ever. I hope they will one day forgive my absence. Finally, I can only hope that my son, Felix, and others from his generation will one day be as grateful as I am to the men and women, past and present, of Britain's Royal Air Force. We hope that you have enjoyed our presentation of The Few, the American Knights of the Air Who Risked Everything to Fight in the Battle of Britain by Alex Kershaw. Copyright 2006 by Alex Kershaw and published by DeCapo Press, a member of the Perseus Book Group. Read by Scott Brick. Directed by Renee Rodman. Engineered by Melissa Coates. Performance Copyright 2006 Brilliance Audio. All rights reserved. For further information concerning this program or other Brilliance Audio titles, please call the following toll-free number 1-800-222-3225 or visit our website at www.brilliantsaudio.com. No part of this recording may be played for an audience or reproduced in any form. It may not be streamed, downloaded, broadcast, or copied without written permission. Address all inquiries to Brilliance Audio, P.O. Box 887, Grand Haven, Michigan, 49417.